I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you as I read the prayer to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Yes, President, I table documents pursuant to statute and a return to order as shown on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The question, uh, I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day No. 1, National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023, resumption of debate on the second reading and on the amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Sheldon. There we go. Oh, thank you. There we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> thank you, President. I rise to speak on the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023, and here we do go about making a difference. I want to start by commending the Minister for Industry and Science for his hard work on the bringing this critical and ambitious policy to life. The National Reconstruction Fund is a $15 billion financing vehicle which will be one of the largest investments in domestic manufacturing in our history. The NRF will make targeted investments through a mix of loans, equity and guarantees in seven priority areas renewable low emission technologies, medical science, transport given the former coalition government's debacle in New South Wales and foreign-made trains, trams, trains and ferries, we certainly welcome that, agriculture, forestry and fisheries, value-add in resources and defence capability, and enabling capabilities across engineering, data science and software development, including in AI and robotics and quantum. We now we use, no, we know, you know we use to make things in this country. And thanks to the NRF and thanks to the massive overhaul of our skills and training system through the Jobs and Skills Australia Bill introduced in the House this week, or last week, we can and will make things right here in Australia again. When we invest in making things in Australia, we make every dollar back ten times over. We make it back by creating highly skilled, secure and well-paid jobs for working Australians. We make it back by creating economic and job opportunities in our regions. We make it back by securing our national sovereignty. If the pandemic wasn't a wake-up call that we need to make essential goods here in Australia and not, and not depend on the benevolence of China-based manufacturers, then I'm not sure we'll ever get through to the opposite, those opposite. The NRF has the support of the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry and the Australian Industry Group. In fact, to quote from the Senate Economics Committee report on the bill, all submissions to the inquiry and witnesses at the public hearing were supportive of the bill and the objectives and in increasing manufacturing in Australia. So why, when there are, was unanimous support from every single organisation that participated in the Senate review process are the Liberals and Nationals opposing. Why are the Liberals opposed to a $15 billion investment in reviving Australian manufacturing? Why are the Nationals opposed to this bill when agriculture is one of the priority areas for investment? 
perhaps because they are the very same people who decimated manufacturing in this country. Perhaps it's because they are ideologically opposed to making things in Australia. Perhaps it's because they prefer that we offshore our blue-collar jobs in China, to China. Or why don't the Liberals and Nationals ask their colleagues in New South Wales how offshoring manufacturing has gone? If you haven't been paying attention, I'll tell you. They said in New South Wales, and I quote, it's not, we're not good at building trains. So instead, they bought trains made in Spain, which it turns out had made major cracks in the wheel arches that caused the Inner West Line to shut down for 18 months. They brought intercity tra trains made in South Korea, which were delivered four years ago with a raft of safety issues and only now are starting to enter service. They bought river-class ferries made in Indonesia, which can't fit under bridges on the Parramatta River if passengers are sitting on the top deck. And if you're sitting on the top deck of one of these boats, you'll be decapitated when it goes under the gas, gas works bridge. The safety issues and repairs and delays on these projects have cost Australia billions of dollars. So why do they insist on offshoring manufacturing? Well, when the Liberals and the Nationals hear the phrase made in Australia, they start panicking about organised labour. They start worrying about workers in a factory or a warehouse organising together to have a united voice on their wages and conditions. There is nothing that th those opposite hate more than workers with a voice. Now that's why the Abbott government told our cow manufacturing industry to leave. That is why the Abbott government said they wouldn't trust Australia to build a, build a canoe. That is why the Liberals and Nationals are opposing this bill today. Now, I'm sure there are members and senators in the coalition who are embarrassed that they are forced to show up in this place and vote against this bill. They don't want to be wrong on the, side, on the wrong side of history on this vote, just as they don't want to be, go along with the, Mr Dutton's, the opposition leader Dutton's, ideological opposition against the safeguard mechanisms, just as they don't want to go along with Dutton's opposition to our energy price relief bill. But unfortunately, that is how history will record your vote on this issue. Your record will forever be stained by a vote against bringing manufacturing back to this country. So to every Australian in the Hunter and Illawarra, in central Queensland, Geelong and South Australia, pay attention to this vote because the distinction could be, couldn't be clearer. The Albanese government is voting for legislation to revive Australian manufacturing, and the Liberals and Nationals are voting against it. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I rise to start today, following that contribution, with a clearing up a few misconceptions. Uh, I'll call them misconceptions, not straight-out untruths. But there are some misconceptions in the Australian public, largely fuelled by the rhetoric of those opposite about manufacturing in Australia. Would it surprise you, those who are listening to this debate, would it surprise you to know the manufacturing output in Australia has actually risen since the 1950s? Would that surprise you? Manufacturing output has actually risen since the 1950s. 50s. Yes, there's been a change in the mix, and some industries have, have, have gone and others have come in to take their place, but manufacturing output as a whole. In fact, in the early part of this century, from the 1950s to the early part of this century, manufacturing output in Australia actually quadrupled. Actually quadrupled. So when we're talking about the decline of manufacturing in Australia, when we're talking ourselves down as a nation, talking ourselves down as a nation, we're actually talking about the relative decline of manufacturing. As a senator, one of the privileges I get, and I'm sure uh, uh, Senator Cash and, and Senator Scar, who are in this place with me, both get the absolute privilege of going out to so many small manufacturers across Australia, across Australia. 
The industrial areas of Western Australia are just replete with small manufacturers out there having a go. And that is why manufacturing output in this country has actually grown uh, over the last two or three generations, even contrary to the rhetoric of those who want to talk down the manufacturing sector, want to talk down the Australian economy uh, and want to make some cheap political points about unionisation, uh, which have no uh, reflection on the reality out there. What has happened is a relative decline in manufacturing, and that is because that is because we've had another massive success story in this country. The services sector has grown. The services sector since the 1950, and we all see it in the way we live our lives. We see it in these you know, devices we carry in our pockets, uh, our phones, that you know, so much of our daily lives and our work and our, uh, and our pleasure activities are on, that the, the, the nature of the economy has changed over the last 50, 60, 70 years and much, much more of the economy than in the 1950s is in the services sector. And that's where we've seen massive, massive growth in our economy. So manufacturing output quadrupled between the 1950s and the early 2000s. But yes, it has seen a relative decline against the, the really significant growth from a very low base of the services sector. Why are we actually opposed to this bill rather than the cartoon caricature we get from those opposite? The, 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 you know, or we're voting against this bill because we don't like unions. I mean, my goodness me, what a ludicrous argument that is. We are voting against this bill because it is completely the wrong thing to do at this time. And there are some serious objections to key parts of this bill that are just bad policy. Just bad policy. Uh, in particular, from my point of view, uh, the, the use of equity shareholdings in manufacturers by government, I think, is an exceedingly bad move. It, it, it's, it's a poor policy decision. And yes, I know those opposites can say other governments have done it in the past. But it is a very poor policy to make that a cornerstone of your, your, your manufacturing policy. Governments should not take equity stakes in business. But the trouble is, Labor governments have form on this. Labor governments from the past have form on this. Uh, we've seen Labor governments getting way too close to business, uh, at the state level particularly, over uh, a number of administrations in the past that have become well, infamous. They have become infamous. And I'll go back to my home state, and, and, and Senator Cash, who's in the chamber, very, very well remembers the WA Inc days. WA Inc. I mean, that, that, that name has become synonymous with political uh, malfeasance of the highest level, where political players got into proverbial beds with corporate uh, titans. Uh, sent government money by way of investment vehicles into private hands, and the absolute disastrous results of that are still well and truly etched in the memories of every West Australian, at least every West Australian who's over 30 years old. Uh, the WA Inc. era was a shameful, shameful era of Labor Party politics in Western Australia. And it involved far too cosy relationships, including equity relationships, through uh, the, the Exim vehicle with uh, businesses in Western Australia. And I, we, we saw this down in, in my hometown of Pemberton. We actually saw the outcomes of this. Uh, Pemberton is, is a largely a, it's a heavy soil country. It it's, it's grows a lot, of, a lot of vegetable fruit production, also a lot of cattle production. And we saw a massive, massive shearing shed built in Pemberton, of all places. And uh, it, it, was, it was built by one of those who had gained largesse through the WA state government, a shearing shed in Pemberton. Now, I'm trying to think of an eastern states equivalent. It probably won't come to me on the fly. But this is really something that's out of place, economically crazy. And yet there we saw the way money was being used as a plaything 
for political and, and large business uh, 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 leaders' purposes. Uh, very, very foolish, foolish use of taxpayers' money. When governments get involved with business, they are in an extremely, extremely difficult position. What happens if the business tanks? There's clearly a massive moral hazard. Does the government just let the business go under? Does it put more equity in to try and prop the business up, even though it knows it's failing? And we get a situation where, rather than being a silent shareholder, what if a, what if a large manufacturing business that takes one of these, these equity injections from the government is in a marginal seat? And I know, Senator Scar, you spoke about this. What if one of these businesses is in a marginal seat? And, and, and the Minister for Industry has got the local member, the local Labor member, banging on their door saying, you can't let this business go under. It'll co cost me the seat. It, 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 and regardless then of what the government's decision is, it's going to be seen through a political vein. You risk corrupting the process. And perception is important in politics. We all know that. Everyone in this chamber knows that. Perception is important. Governments should not be taking equity shares uh, in this way. Now, and uh, sadly, sadly, the, the, the WA Inc. situation is, is not, uh, not the only case we can cite to now. Certainly not as close to this one. I, I don't know the history. I'm sure some of my colleagues in this place do know the history of the Victorian Economic Development Corporation. But again, but again, a state uh, Labor government vehicle that tried to pick winners racked up losses for the taxpayer of $110 million. Manufacturing is, is difficult. Small business, medium-sized business is difficult. There is no doubt about that. There is a lot of investment, private investment, that goes into those businesses and a decent percentage of them will fail. A decent percentage of them will fail. Uh, it, 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 it is a sad reality of economic life that uh, through the economic process we do see businesses that cannot compete. Uh, and for governments to be in an equity holding in those businesses puts that government in a very, very dangerous position indeed. Um, we should stay out of the market where at all possible. Where at all possible. Now, the, the, the coalition's program in the last turn of government was a grants program. Now, yes, there'll be purists who argue against even those sorts of programs, and I, and I, I do have some sympathy with that view. But the fact is that a grants program, a hands-off grants program where you are awarding money on the basis of a project's merit, where there are effectively no strings attached, where it's trying to speed up an investment, trying to advance a particular process from initial stages to, to uh, uh, growing it to the point where it can actually be taken to market, there is, there is an argument that those sorts of, uh, that sort of funding from government uh, can be a positive on the economy. There are negative arguments, there are arguments against that as well. But when we get to the point of equity, we are entering very dangerous territory indeed. Uh, and that is why I, I'm particularly uh, uh, strongly opposed uh, to this bill. We, we've seen it. We've seen it before. We've seen government getting too close to business. Uh, and Senator Sheldon said, oh, well, every, every submission to the inquiry was in support of this bill. Well, gee, guess what? Business looks at free money and says yes. I mean, d d does anyone, is anyone remotely surprised by that fact? But that does not mean it's good policy. It does not mean it's good policy. It does not mean that we have hundreds of cases where in the past, and I've named a couple of them with, with WA Inc. and the Victorian Economic Development Corporation, but uh, uh, Senator Scar, I'm sure you could give me hundreds of examples from Queensland where these sorts of approaches have resulted in very, very negative outcomes for the taxpayer. And throughout history and throughout the Western world, there are pl plenty of examples of where, where governments haven't been able to help themselves. They haven't been able to help themselves to try and achieve a particular economic outcome, to try and protect, protect a particular industry. They have, have got involved. They've got their, their sticky fingers involved. And it's never or very rarely ended in positive territory for the taxpayers of the nation involved. Uh, and that is why I 
remain extraordinarily concerned about this bill, and I will certainly very happily vote against it. Senator Babette. Thank you. Now, like most things, like most things that the Albanese government proposes, this $15 billion, $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund sounds good, sounds good at first glance anyway, but it raises more questions than it answers. Now, the United Australia Party is, of course, completely supportive of the need to boost Australian manufacturing. But why is it being done first and foremost through subsidies rather than through tax cuts and regulatory reform? If the government is serious, if they're serious about helping the manufacturing sector in this country, it first needs to address the taxation environment, the, re the regulatory environment, and it needs to remove costs and unnecessary things that hinder business investment in our country. Now, the best way, the best way to encourage business is not to shower elected winners with billions of dollars of taxpayer-funded money. It is to free manufacturers from burdens and disincentive that inhibits investment. That's the best way to do it. That's the best way. Now, speaking of disin disincentives, manufacturers in this country face more red and green tape than a Christmas tree. That's what they face. And it's not just manufacturers, but all businesses. Doing business in Australia is too difficult. As a business owner myself, I can attest to this from cold experience. It is so difficult to have a business and turn a profit in this country, much more difficult than it has to be. Now, if the Albanese government wants to spark a manufacturing boom, it should first remove the, corp the copious amounts of red tape, the red tape that strangles creativity and stifles investment. I'm going to keep saying this. What's the point? What's the point of showering billions of dollars on some hand-picked manufacturers if the overall environment still remains hostile to manufacturing? Throwing around other people's money is easy. Makes for a good headline. But look beyond the headlines and there's a complete lack of intent a complete lack of intent to do the hard work of reform. Freeing business from the constraints that hinder so that we can all thrive. Let's talk about that $15 billion for a moment, a huge sum of money. Politicians, we love to talk about huge sums of money because it makes it sound like we're doing something historic and monumental. The insinuation is that if government is throwing billions at a problem, then that problem will somehow be fixed. That could not be further from the truth. As we all know sometimes, well actually most of the time, government spending only makes a problem worse. As Reagan said, the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. He was not wrong about that one, I tell you what. Now, smart voters, they are attuned to the fact that the larger the sum of money that a government proposes to spend, the more historic and the more monumental the waste is likely to be. Like I have said before, the government couldn't organise a beer in a brewery. A beer in a brewery. This is why cutting taxes and removing regulatory red and green tape is always preferable to throwing money around. Tax and regulatory reforms create an environment where business can thrive without subsidies. In other words, real reform creates real growth rather than a mirage of growth propped up by public money. Now, it should not be lost on people that this government has just broken just broken a pre-election promise on superannuation to take billions from hard-working retirees, only to go and hand it out to a few hand-picked industries who may or may not deserve it. If the government 
is planning on any major cuts to spending, that will be the better idea. Cuts to spending. Cut spending. That will be a better way to fund this reconstruction fund. Don't just borrow more money. Don't borrow, don't borrow more money to fund a manufacturing boom that is not real. Now, I say not real because this boom, it will only exist because of subsidies. That's it. Not because of a genuine business model, much like the entire renewable debacle which we are currently being made to suffer through. That's what's going on. Now, if the government wants to spend $15 billion, find some savings across the budget to ensure that we're not just adding to our already severe and out of control national debts. Just so that a few, you know, a few headlines can be written in the legacy media for a couple of days. At a time of uncontrolled inflation, 10 consecutive rate rises, the last thing, the last thing that our nation needs is for the Treasurer, Super Jim Chalmers, fresh from writing his 6,000 word essay on reimagining capitalism to pump billions of dollars of borrowed money into an economy that is already much too hot. Now, you don't need to have written a thesis on Paul Keating to know that such a move will only increase inflationary pressure and drive up interest rates. This is high school economics. What are the struggling families who are trying to cope with constantly growing mortgage payments going to think of another rate rise. The government has also cleverly, and in my view, cynically, linked the Reconstruction Fund to defence spending. Defence is too important to play politics with, and it's a, and it's a, pity, it's a pity that the government has sought to use defence to shield the Reconstruction Fund from critique and criticism. Now, the UAP will not stand in the way of defence spending in fact, we urge the government to find more in the budget, more in the budget to fund defence spending, to fund the defence of our great nation in these uncertain times. Now, the defence of our nation is not made easier by continued borrowings for other areas, especially those that are, in, that, that are ill conceived. So we urge the government to supply the reconstruction fund through budget savings and to view the, risk, the reconstruction fund as not the whole strategy, but as a part of a strategy to encourage investment. We also urge the government to start thinking about cutting our national debts while they're at it. The significant part should be, as I have said over and over again, is removing disincentives so that manufacturing can flourish in this nation once again. Not because of false economies created by taxpayer money, not because government trusting our manufacturers, but had the, because government had the creativity, the creativity and the daring to create an atmosphere in which things could be built in our country once again, instead of obviously being sent overseas. Now, Australia and our citizens, we deserve better than what is going on at the moment. Yes, we do. We don't need to spend $15 billion of money that we don't have. What we need we need to free our manufacturers from red and green tape. We need to exit bad international agreements. And we need to, of course, reduce the cost of energy. We need more coal. We need more gas. And we need to add nuclear. We need to get rid of this idea of solar panels and batteries being enough to power a first world nation like Australia, because it's not enough. The only thing it's going to do is lead us into poverty. That's it. Government is the problem. Government is not the solution. Not now, not ever. What we need is we need a free market. The free market will take care of everything. The government will only make things worse like it always does, like it always has. Thank you. Senator Ciccone. Well, thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, and it's great to be here today uh, to make a contribution on the establishment of a national reconstruction fund. And it is great to, to have Senators uh, Sky also in the chamber here, who probably no doubt champion uh, what I'm about to say. So good to see you, Senator. 
Um, but in certainly um, in, 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 in making um, today's contribution um, about a very key or well, one of the very key uh, election commitments that the Albanese um, um, government took to the last federal election, this $15 billion fund is about revitalising an Australian industry that this country desperately needs. This country desperately needs to start to make things again right here in Australia. And in doing so, it needs to also represent one of our um, greatest investments that this country deserves. And certainly the, the, the manufacturing sector has been undervalued for some time. Um, and it, listening to the limited contributions that I heard this morning, um, you know, Australia suffered nearly a decade of policy drift, uh, especially when the coalition uh, go to the car industry to leave, to leave this country. You know, I still remember very much in my mind uh, when then the Treasurer, Joe Hockey, uh, famously told the car industry to leave. If you don't like it, just leave. And they did. They left, and that had a chilling effect right across uh, our, our economy, uh, particularly in our domestic manufacturing. Uh, and I remember that because there were a number of um, friends um, in my family. Uh, my father used to be one that worked in the car industry, but a number of family members and friends who unfortunately lost their job as a result. Uh, a number of them who worked for Ford uh, in Victoria uh, sadly lost their job because the then coalition government basically told the car companies to go. Uh, and they were no longer willing to support the industry that ensured that there were fantastic jobs, good paying jobs, jobs that ensured that there were generations of people that could look forward to, uh, to when they were you know, children. But unfortunately, the uh, manufacturing sector suffered greatly. So when we came to um, the 29, um, 2019 election and then uh, subsequently the one after, Labor understood that there was a need to address this. I mean, currently we rank as a country dead last in the OECD when it comes to manufacturing self-sufficiency. That is an embarrassment considering the number of bright people that we have in this country. And that is why I wanted to rise today to make a very brief contribution about why I will be supporting the uh, Albanese government's $15 billion fund. Now, the fund will have seven priority investment areas, value adding in our resources, value adding in our agriculture, forestry and fishery sectors, transport, medical science, renewables and low emissions technology, defence capability and enabling capability like quantum computing, robotics and AI. And these are areas that have been selected to strategically drive economic development in our region and outer suburbs, boost our sovereign capability, diversify the nation's economy and help create secure jobs, because that is really the crux of this uh, policy. Throughout the COVID pandemic, we all saw how our over-reliance on international supply chains left us so exposed to disruptions outside of our control. We really need to have control over our supply chains once again. And you can only do that if you have a strong domestic manufacturing sector. But the Australian workers and businesses who stepped up to provide us with the goods and services that we all rely on show that there is great potential to improve our domestic capability. And the National Reconstruction Fund is all about realising this potential. The fund will direct significant investment into regional Australia, creating jobs in agriculture, forestry, resources and other important industries. As the government has previously announced, $500 million of targeted investment will be directed towards value-adding in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food and fibre. And that is so, so important. So it's particularly disappointing to hear the contributions by those opposite that the party that they pretend to stand up for regional Australia, and I want to particularly point out the National Party, is refusing to support the establishment of this fund. It will benefit regional Australia. This is exactly the sort of policy that the Nationals should be supporting. The government is stepping in to ensure that regional Australia benefits from the national building and industry development that too often does favour big cities. But unlike the political uh, cash plushes from those opposite when they were in government, the National Reconstruction Fund will be directed by an independent board. 
No colour-coded spreadsheets, no short-term political thinking, just strategic investments that are based on the priority of this government, a future that is made here in Australia. A couple of weeks ago, I stood up in this place and spoke about how the National Reconstruction Fund will stimulate defence manufacturing. And it was interesting, uh, the comments that Senator uh, Ralph Babette made uh, earlier around how the government isn't really doing enough in that space. But putting that to one side, it is important to note that we are maximising sourcing requirements from Australian suppliers employing Australian workers. We should be very proud about the defence industry in this country. And we can ensure that our own country plays a much more active role in our defence supply chain. But it is also important for other industries, and particularly those that have been very close to my heart. Now, for a long time, I've argued that forestry will be key to our low emissions future. And the priority four areas of the National Reconstruction Fund do recognise this. By providing investment for value add in forestry, we can ensure that demand for timber products, which only keeps increasing, which we must know must always always uh, go towards meeting our climate goals can be met with Australian goods Australian goods the Australian Forest Products Association has welcomed assurances from the government that Australian firms which add value to our native forest products in mills and manufacturing plants right across the country will be eligible for investment through the National Reconstruction Fund value adding activities in agriculture will also be eligible for investment through the National Reconstruction Fund, ensuring that Australian workers and businesses play a significant role in more steps in agriculture's supply chain. And this is one of the fundamental purposes of the fund, because we're a clever country. And with backing of the government, we can perform more of the value-adding activities in several supply chains right here in Australia, instead of just focusing on the first steps of the chain by supplying commodities. The advanced manufacturing process that will be supported through the National Reconstruction Fund are integral to a low emissions future, not just in Australia, but in every nation that is taking action on climate change. We want Australia to be in a position to play a role not just in providing the materials required to make future technologies, but also design and manufacturing processes. Our country is rich with valuable critical resources. But for decades, we've mined those resources and shipped them overseas for other countries to process. And often, we then import these finished products at many times the price, leaving all the profits and jobs overseas. Australia has the knowledge and capability and capacity to do better than this. So many technologies have been invented here, including the technology behind solar panels. But these technologies are being manufactured overseas. So if we are to mine it here, we should make it here. And if we are to invent it here, then we should make it here. As a co-investment fund, which always gets lost in, in this argument, it is a co-investment fund, the National Reconstruction Fund will make investing in seven priority areas more attractive for private capital, crowding in investment to create high quality, sustainable industries and jobs. There has been some commentary about the potential inflationary impact of this investment. And of course, inflation is a very big, big economic challenge facing our country. But the fund will require to generate a positive portfolio rate of return, reinvesting its returns to become self-sustaining, Senator Carr. Sorry? Senator, Senator, Senator Scar, Scar I think um, Senator Ciccone, it is interesting Senators. to see the pessimistic view that the opposition. Sorry, Senator the, the objections are disorderly. I'm finding it hard to follow Senator Ciccone's speech. So. Uh, Sen Senator Scar, Senator Ciccone. Look, th thank you, uh, thank you um, Acting Deputy President. But really, the, the coalition are always doomsayers, always trying to play down the economy always trying to say how bad it is that Labor's actually finally standing up for workers, stand up for domestic manufacturing in this country, somehow always playing you know, the, the, the glass is always half empty approach. Why don't you come into this place and have a positive attitude about backing in Australian workers and Australian businesses? And let's give it a go together. Let's see some bipartisanship when it comes to manufacturing in this place. You know, it is really, really concerning to see that every time that we try and put up a policy, one that we did take to the election, mind you, 
I mean, we did take this to the election, Senator Scar. Uh, you know, a, a bit of positivity will go a long way. You know, and we saw that play out with the New South Wales election over the weekend. You know, Chris Minns and his team took a very much a, a fresh start approach to restarting the economy over in New South Wales, reinvesting in their manufacturing, investing in the people, into the health and education sectors in New South Wales, and, and look what happened. You know, the, the public, the public backed in Labor. They backed in New South Wales Labor over a government that, quite frankly, was past its use-by date and was more interested in its own internals. But you know, I'm not here to sort of uh, talk about the New South Wales uh, election result, although I must say it was very hard not to drop that into my speech today, uh, apart from Collingwood having a, a, a second win over the weekend. And uh, good to see that the Pies are finally back on top of the AFL ladder. But putting that to one side, you know, there's been much commentary around the National Reconstruction Fund, and, and this investment is expected to generate economic growth and boost productivity, which is why we are delivering this policy, and which we know is key to driving down inflation. We need to address the supply issues. Of course, the other, the, of course, the um, other way that the National Reconstruction Fund will actually help combat these pressures is by addressing the supply chain. Issues. We know that a lack of supply chain, uh, a lack of supply, is driving up the cost of many of the inputs that are required across the economy. With these high input costs, then rippling through producers and consumers, the fund will help address this lack of supply by improving our domestic cap capacity and insulating uh, our economy from future supply shocks. There's long been a, an argument made by government that it should have no role in playing, playing winners. But no role to play guide in the industry, no role to play other than establishing guardrails, letting businesses do the right thing and only stepping in when there's been market failure, as we'd heard from some opposite. But while those opposite do argue that we shouldn't be picking winners, I mean, the previous government spent almost a decade picking, unfortunately, some of these losers. And you know, we saw what happened with the car industry leaving this country, leaving this industry, uh, leaving this country, but leaving many towns and communities in the lurch. The destructive ripple effect that that had through local economies cannot be overstated. The lasting impact on our ability to manufacture advanced products in this country is still being felt. So passing this bill is a step forward, a step forward to revitalising the damage that was caused. So let's all work together in this place. Let's all get together and support and regenerate the manufacturing uh, in this country. Let's improve our sovereign capability across key areas. Let's reduce our reliance on fragile and uncertain international supply chains. So I urge everyone in this chamber, particularly the National Party, who say that they support regional strategy, to support this bill. And let's support the revival of manufacturing, support regional employment and support a future made here in Australia. Senator Cadell. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise for a brief contribution today. It's good to see in the House we can agree on many things, and my speech will be short but potentially 30 seconds longer because of Senator Ciccone's speech. And I say that I too, like Senator Ciccone, am not here to talk about the. It may come up. Uh, I'm also here not to talk about the New South Wales election results, but I also am here to talk about Collingwood's second win and being top of the table again. But on this bill, and where we go. It is a, a bit of a tear for me on this because it is, on first reading, a bill that has really good motives, really good uh, goals and seeks to do something that Australia needs tremendously. And I thank uh, Senator Ayres for um, facilitating some briefings on how this goes and being able to answer some questions and fill some things out for me. I think that's the way government should work. We should be here trying to work out how we make these things happen. And it's always great in question time to get up here and be shouted at about how we didn't support energy relief in that single sitting day, but it was the mechanism we didn't support and without the consultation. There was more consultation here. I would urge it to come sooner because I don't think it was impossible for this side to make some changes because where it lands, it wasn't in an area where we would necessarily like to support, but it was only a chip and a putt away. And a bit of work together, a bit of early consultation and a bit of cooperation and I think we would have potentially been able to get somewhere. Our great fear is 
on the mechanisms for injecting the, the money into the market and the transparency around that. And from a regional perspective, there was a bit of a fear that it becomes a bit of a quango and you see money going into, into consultancies, money going into um, investment firms and lots of more BMWs and Range Rovers getting around Vaucluse and Pran. Uh, if I'm saying that right, it looks like prawn to me, but it's, we're worried about how that goes uh, and where that goes. But on the whole process, I would like to say that I thought this has a bill with good motivations. It being a chip and a putt, I think some of the negotiations to get it across the line on numbers have made it more a seven iron. It's driven a bit further away than we can support, and I understand that. But that is a, not a bad process. What I do have a problem with, we're talking about this regional manufacturing and how all the bills from the other side aren't in line. We'll shortly address potentially the safeguard mechanism later this week in this place. And all the good things that this bill may do for regional manufacturing, that will undo some of it. And so we have policy working against itself and not in alignment, which is a concern for me. I specifically want to raise the grandfathering of existing contracts under the safeguard mechanism. Originally, anything that goes through and goes forward, and I use a specific example of Orica and their, uh, their plants around ammonia plants. They've upgraded one in Newcastle, um, just north of my home base in the Hunter Valley, to be best in world practice, based on they have pl uh, contracts going out to 2029. 20, and they were about to upgrade one uh, in North Queensland at Gladstone to be world's best practice under the basis that they have these ongoing contracts. But under the mechanism that will come forward later in the week, potentially passing the other house, is that is now grandfathered to two-year um, processes. So there is no investment certainty in that manufacturing industry for North Queensland. So they've pulled out of the North Queensland project, which would have made a cleaner project, would have made a, a cleaner process for doing AN in Australia, and we will lose manufacturing jobs because of inconsistency. So that is a real concern for me. I do note that happy to give credit where credit's due. As opposed to our manufacturing or the previous government's manufacturing plan last year, this does include agriculture in a bigger way, which is a good thing. I think the 500 million allocated, as Senator Ciccone said in the first batch of the 7 million, a uh, 7 billion, can only go up and should go up to help support agriculture. There are many things Australia gets battered on for our emissions or for our exports or for our mining about the damage we do to the region by others, but we don't get the credit for feeding the region, for all the food we produce to feed the region and the benefit that gives to others with our broad clan wheat, and I think this can assist it. So, in brief, I think the transparency, I think the mechanisms, I think generating a potential whole list of consultancies that will benefit out of this are a problem. I think the timing of will we get it to market soon enough, I know seven billion is allocated quick, that is a concern for us. And some of the negotiations about what's excluded, we don't know what's coming up. And in the mining areas on, on what's going there, if we're talking about existing mines and what we're doing there, that's fine. But mining isn't required. If we're talking about the cobalt, the nickel, the lithium, the copper, all these things, the number of mines we need to bring online, some research and some manufacturing in that mining sector will bring that online to help the current plan, which is the rewiring the nation plan. So the nationals understand we feel the motive of uh, creating regional jobs. We respect the government for doing that, but unfortunately we haven't been able to meet you on this bill. Hope to have longer, earlier consultations on the next one, but uh, we'll be opposing. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Madam Acting Deputy President, as a servant to the many different people who make up our one amazing Queensland community, I speak to the National Reconstruction Corporation Bill 2023. One Nation has on occasion pointed out that Labor will run a government for the benefit of their union bosses, their mates. The Liberals for the benefit of their big business mates. And the Teals and Greens for the benefit of their sugar daddies, billionaire climate change carpetbaggers. So it was with amusement that I saw an exchange between Minister Gallagher and Senator Rennick on social media over the weekend. Senator Rennick made mention in a speech that he did not agree with the slush funds the Liberal National set up during their government. And I appreciate and compliment Senator Rennick for his integrity. He's shown that re repeatedly in this parliament and outside. 
Senator Gallagher could not resist. Oblivious to the irony of her comments, Minister Gallagher said Senator Rennick had, quote, belled the cat, admitting to, quote, slush funds and rorts galore. The bell the cat is a medieval fable, a cautionary tale on the nature of impossible tasks. Admittedly, an appropriate choice given the impossibility of the Liberals ever running government for the benefit of the people. But the irony of the Minister's decision to engage the Liberals on the issue of rorting is tone deaf, considering this, this bill was on the notice paper at the time. The Minister's words are suggestive of a quite different fable, the pot calling the kettle black, which is a 16th century Spanish hom homily in which somebody accuses someone else of a fault which the accuser shares and therefore is an example of psychological projection. That's a polite way of saying hypocrisy. The National Reconstruction Corporation Bill 2023 is 100% pork barrel, the very thing of which the Minister accuses others. This bill creates a $15 billion fund to oversee Australia's reconstruction. It would have been helpful to define the word reconstruction, Minister. Minister Husick must have overlooked the fundamental reason for this bill. The word reconstruction does not appear in this bill. At a guess, reconstruction must involve infrastructure spending, right? Wrong. The word infrastructure does not appear in this bill either. The word was added by the crossbench in the other place, the House of Reps, as part of their amendment banning, banning certain types of infrastructure spending. The Greens and Teals, helpful as usual. For clarity, that was sarcasm. The bill does provide for spending on priority projects, yet there's no definition of what a priority project actually is. I understand these will be manufacturing projects, why then does the bill not mention the word manufacturing? Not once is manufacturing mentioned. This is significant because the bill allows the minister to fill in all these details later. Yet, if these much needed initiatives, reconstruction, manufacturing and infrastructure were the purpose of this bill, then section five would define these concepts and set out what is and is not reconstruction, manufacturing and infrastructure. It does not. It fails to do this basic step. I expected to see a statement of fairness, ensuring projects are funded based on the needs of the region in which the projects are, are located, having mind to the overarching concept of national interest. There's a novelty. It doesn't do that either, which is not a novelty, because that's the way this parliament works. It's not in the, parliament in, in the, in the national interest. This bill does have a section on consultation requiring the corporation to consult with the Australian Banking Association, Minister Jones's best mates are the first ones on the list. What a surprise. The Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the Australian Investment Council, the Industry Super Australia and the Law Council of Australia. What an odd list. If this was about infrastructure, the, re the requirement would be to consult with Infrastructure Australia. Not there. If this was about manufacturing, then consult with Manufacturing Australia or to drive manufacturing into a new era, one could consult, would consult, with the Australian Advanced Manufacturing Council. No. Taking Australian industry into the emerging space industry offers the prospect of billions in new sales and high-paying breadwinner jobs. The Space Industry Association of Australia should have been on that list, was not. $15 billion in funding without once mentioning the fundamental purpose of the spending. 15 billion, without once requiring consultation with the bodies that could help direct this interest, this spending to the national interest. No checks, no balances, no guidance to the minister, no guidance to the board of the corporation, no KPIs, key performance indicators, no measure of success, no measure of failure. Call this bill a blank check is an insult to blank checks, and it's an insult to taxpayers who are spending this money. The Senate Economics Legislation Committee inquiry into the bill does cast some light on where this money will be spent. The inquiry heard from multiple witnesses advocating for spending the $15 billion on, on solar and wind energy boondoggles. 
more carpet bagging. Australia already has the Clean Energy Fund spending $25 billion on unreliable weather dependent power to take us back to the before the Industrial Revolution. If the transition to weather dependent power was actually in the national interest and dictated by market forces, these solar and wind carpet baggers would not be buzzing around reconstruction funding like flies in search of excrement. I foreshadow an amendment in the Committee of the Whole which requires the corporation cannot invest in an energy project that meets the criteria for funding by the Clean Energy Council. No double dipping. There is no justification for using this $15 billion of taxpayer money to make Australia's energy capacity worse. President, Madam Acting Deputy President, the title of the bill raises an important question. What exactly are we reconstructing from? Are we reconstructing from three years of ruinous COVID lockdowns and restrictions that gutted the economy, destroyed the economy? Are we reconstructing from a generation of ruinous net zero measures that have seen cheap, reliable, baseload power replaced with expensive and short-lived materials heavy wind and solar? Are we reconstructing from the exporting of Australia's manufacturing sector to China under the Hawke-Keating government, Labor government in the 80s? Indeed, discussion on the nuclear subs purchased last week shows former Prime Minister Keating has lost none of his loyalty to China. Are we reconstructing from a generation of oppressive development constraints provided across the range of government? Red tape from an out-of-control bureaucracy that demands more and more power with less and less oversight in the pursuit of a war against common sense, freedom and basic decency. On the green tape, designed to make rich, pampered inner-city lovies feel better about their own environmental footprint while destroying any chance the rural sector has for a profitable business? Or is it blue tape from the unelected, the mountain of unelected, unaccountable foreign bureaucrats spending a gospel of everyday Australians having less so predatory billionaires can own it all? It's Australians having less so that predatory billionaires can own it all. That's their ideological Bible. It is not the economy that needs reconstruction. It is the government that needs reconstruction. So here's One Nation's reconstruction plan. Just stop it. Stop it. Stop strangling the life out of the private sector. Stop strangling the life out of small business. Stop strangling the life out of families and taxpayers. Stop using taxpayers' money to pick winners and losers amongst new business ventures when that task should rightly be performed by the free market and by personal enterprise and initiative, leading to personal responsibility. Stop rewarding your mates in the solar and wind sector who have spent, tons, who have spent tens of millions of dollars earned from renewable solar and wind boondoggles to get pet parliamentarians elected, to get pet parliamentarians elected who now have seriously conflicted loyalties. Stop rewarding party donors with taxpayer money dressed up as reconstructing fund, reconstruction funding. Stop the cronyism. Australia is not and never will be a centrally planned economy. In fact, no economy will be centrally planned. They all collapse. We have a trillion dollar deficit and the Albanese government is throwing around $15 billion like it were monopoly money. It's time the government got out of the way of the private sector, personal enterprise, and let the profit motive and free enterprise competition decide what gets built and what does not. Let the, tax, let, let the customers decide. The National Reconstruction Corporation Fund Bill 2023 is last century Soviet thinking, a product of the comrades deep in trades hall who do not seem to have noticed that the Soviet Union has fallen because it failed to maintain the standard of living of everyday Australians. Standards of living in Australia are decreasing the reverse of what is happening to energy prices, and that is the cause, one of the many causes. This bill is ideological rubbish designed to reward businesses who promote joining union bosses. That is the sentence the minister will put in later. Madam Acting Deputy President, subject to amendments, One Nation opposes this bill. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Thank you. I rise to contribute to this debate, and it's been interesting to 
hear the various contributions so far. But let's be clear, this bill is essential. This is an essential step for our country, for rebuilding our industrial capability and creating secure and well-paid jobs. The lack of vision that we've seen from the Liberal government has led to policy drift and decline in our manufacturing self-sufficiency. This bill is not just another piece of legislation. It is a crucial step towards rebuilding our industrial capability, creating those jobs and securing our future prosperity. And I assure Senator Roberts that it is most certainly in our nation's interests to pass this bill. We saw very clearly through the pandemic that our ability to manufacture world-class products and ensure our national resilience was brought into question. We sailed dangerously close to not having the supplies that we need. We had challenges with PPE, with ventilators, these things that were essential for us at the time, but we did not have the capability to produce them ourselves because we import the bulk of what we need from overseas. The fact is that we have the smallest manufacturing industry relative to domestic purchase of any OECD country, and we need to address that. To ensure we have a prosperous future, we must prioritise building robust and adaptable industries that can produce the essential goods in times of crisis. And to address one of the points raised by Senator Cadell, the safeguards mechanism, which will hopefully uh, be introduced into this chamber later this week, will work very well with this bill. We have huge challenges to decarbonise our industry and having those available funds to invest in essential areas will work exceptionally well with the safeguards mechanism. There is no shortage of enthusiasm, skill in business, in industry and right across this country. We just need to harness it and structure it because we are heading in the right direction. The opportunities we have as a nation are boundless. Australia is an innovative country. We've proven that time and time again. But we must develop the pathways that allow our science and technology brains to create those new ideas and then allow our industry brains to turn that into profitable, deliverable, sustainable industries of the future. We're all tired of hearing organisations going overseas because they couldn't find the capital to back their idea here but had a willing investment partner overseas. We can end that, and that's exactly what we are looking to do in taking this step. We can support those great Australian ideas into fruition. And this, this bill is Labor backing innovation, backing entrepreneurs, backing our industries and the growth of new organisations in our manufacturing sectors. The plan to boost our regional economic development and accelerate our transition to becoming a renewable superpower, increase investor confidence and build on our natural and competitive strengths is quite frankly a no-brainer. Furthermore, the corporation will assist Australian industry to seize new growth opportunities by providing finance for projects that add value, improve productivity and support transformation. This fund will, will achieve similar uh, structures as the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which has been raised a number of times uh, throughout this debate. The CEFC has proven that these kind of structured funds do genuinely work. I remember when the CEFC was first brought to bear, there was a sense that 
it would default. There would be a lot of defaults within uh, some of the financing structures. But that was not the case. It has been a very successful structure, and basing this um, restructuring bill on that is a wise move because we know that it can work. So, a lot of the intellectual property that we have in various areas um, gets exported overseas. We've seen that in um, the medical development industry, and we've seen it, as has been mentioned here, with solar panels. A significant amount of that intellectual property was developed here but was shipped overseas, where it was further developed, the product is developed, and then we buy it back. There are so many opportunities for us to cut that step out, to keep our industries and our ideas onshore to the fruition of their development. And that's good for us as a country. It's good for jobs. It's good for industry. It's good for everyone. So, I think what we've seen with the Liberals' lack of vision over the past decade has resulted to us falling to last place in the Manufacturing Self-Sufficiency uh, Index among OECD countries. That's not something to be proud of. That's something that we should seriously address. This trend has to be reversed, and the National Reconstruction Fund is the, step, the first step in that direction. This bill is a golden opportunity for us to revive Australia's ability to make world-class products, create well-paying jobs and secure our future prosperity. We cannot miss this opportunity and I encourage everyone in this chamber to put aside the political barbs and think very, very seriously about what this is doing for our development, for our regions and our future in industrial and manufacturing opportunities. Thank you, Senator Krogan. Senator, oh, Samaski. Thank you. I was going to call Senator Hughes sitting in front of you. She'll come up a bit later. <laughs> Not in a hurry. Want to pull a quorum? Want to pull a quorum? Senator Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I too rise today to contribute to the debate on the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023. The Albanese government is heralding the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation as the first step in Labor's plan to rebuild Australia's industrial base. And we've heard that again here today. This is a great ambition, and I'm all for increasing manufacturing and building prosperity across the country, especially if it helps rural and regional communities like my home state of Tasmania. But this bill has been rushed, and it is not the right solution. The National Reconstruction Fund is supposed to be up and running by next financial year, but the government has not even committed to a launch date yet. Clearly, it hasn't been thought through and doesn't actually have a lot of substance behind it. The National Reconstruction Fund will be administered by a corporation with a chief executive officer and an independent board who will oversee the corporation and its fund. And Minister, the Minister for Industry and Science, Ed Husick MP, has discretion to appoint the chair and board members. Can we trust Minister Husick to appoint truly independent members to the board of this $15 billion fund? This is the same minister who was caught out sending his official mail using paper made in the UK. Why not use paper made in Australia, Mr Husick? Well, that may have been because Mr Albanese promised forestry would be a priority under the National Reconstruction Fund before the federal election last year. But less than a year on, he's broken this promise by agreeing to the Greens' demand to cut out the native forestry industry in return for their support of the fund. The corporation will be tasked with delivering funding for projects that are designed as national priorities by the government. Instead of vague and indiscriminate ideals, we need to drive investment into specific sectors and provide certainty for Australian manufacturers and industry. This proposed model actually makes accessing funding harder because it shifts from the existing competitive grant programs, which already have robust selection processes, to the government acquiring equity, providing loans for projects. Some manufacturers could struggle to meet the return on investment thresholds as part of these loans while they are busy building capacity and others will be ruled out of eligibility because their margins are too small or too risky because of supply chain shortages. It will take years for the money to start flowing and to get the model for this fund right. So what happens to manufacturers in the meantime? 
And on top of these access issues, I also want to highlight how the prescriptive nature of funding requirements and the need for a guaranteed return means those who receive the go-ahead will be unable to invest in innovation. We've all heard the stories of innovation that involve years of research and development and many failures before the right combination was found and developed. Australian John O'Sullivan and his CSIRO colleagues were investigating echoes of black holes when they came up with a way to send signals to a destination without interruption. We know this innovation as Wi-Fi, but it actually began as black hole research. The National Reconstruction Fund model will not encourage innovations like Wi-Fi as it does not allow failure. How can we have innovations without trial and error? This idea, its design and its planned execution is problematic. We on this side of the chamber acknowledge the importance of having strong supports for Australian manufacturing. We achieve this through our modern manufacturing strategy. This government's proposal is at a much greater cost and has a far greater risk for the taxpayers of Australia without any guarantee of the rewards that our policies and, pr pr and proven and delivered. What we do know, according to the Prime Minister's media release, is that the government plans to allocate funds from the National Reconstruction Fund to improvements in powering Australia, medical manufacturing, value adding in resources, critical technologies, advanced manufacturing and agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food and fibre. That was how it was announced. Noting, of course, that the government have now done that desperate, dodgy deal with the Greens, which will prohibit coal or gas from receiving finance from the fund. So what, can we, what we can see is that the Albanese government is proposing a corporation that can invest billions of dollars into projects in specific priority areas that already have designated funding arrangements. Consider, for instance, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the Medical Research Future Fund or the modern manufacturing strategy that the coalition set up. These initiatives offered focused funding for specific industry areas, so the Labor government, therefore, is really just offering us a rebrand. At a time when our country is battling rising energy prices, labour market shortages and disrupted supply chains, this government wants to add more manufacturing into a mix via a fund that is not needed and was not in the budget. This bill ignores the economic issues we are already facing and which must be addressed first. Kick-starting a series of significant manufacturing projects requires strong economic conditions, and that is something we just do not have right now. This bill does not follow good fiscal considerations. The initial $5 billion appropriation is provided once the bill passes, but the timing of the remaining $10 billion is not subject to further parliamentary approval. Indeed, similar financial structures to what we see proposed for the National Reconstruction Fund were criticised by the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, in February of this year. In its 2022 Article 4 consultation, the IMF stated, Implementation of below-the-line activity through newly created investment vehicles should be phased appropriately and, more broadly, a proliferation of such vehicles should be avoided." End quote. Further, the IMF said, cost of living support in light of high energy prices should be targeted, aimed at protecting vulnerable households and small viable firms. End quote. This is a clear indication of where our focus should be right now. Manufacturers across Australia are struggling with rising power prices. The government's priority should be delivering inflationary support for the industry rather than redirecting funds for manufacturing projects that had already been approved and costed under the modern manufacturing initiatives. Projects came to a standstill and people lost jobs because of this government's redirection of funds to an initiative that does not have a launch date and industry feedback suggests could take some years to get right. Those will be lost years for manufacturers across Australia. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Askew. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, and it pays to watch the speakers list. The, the Labor Party went to the federal election last May with a $15 billion commitment to deliver a national reconstruction fund. Now, on the surface, it sounds like a, a an exciting proposition. But as with so many of Labor's election promises before and after the election, this one will not deliver what industry wants. It won't deliver what the economy needs, and nor does it deliver what the community was expecting. It's not what Labor said it would do. But frankly, you know, why should any Australian be surprised 
that what Labor comes with post the election is different to what they said before the election. I mean, this government wasted no time in dismantling so many of its lofty election objectives. Their October budget slashed programs, particularly programs to deliver infrastructure in regional Australia. It pushed up the cost of living for families and it put even greater pressure on rural and regional Australia. I mean, let's look at what the Prime Minister promised. He went to the election promising he would drive down electricity prices. Indeed, 97 times, yes, 97 times, he promised he would cut electricity bills and they would fall by $275. <coughs> very specific, a very specific number, and he was wedded to it. And indeed, they have not gone down by $275. Indeed, they've gone up a lot. And their proposed cap on coal and gas prices has done nothing to alleviate the rising costs of electricity prices. The Prime Minister went to the election saying superannuation would not be touched. It was sacrosanct. And we now know that one in ten Australians will have their super impacted by the changes, the taxation changes that this government, who promised they wouldn't touch super, are now bringing in. Let's not talk about what they're proposing for franking credits, eh? That was another we won't touch franking credits. Mm. He went to the election promising to strengthen Medicare, but instead He's cut back Medicare-funded mental health support. They've cut back telehealth, and bulk billing rates are falling everywhere. They promised cheaper medicine, but now we're seeing them remove medicines from the pharmaceutical benefits scheme, meaning people who depended on these medicines are now faced and forced, faced with higher prices at a time of higher inflation higher cost of living pressures across every single aspect of living. These are medicines that were on the PBS and they're being removed from the PBS. Vital, life-saving medicines. Labor have butchered the support available to encourage overseas trained doctors to move to rural areas through changes to the distribution priority classification system. So now, when the DPA system ensured that overseas trained doctors or bonded medical students had to move to regional areas, or regional areas only could recruit those doctors, Labor have reclassified it so that peri-urban areas have the same status as places like my hometown of Deniliquin or Burke or Wentworth in the southwest. I have tried getting a doctor, thank you, Senator Pratt, and I, we have also tried getting doctors to move to those areas through the distribution priority area status, and Labor have just made that task impossible because now they can move to Western Sydney and under that DPA status. Whereas before they couldn't, so I, I do not accept. I accept your heckle because you are wrong. We were seeing doctors move out to regional areas, not enough, admittedly. We introduced changes to ensure the Murray Darling Medical School was established to train doctors in regional areas. And what did we hear on the weekend? We heard your health minister. Mark Butler say to the pharmacists that there will be health cuts in the budget. Where are those health cuts going to be felt the most? I can tell you where they're going to be felt the most. Rural and regional areas. It is despicable the disrespect that this government has for rural and regional areas. They have butchered rural and regional infrastructure programs. The October budget set out clearly what this government thinks of rural and regional Australians. 
in the budget, they did have $4.7 billion Senator, for sorry, childcare sorry, support. Senator Dave, if you just want to resume your seat. Senator Pratt on the point of order. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. A point of order. Uh, I wanted to draw your attention to the relevance of Senator Davies' speech. She hasn't yet touched on the bill uh, before us. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Pratt. Senator Davey, it is, or you have been going nearly six minutes, and I would concur with Senator Pratt. If you want to come back to the subject of the bill in front of us, please. Well, the subject of the bill is very much that with a $15 billion commitment to deliver this National Reconstruction Fund, I cannot see anything in what is proposed that uh, reflects on how this fund is going to help rural and regional Australia. And I am making the very valid point that the actual bill is entirely different to what people expected prior to the election, to what was um, promised prior to the election. I mean, we took to the election a very strong manufacturing proposal, uh, and this bill was Labor's answer to that. However, in this bill, um, they're not going to make any changes. We know manufacturing is a major contributor to the Australian economy. It is a major employer in so many rural towns, small, medium and large businesses alike. They're all the lifeblood of these towns. And manufacturing makes a huge contribution to the prosperity of all Australians. And our manufacturing policy was designed to encourage manufacturing investment in rural and regional Australia. But like the rest of the economy, manufacturing is being continually dragged down by the broken promises of Labor at the state and federal government level. And this includes, I mean, the, the increasing cost of power is having such a negative impact on our manufacturing sector. And what we see in this bill, what this bill will do, is to undermine and confuse many industry sectors as to what the government's priorities are now and into the future. In these uncertain international times, Industry Australia needs to know that their federal government has their back, but too many of our major industries don't know where they stand. Take the forestry industry, for example. On this bill, I'll keep it relevant so Senator Pratt can continue to play on her phone and um, listen in and understand why we're opposed to this bill. The forestry industry made a submission as an industry stakeholder. The Australian Forest Products Association pointed out that their timber processing facilities are limited in the investment they can justify because of a shortage of wood fibre. And why is there a shortage? Because Labor governments across Australia are shutting down native forestry industries. We've got Victoria shutting down native forestry. Western Australia shutting down native forestry. But the government makes assurances. Oh, it's OK. We'll accept plantation forestry. Well, how does that help Tasmania that is entirely dependent on native forestry? Because the Labor Greens aligned state governments are consistently shutting down this viable, sustainable industry that ironically helps us with our carbon capture schemes. But no, no, it's not good enough because we know the Greens' only approach to carbon capture is to, is to just lock it up and walk away, let the trees do their thing and walk away with no management and no return on investment. The mining industry, for so long the backbone of our standard of living, is another industry that has been battered by Labor. And in their submission on this bill, they said the fastest way to attract investment to the sector is to approve and open more mines in a timely manner. The longer the approvals process, the greater the perceived risk. The ALP is shooting their program in the foot as mines can take up to a decade 
to approve. And we're not just talking about coal mines here. We are talking about critical minerals, essential for us to have a renewable energy industry in Australia. But by beefing up the National Environment Protection Authority, their own policies, and this is not me saying this, this is, this is the mining industry, their own policies are at odds with the outcomes of this bill. Similar sentiments and concerns have been expressed by so many other manufacturers. The steel industry, the cement industry, aluminium, all unclear as to what it will mean. Even the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry said, and I quote, there is no clear definition of what a priority area of the Australian economy is, end quote. And on the matter of fiscal responsibility of this legislation, again, evidence, like so many of Labor's thought bubbles, no consideration has been given to the inflationary pressures of this bill. And that was even acknowledged by the Assistant Minister for Manufacturing during a Senate estimates hearing. The International Monetary Fund has criticised similar financial structures as to the one that underpins this bill. The IMF said the cost of living support in light of high energy prices should be targeted and aimed at protecting vulnerable households and small viable firms. The Albanese government has been repetitive in its claim as to the state of the budget they inherited, but this bill is going to add $45 billion in off-budget spending. Off-budget. Unaccountable. Not transparent. Yeah. It's not what this government promised. They, they promised increased accountability, increased transparency, and yet what we are seeing is increased off-budget spending measures. Where is the fiscal responsibility? The high ground that they claim to have is looking very low indeed. This bill highlights the inability of Labor to deliver a non-partisan program that will assist all sectors. This bill picks favourites. This bill should not be supported in its current form. I note that the Coalition have several amendments which will go some way to improving outcomes under this, uh, this bill if the amendments are, are passed. And I would strongly uh, request that all senators give those amendments full consideration. Um, but as it stands, I cannot support this bill and I uh, do not endorse it to the chamber. Senator Pocock. Deputy President. The pandemic highlighted in the starkest possible terms how critical it is to maintain a sovereign national manufacturing capability here in Australia. I welcome the establishment of the National Reconstruction Fund. This $15 billion facility will begin to help rebuild some of that much needed capability we have lost in recent years and will help set us up to be manufacturing into the future. It will help Australians have more confidence in supply chains and be better prepared for future shocks. And it will help innovative companies, including those in the ACT, move along the innovation and commercialisation pathway. Now, I know that when people think about the ACT, they probably think government and public service rather than manufacturing, uh, but that overlooks the extraordinary startup and small business sector we are so lucky to have based here in Canberra. Canberra has the highest number of startups per capita in the country. Some unbelievably talented, determined, passionate people doing some like, truly mind-boggling things from Quantum Brilliance, whose mission is to make quantum computing and everyday technology using their diamond-based tech, 
to Sienta, who has used electrochemistry to develop a 3D printer like none other on the planet. The ACT is a microbrewing powerhouse, and local firms like Skycraft recent, recently deployed the largest ever Australian-made payload sent into space. We want to grow the potential of these firms even further. Currently, Australia ranks below the OECD average of total government support to business, research and development spend as a percentage of GDP. We need to turn that around. That's why I'm moving a second reading amendment to this bill, asking the government to commit to exploring additional policy mechanisms to provide Australian startups access to finance as they navigate the path to commercialisation. We have to ensure that we have a startup ecosystem in Australia uh, that provides the type of capital needed to keep world-leading innovation here in Australia. We've seen, we've seen too many startups have to go overseas to develop technology that is important to Australia, is important to our future. For the NRF to succeed, we clearly need a sustainable pipeline of eligible projects uh, at a stage suitable for funding through the corporation. And additional work ensuring that there is uh, finance available for those startups will help address the, the challenge of, of early capital to get them through the valley of death. Uh, the other second reading amendment I'm moving uh, seeks a commitment from government to ensure the NRF Corporation has a presence here in Canberra. Uh, yes, I'm being parochial, but I believe it's far uh, more than that. The NRF will reach across so many sectors of our economy and it's vital that is, there is good engagement with other government agencies and departments. We can't afford to operate in silos. We need the NRF to be speaking to government departments like the Department of Industry, Department of Agriculture, uh, the CSIRO uh, and, and so many more. And a presence here will help foster that. I'll also be moving a number of substantive amendments that go to governance, reducing the maximum board terms uh, to four years plus four years rather than the five plus five and bringing forward the date of the first review to before the end of December in 2026. This is not something we can set and forget. We need to know early if this is working as intended or if tweaks are needed. Uh, I thank the government for being open to these suggestion, su suggestions. The other amendment I'm proposing on the bill goes to ensuring that we are meeting our international commitments under the Convention on Biological Diversity uh, from Rio in 1992 and the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity frame Framework. These are related but separate to our obligations under Paris and so vital given the unique biodiversity of our great continent. Uh, we're a mega diverse country, one of only two uh, developed countries that is mega diverse and biodiversity often misses out on being considered. Uh, we have to ensure that in all the decisions we're make, making, we are taking into account the impact, negative or positive, that it will have on nature. Uh, we're part of nature. If nature goes down, <laughs> We go down with it, and so it makes sense to consider the impact on nature in all of our programs and funds that are being set up. Uh, finally, I'll be seeking commitments from government that the independent NRF board will give consideration to climate-related re risks and nature-related risks when making investment decisions. Uh, TCFD and, N and TNFD are gaining traction and momentum and will be a critical tool in allowing companies to measure their climate and nature risks. This is more and more becoming uh, an expectation overseas and uh, it will be a huge benefit to businesses for Australia to implement best practice so we are not at a competitive 
uh, disadvantage uh, when dealing with European or, or, or American-based companies. I believe the board should also be considering nature-based solutions when making investment decisions, uh, as this is clearly a huge opportunity for Australia. We have some of uh, the world's best uh, environmental scientists, some of the be world's best innovators in that space, and ensuring that we can help them get that technology to the point where it is being scaled and manufactured here in Australia will open up huge markets into the future as the world grapples with the, the climate and biodiversity crises. There's clearly a huge potential to use the NRF to create the next generation uh, jobs and industries and environment ne we need uh, to be front and centre in the kind of future that we seek to build. So in, in principle I support uh, this bill, uh, looking at the, the huge investments that are underway in countries like the US uh, with the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act. Uh, this is us taking a, a significant, uh, in the context of things, smaller step, but I think really significant step uh, in Australia, ensuring that we are making things here in Australia. And we're not just making things, we're, we're helping Australian startups, Australian innovation, produce things here and ex ex export to the world. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Bocock. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise today to address the main reasons why the Coalition will not be supporting the National Reconstruction Fund Bill in its current format. And I'm actually surprised that some opposite are going to be supporting it, because when they come in to address this bill, their bill, they're not talking about selling the bill to us. They're not talking about how great it's going to be. All they do is keep looking back towards the coalition and talking about what the previous government did. And, and of course, they're rewriting history uh, significantly. Uh, but you know, if this was so great, wouldn't you think that they'd be in here to sell their bill, to talk about the uh, positive impacts it's going to have, rather than just using cheap political shots, uh, which then hilariously they talk about using cheap political shots. But uh, they are the government and they are, should be in here selling the positive outcomes to Australian people uh, on the bills that they propose, but unfortunately they can't do that because this bill does not produce those outcomes. Firstly, the bill ignores key economic issues, and we know that that's a consistent message from those of them opposite. And in order for any of these things to be successful, the government must address rising energy prices, labour market shortages and disrupted supply chains if we are to have a manufacturing sector that is able to succeed. And without policies that create strong economic conditions, any and all government spending is simply in vain. It would be money in one pocket and out the other due to the cost pressures the government is just failing to address. The Coalition is opposing this bill because this arrogant government is telling our manufacturers what they think they need, rather than addressing what manufacturers actually want. Now we know that Labor's made a desperate, dodgy deal with the Greens, their partners in crime, which will prohibit coal or gas from receiving finance from this National Reconstruction Fund at a time when energy prices are causing businesses to close. Those opposite are too busy doing deals with their Greens mate, which are going to further restrict manufacturing in this country. Because Australian manufacturers, and we on this side understand this completely, they rely on cheap energy to make things onshore. But Labor's continued demonisation of gas and broken promises to bring power prices down will force more Australian manufacturing overseas. Every expert in the country every single one, is calling on the Prime Minister to unlock more supply of gas, more supply, meeting the demand, lowering the price. And indeed, some manufacturers have had their gas bills triple, not double, but triple. But these backroom deals that they insist on making with the Greens undermine any effort to bring power prices down. 
and we know that Labor will always work with the Greens to push their own agenda rather than support the needs of Australian businesses and families. Secondly, why will we oppose in this bill is that we know it will create even more lost time for manufacturers in this broken model and it will take a significant time for any money to start flowing. The Clean Energy Finance Corporation, on which the NRF is modelled, was established in 2012 and the first investment was only made some 10 months later. Manufacturers in Australia cannot afford to wait that long. The government announced that the NRF should be up and running by next financial year, but haven't committed to a launch date. Should be. Should be up and running. We remember all the broken promises you made before the election—$275 off power bills. Instead, they're going the other way. 97 times Mr Albanese said that. Now no one opposite can even mention that number. Broken promises over superannuation. You said no changes to superannuation, and now we hear from Senator Gallagher really regularly that they're modest changes. Modest changes that are scaring farmers who may have to sell their family's property to pay a tax bill from an unrealised asset. And we know if franking credits there were going to be no changes, but now they're back on the agenda. So why should manufacturers have any faith when you talk about there should be a launch date by next financial year but won't actually outline when this will be up and running? Is this just going to be adding to the litany of already many, many, many broken promises? And industry feedback suggests that this type of funding mode takes years to get right and that those years will be lost to Australian manufacturers and will be causing the loss of significant jobs across our country. And let's not forget that while those manufacturers are waiting, we get closer and closer to 23rd, a world where hard to abate industries will no longer exist in Australia. Think about all the refining resources in this country, iron, coal, oil, they'll all be forced out and I've certainly in this place spoken about the cement industry and the impact the safeguard mechanism is going to have on that. We know that cement industries in Australia cannot abate the creation of clinker, the most important and emissions intensive part of the cement process. But yet those opposite are going to either send it offshore, destroying Australian jobs and Australian companies, ensuring that we have no sovereign supply of cement. And we know that all of this is just a recipe for economic disaster. And we can't blame the public servants in each individual agency. They only see the work that they're doing. They don't look at all the broader implications across the different bills and the different departments. That's actually the job of the government, for them to have a look at what's being proposed across government departments and to ensure that they are always considering the cost to our citizens, the impact on industry and what unintended consequences may be. But this is a government that just proves day on day that they are not up to the challenge. The NRF has a poor funding model. The model shifts from a competitive grants program with robust processes to government acquiring equity and providing loans when we talk about unintended consequences absolutely know what's coming down the track. Government equity and loan schemes are less accessible than grants. Manufacturers may struggle to meet the return on investment thresholds or put together built detailed business cases in-house. So what will happen to failed or failing loans? It's clear that the last experiment down this path, the Victorian Economic Development Corporation, uprooted manufacturers. Eligibility is another issue. Certain industries might have margins which are too small or it could be too risky with disrupted, disrupted supply chains. So many will no doubt miss out and the fund could become equivalent to a white elephant. And before the election, Mr Albanese also claimed, aside from 97 times $275 reduction to power bills, he also claimed that he was putting forestry at the heart of his manufacturing policy, naming it as a priority under the National Reconstruction Fund. On 17 May 2022, he wrote to Tasmanian forestry workers pleading for their vote. I promise you that if I become Prime Minister, he said, a government I lead will not shut down the native, industry, native forestry industry. I will take up the fight against them, referring to the Greens, to protect your job too. 
Not even a year on, the Prime Minister has broken this promise as well via his desperate, dodgy deal with the Greens in return for support for this National Reconstruction Fund, a deal which prohibits investment native forest logging in the so-called Reconstruction Fund. The bill also undermines investment certainty in national priorities, with the government changing Australia's national manufacturing priorities on a political whim, undermining investment decisions and eroding investor confidence. This is particularly pertinent to the space industry, complementary medicine, and also, to a lesser extent, recycling. The government's new priorities are too vague. Uh, they, they don't focus where is the focus should be needed to drive investment into specific sectors. And this is typical of Labor, choosing to spray money indiscriminately instead of continuing investment certainty for our manufacturers and industry. The government has displayed a callous lack of understanding for how these delays may have already damaged these projects. But one of the key pillars of this new manufacturing strategy was our strategic decision to bolster Australia's capability in the space sector. We supported funding to locally design, develop, manufacture and deploy specialised space products, equipment, systems and services for export to international markets and to support national and international space missions. The government has chosen to effectively wipe out the coalition's efforts to develop our space industry manufacturing by removing it as a priority area. The space industry and the Australian public are yet to understand the basis in which this shift in focus was made. The government must address the critical issues affecting our manufacturing, not tinker with a proven model. With power prices forecast, forecast to spike, not go down, to spike by 56 per cent, I say to those in the gallery, if you've already seen your power bills go up, they're about to go up a whole heap more, and you can thank those opposite for that. But also the businesses that are now going to be pushed to the brink. It's time this government delivers inflationary support for industry and put forward a plan to deal with these spiralling power prices. And finally, the fifth reason why the Coalition will not be supporting this National Reconstruction Fund in its current form is the complete fiscal irresponsibility that it is. Delivering funding well in excess of the coalition's modern delivering uh, in, in excess of the coalition's modern manufacturing strategy, initial five billion appropriation is provided upon passage of the bill. But the timing of the remaining ten billion dollars will not be subject to further parliamentary approval. So ten billion dollars of your money, ten billion dollars of those sitting in the gallery and every Australian taxpayer won't be subject to any scrutiny in this place. Those opposite, the Labor government will be able to put that money wherever they like. And we know how those slush funds work and benefit their mates in the unions, not small businesses in this country, not Australian manufacturers, and certainly not Australian families. And we know that similar financial structures to the one underpinning this bill have drawn criticism from the IMF, who stated that implementation of below-the-line activity through newly created investment vehicles such as the NRF should be phased appropriately and more broadly, a proliferation of such vehicles should be avoided. The IMF is saying that it should be avoided. And this is the important part, though, other than it saying it should be avoided. The cost of living support in light of high energy prices should be targeted, aimed at protecting vulnerable households and small viable firms. Let's not forget, though, Labor is carelessly rushing through a total of $45 billion of off-budget spending. How's that transparency going, guys? Remember that new kind of place? Well, we know that hasn't worked. We saw a disgraceful performance by one of your front bench ministers, cabinet ministers, last week in this place. You promised more transparency, but instead you've moved to $45 billion of off-budget spending. No accountability, no oversight, no transparency. The bill hasn't passed and already unions are licking their lips at the prospect of the NRF and have listed their demands. A third of the board positions hand-picked by the Australian Council of Trade Unions, the ACTU, that bastion of morality, not. Their positions will determine who gets access to funding. An enterprise agreement with unions as a precondition to make an application Application, applicants must not have engaged in conduct that treats workers unfairly. That's a very vague term and a vague way of saying if you're not with the unions, you're against them. 
and demanding that applicants must commit to direct employment. So if contractors or indirect workforce is used, they must be employed on the same conditions as the direct workforce. This essentially enshrines compulsory unionism if you want to be a successful applicant. And it's for these reasons, amongst others, but for these five reasons, primarily the coalition will not be supporting this bill in its current form. Senator Pocock B. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2022. The bill, as I expect it to be amended, creates a powerful new lever to move us further and faster towards a renewable future, to improved employment and more secure jobs, and to strengthening and rebuilding our industrial, manufacturing and ag agricultural base. It is a pathway uh, towards better jobs um, and to less pollution. The bill uh, will increase flows of finance into priority areas of the Australian economy, financing the businesses, the, the governments and other entities through loans, equity, guarantees and a wide range of other financial instruments. And it requires uh, that those investments will be solely or mainly Australian-based, but the Australian government would otherwise have full discretion to define those priority areas. So these are jobs in Australian companies for Australian citizens. It's focused on manufacturing and technology priorities and rebuilding our industrial base, which has been hollowed out over recent decades. We see funding of up to $3 billion for renewables and low emission technologies. 1.5 billion for men medical manufacturing, a billion for value adding in resources, and a billion for critical technologies, a billion for advanced manufacturing, and half a billion for value adding in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, food, and fibre. These areas need support in investment to encourage their shift to innovative technologies and a long term future. The fund will be funded by an initial $5 billion in equity and a further $10 billion by July 2029. It is vital that we support our essential industries as they make the transition from fossil fuels and carbon intensive production to renewables and a low pollution future. This is vital in our manufacturing, in our agriculture and broadly across our economy. We also must stop using public funds on new coal and gas on construction of gas pipelines, and we must not finance in any form native forest logging. I am very proud that the Greens took a proposal to the 2022 election for a Made in Australia bank that would support and finance manufacturing innovation and um, relocalising our supply chains. That was a very important policy, and I see many features of that policy in this bill before us today, especially through the amendments that we have secured that prohibit any investment in coal and gas and in native, native forest logging. We need leadership to foster our local industries. Our history tells us how important the leadership of governments is to growing those industries. In Adelaide, in South Australia, in places like Wyala, Port Augusta, Port Pirie, let down over many decades by sporadic intermediate intermittent investment, losses of jobs and insecure communities. So many of our kids have to leave those towns because there is not secure ongoing employment. And we need our clean, green agriculture in places like South Australia to find its way to a post-carbon pollution world. Our history tells us how important good leadership and good support is to a long-term investment future for our industries. I lived for many years in Newcastle in the early 1980s, a place I love, and I knocked on the door of the general manager of BHP as he announced thousands of job losses in that industry, asking him to employ more female apprentices. It was a bad day to make the request. But we've learned a lot from that transition in the township of Newcastle and the Hunter Valley. That region has learned that it's very important to make appropriate investments in the future as communities transition. They need early advice about the plans for employment changes, 
early support to make the skills development and create the employment bridges to the jobs of the future, and most importantly, access to the kinds of funds that are embedded in this bill as they support the, the emergent uh, new uh, industries and sectors that are the job creators of the future. I've lived now for many years in South Australia, and we there know also a lot about what goes wrong when investment and industry policy falls off the rails. We know too much about underinvestment in our manufacturing industries in our state. It's the failure to back manufacturing in our state that has resulted in an enormous amount of hardship and job losses. We certainly don't leadership, need leadership like we have seen by the coalition in the state of South Australia in our recent history. We are the poster child in our state of how not to do industry development. Joe Hockey slashed the Commonwealth's co-investment in the automotive industry by a mere $300 million a year in 2013, and South Australia lost more than 1,600 direct jobs in the Elizabeth plant and thousands of indirect jobs in the parts sector. For the failure to find its way to an investment in that last part of our manufacturing sector in car production in our state, we lost thousands of jobs. Many families never found their way back to a breadwinner in their household. Many of those workers with decades of experience and skill were not able to find their way into a labour market for their future. And we lost the opportunity to be leaders in the transition economy, to be the 21st century manufacturing hub that we really need, with highly skilled, well-paid workers producing cutting-edge electric vehicles powered by South Australia's world-leading renewable energy sector. So many losses for a failure of vision and a failure of an equity fund like this to underpin the transition to the vehicles and the manufacturing industry we need of the future. Senator Hume spoke about um, this bill, calling it a Greens Labor backroom deal. Well, if a backroom deal means discussion, negotiation, thought, looking at the evidence and working out a way to find a way forward, then I'm proud to be part of it because it's, a, it's an arrangement uh, that will result in an act, act which, which will put billions of dollars into backing our manufacturing uh, program of the future. She also referred to slush funds. She referred to unions having any say over how such funds might be used. What a mistake. Unions so often know through their members and their delegates what's actually going on in the ground, what's happening at Port Pirie, what's happening at Wyala, how our steel industry or our shipbuilding or our future manufacturing needs to be adjusted. Don't think those workers on the floor of GMH in the years before Joe Hockey took a hatchet to them didn't know what was going on and what might be done to save that manufacturing in industry and have a contribution to make. The opposition has a lot of experience with slush funds. As I understand this bill, it is very far from a slush fund. It will have, if it is properly implemented, and I'm sure there will be amendments considered in this place which ensure a strong governance structure and transparency of decision making, which is what Australian taxpayers expect. In place of that positive spend um, that, we need, um, that we needed, Liberal governments in that period of GMH decline gave South Australia a consolation prize in the form of a defence manufacturing industry which across a range of shipbuilding projects created a fraction of the, low, of the local direct jobs for a spend that had, was in the billions. We got a trade for, of our uh, automotive industry for a set of jobs in defence. So the opportunities to supply a really good, strong manufacturing base into our South Australian economy was missed. And we missed the opportunity for supplying electric vehicles into a domestic market and fighting climate change. That all took a back seat to an ideological project led by Joe Hockey and others and that government and other governments to build weapons of war that endanger the peace and stability of our region rather than finding our way to a renewable, safe, low polluting future. It is not sustainable economically or environmentally for this nation to continue to be reliant on the resources sector. Australia should aspire to be more than extracting and exporting fossil fuels that poison our air and water and drive the climate crisis. Surely the skilled hands and minds of our manufacturing workforce have more to offer the world than weapons of war, and our rich biodiversity in particular is worth more as a pristine world 
heritage wilderness than it is as a wood pulp or cheap furniture uh, manufacturer. We cannot build our future by investing in an old economy. We need to innovate and find new and creative ways of doing this. Uh, one of the weaknesses in the bill, in my view, is that it doesn't make enough of our arts and our culture sector, which is a powerful industry for generating employment. That sector employs more Australians than coal and gas or defence manufacturing. It doesn't rate a mention in the fund's priorities, despite the industry being decimated by the pandemic. If we aren't investing in the creative arts, Australia risks losing the design workforce, which is essential to giving the function and form to modern consumer products. We cannot add value by manufacturing what we can't sell, and in a competitive national and international market, aesthetics are the key to the success of goods and services, the lines of a car, the cut of a dress, the feel of a device, the layout of an app. Without serious investment in arts and education and all of our technical areas, and in the important national cultural institutions that help nurture and create talent uh, and keep it where it is in Australia, we're letting ourselves down. So we need to rebuild our manufacturing and agricultural workforce through skill development, through support for investment in industries that create good paying, long-term jobs. Workers should feel secure to put down roots in our communities and to live in thriving communities, not boom and bust communities not polluting industries with short horizons. Our young people should be able to find their way into uh, decent jobs and into the training for them in renewable, low emissions technologies and employment, in agriculture and in our regional Australia. So many aspects of this bill are very, very welcome. And it's essential also that we see benefits from it arising for women alongside men. The women need access to training, to participation in research and innovation, and to the jobs in cities and regions that investments through this fund will create. They need access alongside men to good quality, decent paying jobs and to long-term career paths. Because of our Greens amendments, this fund will not use public money to fund coal and gas. This is a really important aspect of this bill. The coalition when they were in government, tried to use public money to fund coal and gas through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ARENA. They couldn't because we Greens and Labor made it impossible. Now the National Reconstruction Fund will be similarly protected. It will focus on genuinely fostering our agriculture, our manufacturing, our innovation and our research. And I hope it makes appropriate investments in our universities, in our young people and in developing the capability of research that is original and new and transmitted into real action in our manufacturing and agricultural sectors. This is so much more important and useful than padding out the profits of coal and gas, uh, which will increase carbon pollution. We need an industri ind industrial future with decent jobs um, and offering our planet a safe place. This is the shift we have to make, and we're more, we're more than a quarry as a country. We've got a very enterprising, well-educated workforce which need the opportunity through investment and support from government so that our regions, our clean and green industries of the future, offer our kids and our Marlin, uh, men, men and women the jobs that they can build a life on. And we need to go further. We have to stop approving new coal and gas. The 116 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline must not go ahead. The IPCC made clear last week that the planet cannot tolerate any new coal and gas. That's where we need to go. And we need to invest in our industries, outside coal and gas, outside logging and native forests, in our future industries of the future, which give our country the sovereignty in its manufacturing and agricultural supply chains that secure the products we need for our future. So no new coal and gas and a lot more secure, well-paying jobs underpinned by strong government support and mechanisms like those proposed in this bill. Thank you. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. Deputy President, uh, I rise today to speak on the National Reconstruction Fund bill. Uh, it's an interesting name that's been given by the government for this bill. I, when I first saw the title, I thought it was uh, aimed at a bill that was aimed to establish a fund to maybe help communities that are recovering from natural disasters or 
you know, in a state of uh, low economic uh, impact uh, or activity. Uh, but this bill really probably should have been named the the, uh, the union slush fund bill or something like that. It would be more appropriately named because it's uh, it's it's quite a misnomer. And uh, you know, this those on the other side they've sort of coined this this new phrase that the liberal national coalition, like it's some sort of you know zinger. You know, we're all sort of sitting back and you know recoil back into our positions over here because you know they all they got us on these sort of you know little zinger claims well you know we we oppose policy when it's done when it's a dud deal we we oppose policy if it's actually going to be bad for the economy if it's going to be bad for the australian people or or indeed we'll oppose policy if it's clearly not going to meet its objectives if 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 it's not going to actually address the issue that they say that it will address. We'll, we'll, we'll oppose that because that money could be maybe better directed or better spent elsewhere. And that's the case when it comes to, to this bill. We're, we're, we're opposing this bill because we don't, we don't believe it's good policy. We don't believe it's going to actually set up Australia for a better future. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a big issue. You know, Australians rely, for example, on, on having cheap and reliable energy. But because of Labor's deal with the Greens on this bill, this bill prohibits coal or gas from receiving finance from the National Reconstruction Fund. We, we think that's, that's a real mistake because the best way to, uh, for Australia to be competitive, particularly on an international stage, is to utilise the, the advantages that we have as a nation. And one of the best advantages that we have as a nation is, is access to cheap and reliable energy. Other countries don't have that. And we can capitalise on that, take advantage of that and have a real impact. And th this bill, due to the dodgy deal that they've done with the Australian Greens, is, uh, it, it takes away the ability for this fund to be able to fund uh, important projects that will actually build into the future of this nation. Now, to quote the Australian Aluminium Council, uh, the single biggest factor, they say, in determining the location of future refining, smithing and manufacturing locations is reliable, internationally competitive, low emissions energy. Now, surely everyone understands here, I, mean, I don't think you have to be an expert in energy or an expert in the generation of energy to know that wind and solar are not reliable. Now, they might be a good source of energy while the wind's blowing and while the sun is shining. Uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, developments in technology for when the sun is shining and when the wind is blowing is improving, and the, those products that are harnessing that energy uh, are improving, uh, and they're becoming more efficient in their uh, in how to manufacture them and get them ready. But they're uh, they're not reliable because the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. Now, everyone surely can understand can understand that, but. Uh, it does seem to be some a lack of uh, understanding that the best way for us to transition as technology into those forms of energy, there might be you know, better storage of that energy to be able to be used at, at times when the sun's not sh shining, the wind's not blowing, you know, through batteries or through other means of storage, uh, you know, hydrogen technology, for example, and the production of hydrogen. I mean, no one's actually built a big electrolyzer anywhere in the world yet to produce hydrogen. Uh, but it, will, it might happen. It might happen, and over time, you know, the development of those technologies uh, can can certainly make a big difference. But uh, what seems to be uh, uh, missing here uh, from the Labor Party, and most certainly from the Australian Greens, is that gas is uh, is the transitional fuel which will maybe get us to that point if in, if indeed it does uh, result. Now, Labor can't continue to demonise reliable energy sources as gas if they're going to be serious about addressing uh, the issues of, of having a carbon-free future. We must consider gas as a transitional, transitional option. Now, I say that as a very proud Western Australian because we have enormous uh, potential. Uh, we have enormous reserves of, of uh, gas energy uh, in Western Australia, and, and we've become uh, the world leaders, in fact, in, 
in the exploration, in the production and in the delivery of, of gas. Uh, you, you know, I invite my colleagues here in this place to uh, go up to the northwest shelf, go up to the Pilbara and, and just have a look at the the, the, uh, the, the, products, uh, the, the projects that are operating up there, you'll see some real ingenuity, particularly when it comes to carbon uh, sequestration. The work that's been done in, uh, in CCS is, is quite phenomenal. And I think you know, we, we would be uh, inspired by, by that. And I'd encourage people to do that. But unfortunately, what we're seeing by this bill, or with this bill, is a, is a recalling away from that industry when we need it more than ever. We need it for the future of, uh, of, of the economy and we also need it uh, if we're going to have a serious ambition to cut emissions. I mean, gas is the transitional fuel that enables us to get there. Now, the, the Labor Party, because they're so reliant on the Greens, be it here in this chamber, indeed on election day, relying on their preferences to get up over the line uh, in, in, in individual electorates, they every time have to succumb to the demands of the Greens, and we're seeing that on the uh, on the safeguard mechanism bill, which we'll be debating later uh, later this week, no doubt. Uh, they they have to give in because that's the only way that they will be able to uh, be able to pursue their their agenda. Uh, but deep inside, in every single one, there is this uh, there is this demonising of of. Uh, of, in particular, uh, traditional forms of energy, and you know, gas is uh, the transitional fuel that will really make a difference. Now, so this bill uh, it also uh, ignores the key economic issues, uh, such as rising energy prices, labour shortages, and supply chain disruptions. But we all know, when it comes to energy prices, labour can't can't keep their promise. Uh, this bill will cause manufacturers to lose time. In this broken model, it will take significant time for money to start flowing. The National Reconstruction Fund has a very, very poor funding model. Uh, this bill shifts from a competitive grants program to government acquiring equity and providing loans. Uh, this bill is fiscally irresponsible in our view, delivering funding uh, well in excess of the coalition's modern manufacturing strategy. This bill undermines investment. Uh, undermines investment certainty in national priorities, with the government changing Australia's national manufacturing priorities on a political whim, undermining investment decisions and eroding uh, investment confidence. Now, we're seeing, unfortunately, recurring examples of uh, this government's arrogant, this arrogant response to telling industry, frankly, what to think uh, and, and how they should conduct business. The, the Prime Minister is. is uh, very adept and, and more than willing to tell Australians how to suck eggs and indeed telling industry how to suck eggs. Uh, remember, uh, we saw this behaviour with the Union Job Summit that they had uh, right at the beginning of this term of, of Parliament. Uh, we saw with the Union Job Summit that they had more union officials than Western Australians. I think there was only six or seven Western Australians there. Seven Western Australians were invited to the this great talk fest that was held here in the Great Hall. Uh, seven Western Australians, there's probably more Johns or, or Bruce's at that conference than there were uh, Western Australians, but uh, it, it's, it's a shame. But there were certainly a lot more union officials, significantly more union officials than there were, than there were Western Australians. I remember standing on polling booths during the election and you know, obviously the government won. Uh, the Labor Party won the election, but they stood there in Western Australia uh, right throughout the campaign. They had signs up all over the place saying, uh, put WA first, vote Labor. Well, this bill and other examples like it are not putting Western Australians first. As a Western Australian senator, that's what I'm here to defend, and they're not doing that. Uh, they didn't do it, certainly, when they had their union talk fest, their union job summit. Uh, they, they just had uh, far more unions than they had Western Australians. They're not taking into consideration the, the, the very important industries that exist in WA and what will drive investment, what will drive the future prosperity of this nation. 
Now, the Treasurer's first budget last year was a, a missed opportunity to support industry and business to tackle the rising costs uh, and workforce shortages and supply chain issues. Rather, they decided to stoop to their union paymasters and run radical industrial relations agenda that, that is having a devastating impact on business. And the Albanese government has failed to rule out radical union demands as they rush through this national reconstruction fund. And, uh, and I'll tell you, they are demanding. The unions are demanding. That, to quote the Australian Manufacturers Workers' Union submission to the department, they, they've said that the composition of the NRF fund must include uh, two ACTU-nominated positions, two employer-nominated positions and positions from representatives from academia and pro-union elements of civil society. So that's who's going to be running this bill, this slush fund, once it's set up. It's going to be labour-aligned, union-interested uh, you know, individuals, be they unions themselves or, by their own words, pro-union elements of civil society. And Mr Albanese is rushing through this bill, just like they rushed through the industrial relations bill late last year, sidestepping parliamentary scrutiny and avoiding appropriate consultation with industry. The, the Australian taxpayer are going to be the ones that will end up uh, wearing the bill, uh, the, the, the bill for the recklessness of this bill, let me tell you. That's because the National Reconstruction Fund delivers on what the Labor Party and the unions want. Let me say that again. This bill delivers on, this fund delivers on what the Labor Party and what the unions want and not what a struggling Australian manufacturers need. Uh, the bill hasn't passed yet, but probably will sometime today, but unions are already licking their lips at the prospect of the National Reconstruction Fund and have listed their demands. And they can't wait. They can't wait for this bill to pass. To quote the uh, Business Council of Australia, they said, to successfully diversify and transform Australia's economy, we need to get macroeconomics right. If we fail to do this, Australia will continue to fall behind our competitors. Well, this government doesn't understand economics. Uh, Senator Paul Scar often likes to pull out that uh, um, Economics 101 book and, uh, and quote from it, a very good source, something that this lot on that side should maybe take a read from. And Senator Scar is very, uh, very willing to hand it over, I'm sure, at any time that, that anyone from the economic front bench want to want to take a look at it. Uh, it it's clear, it's clear uh, that, uh, that this lot over here don't have a grasp of basic economics. Uh, they don't have an understanding of basic economics and they're not getting the settings right with this bill. The out-of-control inflationary pressures currently being experienced by Australians' families speak to that. And this bill is actually going to add further fuel to those inflationary pressures that exist. This government does not uh, build up industry confidence. Rather, they leave industry in the lurch, concerned that the current government will just change their direction on a whim. And that is a real concern. That is a real concern. So I, uh, I get that deals are done in this place, and, uh, and the Australian Greens have done their deal, and, and, and possibly, uh, you know, the crossbench have, have sorted themselves out on this. But I urge them to reconsider it because this is uh, this is a big issue, and uh, getting the settings of our economy right is critical. It's critical to driving down. Uh, putting downward pressure on cost of living, and that's that's the big issue that Australians are facing right now. That is the biggest issue. I don't know if the Labor government realise that. They, they probably don't talk to enough people other than those in their little union circles. But let me tell you, you talk to anyone out on the ground. Come with me to Western Australia, and I'll I'll, I'll introduce you to some people that are feeling it that are feeling it right now, that are feeling the cost of living pressure, that are under pressure because you're not doing anything. Not, they're not doing Order. anything, anything Deputy President, to Minister. actually address the issues that people are facing. And this bill is only putting further inflationary pressure that's going to drive up even more costs for people's living. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023. And I'm really pleased that, thanks to Greens' amendments, this fund can now facilitate decarbonisation 
and an actual focus on rebuilding manufacturing and a renewables industry, rather than propping up fossil fuels. So the National Reconstruction Fund will set aside $15 billion to rebuild an industrial base in Australia. And the NRF, as it's known, uh, will have seven priority areas. Pleasingly, renewables and low emissions technologies will receive uh, $3 billion set aside in particular, but the other priority areas include medical science, transport, value add in the agriculture, forestry and fishery sectors, value add in resources, defence capability and enabling capabilities. Uh, I'm very pleased that the Greens have secured amendments that ensure that coal and gas and native forest logging are prohibited investments for this fund. This is the same amendment put in place by the Greens for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Australian Renewable Energy Agency, or ARENA. And this prevented the CEFC and ARENA from being used as a slush fund for coal and gas by the previous government. Now, the amendment that we have secured to the National Reconstruction Fund um, makes sure that the fund will be focused on the task of rebuilding a manufacturing base, not just propping up coal and gas corporations who, frankly, are already overly subsidised and don't even pay their fair share of tax, all the while cooking the planet, um, and that the fund won't prop up native forest logging either. But we uh, managed to secure a further amendment to make sure that investments made by the National Reconstruction Fund board must align with Australia's legislated climate targets and any future updated commitment by Australia under the Paris Agreement. Now, we're very pleased to receive those amendments and uh, secure those changes. And in fact, we're pleased also because the National Reconstruction Fund looks remarkably similar to an election policy that the Greens took to the last federal election, where we um, elected a record number of Greens. We took a policy to create a $15 billion Made in Australia Bank and Manufacturing Fund. And because of the amendments that we've managed to secure to the National Reconstruction Fund, today that fund reflects much of what we had uh, hoped and aspired for in that Greens Made in Australia Bank. Now, the, po the point of that was to decarbonise our existing manufacturing base and to make stuff again. Let's make stuff again in this country. We've got brilliant scientists, we've got skilled engineers, we've got a world-class workforce. If we back them and invest in our manufacturing industry, we can tackle the climate crisis, we can strengthen local communities and we can create well-paid, secure jobs. There's no downside to that. I'm, rem I'm reminded that Australia uh, Technology and Australian uh, NAUS invented solar panel tech, invented Wi-Fi and the bionic eye. We used to make our own cars, and we could, in fact, do that again. We took a plan to that last election that, as I said, now looks remarkably like the National Reconstruction Fund. And under our plan, um, we wanted a Manufacturing Australia Fund to help local manufacturers recover from the pandemic, move off coal and gas, and expand into new sectors. We wanted to use government investment to drive new export industries in green hydrogen and minerals processing and ensure that Australia could become a renewable energy superpower. We wanted to facilitate that rapid, rapid transition to 100 per cent renewables, which of course would create jobs, um, encourage new industries and innovation uh, in the course of achieving that. And if we use low-cost green energy to rebuild our manufacturing industry, we can support those new green export industries and bring back jobs that have gone overseas. So uh, manufacturing still has a place in Australia, and I'm so pleased that this $15 billion fund, which, as I said, remarkably resembles what we took to the last election, can now support manufacturing, innovation, industrial decarbonisation and a relocalisation of supply chains. Um, when we campaigned on this, we uh, referenced the fact that clean, cheap, abundant energy from our vast solar and wind resources could be Australia's competitive advantage in net zero global trade, but only if we seize it. And we know that we've gotten further and further behind as the world decarbonises and moves towards 100 per cent renewables. But with such an abundance of sun and wind energy, we could drive energy costs close to zero, which would see the return of manufacturing to our shores. Australia's manufacturing renaissance could occur in those areas where we know we've got an advantage in a zero carbon economy, from manufacturing electrolysers, heat pumps, battery technologies, 
but it could also extend to things like medical equipment and pharmaceuticals, food and packaging projects. There's also great opportunities in supply chains for electric vehicle components, for wind towers, for public transport infrastructure made with emissions-free steel. The manufacturing bank that we had envisaged, which this uh, fund now closely resembles, would support manufacturing, innovation, industrial decarbonisation and a relocalisation of supply chains. In our minds, it would have had a similar structure to the existing Clean Energy Finance Corporation um, and provide direct grants, equity investment, financing and concessional loan options, uh, depending on the structure of the corporate um, applicants. And it would target small business, workers' co-ops, green not-for-profits and social enterprise that are engaged in innovative production, research and development. Well, we need this more than ever because Australia currently ranks 91st for economic complexity because we've traded our previously self-sufficient manufacturing base for an entirely fossil fuel reliant economy of extraction. We are deeply reliant on globally integrated open market economy and therefore shocks abroad reverberate through the Australian economy and we saw that and felt that so viscerally during uh, COVID. The mining boom has not translated into a sophisticated economy capable of handling those shocks. Rather, uh, we've failed to build up an industry base or the infrastructure necessary to handle a bust in the resources sector. Previously, um, the, the former governments accelerated the death of the car industry in Australia, and this really added a devastating blow to our manufacturing base. But we have the capacity to rebuild a strong industrial base with a focus on renewable energy. So coming to the National Reconstruction Corporation bill, it would invest in rebuilding Australian industry and manufacturing, and that's a public policy outcome that the Australian Greens have long pushed for uh, and very much welcome. We strongly support public investment in rebuilding manufacturing in Australia. And broadly stated, the aims of the fund are supported by the Greens, in particular a reinvigorated role for state-led investment in designated priority areas of the economy. Um, and during the uh, inquiry into this bill, we heard some very um, persuasive evidence from a number of experts, including the Tech Council, who said, given the long-term and strategic nature of these investments, governments are often best, the best-placed actors in an economy to address this gap by being patient funders of strategic investments and crowding in further private investment. So whilst the aims of the National Reconstruction Fund were always consistent with Greens policy, we were very concerned regarding the potential for fossil fuel finance under the original bill um, as it was proposed prior to the discussions that uh, my colleague Senator Alderman Payne and our leader Adam Bant were able to successfully have uh, with the minister. The legislation as originally proposed was wide open to abuse by governments that wanted to use the $15 billion for more coal, oil and gas, and that's a risk that the Greens simply would not take. We needed legislative restrictions to stop public money being used to prop up oil and gas. As I mentioned before, there's already $11 billion in subsidies in uh, cheap diesel and accelerated depreciation that get given every year to the big fossil fuel companies. That is too much. They certainly didn't need any more. We know that coal and gas are the main causes of the climate crisis, and to have any chance of getting the climate crisis under control and meeting even the net zero climate targets that this government claims to support are too weak and too late, but even to meet those, there can be no new coal or gas projects. This is also the view of the usually conservative International Energy Agency it's the view of the United Nations Secretary-General, Antonio Guterres, and it's the view of the world's scientists. But concerningly, there was nothing in the proposed legislation to prevent investment in coal and gas or in the projects that would lock in uh, and extend the use of coal and gas. Anything that the government of the day chose to support could have been declared priority areas for investment in the future. Under the original proposed legislation, the minister would have issued the investment mandate as a non-disallowable legislative instrument and then declare the priority areas of the Australian economy in the form of a disallowable legislative instrument. Now, 
The minister provided a good deal of detail on the proposed priority areas, and we uh, again thank the minister for his collegiate approach. But the detail provided was effectively going to be a moot point where there were so few limitations on what the government of the day could choose to direct NRF funding towards. Now, when we asked in Senate estimates, um, the, uh, the, the, government original, uh, the government confirmed that they could have used the $15 billion as a slush fund for coal and gas, although I don't believe they used the term slush fund, but certainly that was, that was our concern. The Department of Industry, Science and Resources confirmed that the government of the day could have invested in coal and gas by simply changing the priority investment areas and subject to revised priority areas not being disallowed uh, by the Senate. There was a real risk with this legislation that this government, or indeed subsequent governments, would have had almost unlimited discretion to declare priority areas for a gas-fired recovery or a coal mine renaissance, flying, of course, in the face of global trends and climate science and community sentiment. Um, and this, this, in fact, was a view that was shared by some of Labor's own members who made a submission the to the department's consultation. In a submission to the Department of Industry, Science and Resources uh, consultation on the National Reconstruction Fund, uh, the Labor Environment Action Network Australia, or LEAN, stated, LEAN strongly recommends that the NRF not invest in any technology which will su support further fossil fuel development, including discredited carbon capture and storage processes, or clean gas or coal, um, in, uh, in quote marks, technologies. All NRF investments should support, should support the delivery of policy to deliver net zero by 2050, an end to extinctions and delivery of the um, Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework obligations. All proposals should be tested for alignment with the government's existing commitments and policy priorities. And those were the words of the uh, Labor Environment Action Network. They were not alone. Many other submitters highlighted the fact that coal and gas should not play a part in the future of modern manu manufacturing in Australia, um, including uh, learned uh, experts uh, such as Ms Lee, who was the CEO of Beyond Zero Emissions. Um, and she says, and I quote, when we, looked up, when we looked at shoring up and giving confidence to the manufacturing sector and businesses in it, nobody is looking for any fossil fuel input streams for that. What we hear are people are looking at the time frame for when they can turn off existing coal and gas use in their facilities. And this is because for the facilities that we're looking at, everyone is dependent not just on Australia's financiers, but also on global finance. So the, medium, uh, so the medium to large end of town businesses, all of that investment money is looking for ways to decarbonise. So what we're seeing, uh, so what we're seeing that in so many commercial, financial and other businesses, there's a whole lot of pressure on those businesses from all sides, from shareholders as well, for those that are public, and all that pressure is on transitioning to renewables. The question is how fast? There is a need to make sure that energy is reliable today, but there is no increasing demand that we see for future-proof manufacturing to have any fossil fuel. So it was against that background that we were insistent, um, and successfully so, in our request that this fund be precluded from investing in coal and gas or in native forest logging. So our amendments create a class of prohibited investments within the legislation that explicitly bans the National Reconstruction Fund from financing the extraction of coal and gas, the construction of gas pipelines and the logging of native forests. And as I mentioned before, we also secured amendments, uh, an amendment that investments made by the board will have to align with the legislative climate targets and any future updated commitment by Australia under our nationally determined commitments under the Paris Agreement. So we now have an opportunity to actually invest in regional Australia to build stuff again, to make our economy more uh, resilient and self-reliant and to genuinely give regional communities uh, a sense of opportunity as we transition off coal and gas and towards 100 per cent renewables, let's ensure that we've got a strong manufacturing base for those communities to aspire to work on and to help build the things that a new clean green economy uh, will need and will be based on. The Greens are really pleased to have secured amendments that ensure this fund can't just be a slush fund for coal or gas or for native forest logging, um, and we're very pleased that it might kickstart 
local manufacturing again. Yeah. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to make some remarks to the National Reconstruction Bill of 2022. And uh, I'll talk briefly of the overview of the bill and some of the areas that the coalition has concerns about. We'll also touch on the issue of rhetoric versus reality, because I'm hearing a lot of rhetoric from those opposite about what has occurred over the last 10 years. And it is just simply not matched by the reality on the ground. So I want to touch on a few of those points and put a few facts onto the public record here around what has actually been occurring. I'd like to talk specifically about space which was an area of focus for the Coalition's Modern Manufacturing Fund. And in our home state of South Australia, uh, we have seen a huge amount of investment and growth, and it's something that is missing from this uh, bill from the government. I'd like to talk about the opportunity. There's been a lot of talk here about Australia becoming uh, resilient and reliant, but it will need a change to the way governments of either persuasion and particularly the Department of Finance deal with the Commonwealth procurement rules and breaking the negative cycle which has existed for many years around how the Commonwealth views start-ups and small companies when it comes to contracting uh, as opposed to defaulting to the safe option of a big company often offshore. And lastly I'm going to touch on the point of energy. Uh, those opposite have been talking a fair bit about energy and what they see as opportunities. But again, the rhetoric, the ideology, the narrative which is being put forward is directly contradicting the science out of the IPCC, the economics out of the OECD and the engineering out of the uh, International Energy Agency on the impact of an over-reliance of variable renewables into an economy as opposed to having baseload power and also the role of abatement on fossil fuel projects. Uh, so there's a fair bit there and I'll see what I can get through in the remaining uh, 12 minutes that I have. So a few concerns. Colleagues have spoken around the economic issues and the fact that this fund doesn't address some of those key enablers and I will come to power shortly talks about delays, and we've seen not only delays built into how this legislation is put forward, but one of the things that was deeply distressing to industry in South Australia was that companies who'd been indicated, had indications from the coalition that they had been granted funds under the Modern Manufacturing Fund, those were delayed, causing huge interruptions to their capital productivity, the money they had put aside to co-invest in new capability, new workforce, which was then put on hold which was actually a significant handbrake on the development of manufacturing in South Australia. Uh, national priorities, uh, there's concern here around national priorities and I will come to the report of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade which looked at the lessons of COVID and why it is so important for the Commonwealth to set and invest in uh, national priorities collaborative, collaborating with industry uh, so that we can get national resilience in that area. Um, the funding side of it, uh, the Coalition put some $5 billion into the Modern Manufacturing Fund, but it was against quite specific areas which were targeted as national priorities, including things like space as well as uh, medical products, food products, defence, uh, a range of sectors that were important for our economy. And so a competitive-based program in those important sectors versus $15 billion, $10 billion of which is not actually targeted against anything and will not be subject to further parliamentary scrutiny. That is an enormous amount of taxpayers' money to not have a structured strategic plan for its investment, nor the oversight of the parliament as the Australian taxpayer's representative to make sure that it is spent wisely. Can I come to this topic of rhetoric and reality? One of the things that has been said frequently from those opposite is that Australia's manufacturing went into a nosedive as a result of the coalition government and particularly the demise of Holdens. Can I encourage people who are interested in this, go back and have a look at a speech I gave in August 2015 on this exact topic because it goes to my experience 
as the member for Wakefield, a seat which no longer exists, unfortunately, but that was the electorate in the northern suburbs of Adelaide, as well as regional areas, where General Motors Holdens had the manufacturing plant. And I was a frequent visitor to the manufacturing plant, dealing with Mike Devereux as the, the head of the organisation at that time, as well as dealing with Ian McFarlane as the Minister for Industry and the then Prime Minister, Prime Minister Howard, about opportunities for us to invest. There were countless times when I spoke to General Motors about things like co-investment by the federal government to bring research and development on things like electric vehicles and other opportunities here to Australia. But the consistent message was that General Motors was a global organisation. They had made investments in other countries, both in research and in manufacturing, and the ultimate demise of that industry, as Mr Devereux later said in public, was unrelated to decisions by the federal government around funding they would or would not make. Now, those opposite can say their, their point as often as they like, but it's like someone saying the earth is flat. You can say it a thousand times. It doesn't make it true. And so when the Australian public listens to this debate, I would encourage them to challenge the rhetoric by looking for the facts. And just because those opposites say a hundred times or a thousand times that it was then the Treasurer Joe Hockey who caused the demise, that is not matched by the reality that I know as the then local member in that last period of the Howard government and the statements made by Mr Devereux uh, subsequently around why General Motors made that comment. Importantly, though, it's good to look at what actually happened, not just to the 80 per cent of workers who went on to find other jobs in the manufacturing industry, but what happened to the parts suppliers. So Nissan Leaf, for example, an electric car, there was a firm here called Nissan Castings that went from one shift a day struggling to provide parts into General Motors, who, after that change of focus, were running three shifts seven days a week to keep up with export demands for parts. People like Heliostat were a sub subsidiary of Precision Engineering uh, who started manufacturing solar components. Uh, and again, a significant investment in an export capability uh, into the solar industry. We have seen a whole range of investments uh, in manufacturing through the coalition's time that has led to a range of important things. In 2022, the National Centre for Vocational Education Research found that the proportion of Australian businesses with apprentices and trainees was at its highest level since 2011. And what that is saying is that the government's investment, not only in training but also in creating the environment where the private sector wanted to invest, was leading to people coming on board. Just some of the grants in South Australia. Uh, in October of 2014, the Industry Innovation magazine was, made the comment that Australia's manufacturing was in decline. Now, 2014, that's at the end of a long period of those opposite being in government, but they were talking about companies that were actually moving ahead. And one of those, just to highlight, is a company in South Australia called Red Arc. Now, Red Arc are an innovative company and with Commonwealth support and a range, so the uh, AMGC grants, for example, in February of 2021, uh, led to an expansion of the workplace there, adopting things like Industry 4 technology. And the point Red Arc make is that advanced technology doesn't necessarily mean less jobs, it means better jobs. A $20 million expansion uh, by Red Arc, creating over 100 jobs there. And Red Arc not only are one of Australia's best known suppliers into the automotive industry, but they also export now into the defence industry, uh, particularly with lighting and other components into naval programs uh, overseas. Tindo Solar, again in South Australia, uh, one of the only, in fact, I think the only company here in Australia that actually makes solar panels. Uh, a $5.3 million investment assisted by $1 million from the Australian government uh, to expand their facility to actually become a significant manufacturer of solar panels for the Australian market, uh, creating jobs, creating sovereign capability. Those are the things that were happening under the coalition government. Into the space sector, uh, 
the Centre for Defence Industry Capability, for example, investing in small companies like Innovor. Uh, now, I've had a fair bit to do with Innovor. Uh, they're a company in South Australia making satellite buses, uh, and they are an example of the kind of company where we need to continue the investment, not just in grants, but in contracts to give them the opportunity to grow. And so the federal government, under the coalition, invested some $65 million into the nation's space industry. Not only did we actually create the space agency, uh, but we invested in the industry because of the opportunity to not only have sovereign capability, but also to get into the $12 billion worth of international market. So the space agency also uh, received funding around Australia's launch capability, some $32.5 million dollars to help the local sector gain what they call flight qualifications. But what we see under this plan, that focus on space has gone. And space industry is ver vocal in media at the moment, highlighting the concern that the lack of focus, the lack of investment will hurt the sector and its growth, uh, which has been stellar, no pun intended, under the coalition, uh, but which is now in risk of stalling. One of the significant things that is disappointing is that the planned strategic update for the space sector, which was launched by the coalition in an attempt to bring together the streams of both civil investment and defence investment, has gone nowhere under this Labor government. And given the strategic update of 2020, which highlights the threats that Australia is facing, this is a classic example of where sensible procurement policy from the Commonwealth could actually help Australia have sovereign capabilities. So we're not talking just about making a widget for a satellite that's going to be made overseas, but the kind of investment we see in South Australia where we now have a, a space manufacturing park uh, funded partly by the coalition government, partly by the then Liberal government in South Australia, partly by industry, uh, is looking to manufacture satellites. We have the launch capability, funded in part by the coalition government, uh, to have three spaceports in Australia capable of launch. And what it means is the kind of outcomes that governments should be looking for is actually very specific, in this case, military response options. How do we work with Australian industry? Not to make a widget, but to have the capability to build a payload for ISR, uh, intelligence surveillance, uh, reconnaissance, the bus, the satellite bus, the actual vehicle they put it in, the launch platform, so that in a conflict, if the assets that we rely on, often from Europe or particularly the US, are either taken out of service by an adversary or deployed to areas of greater priority, we have the ability within a short time frame to design an appropriate payload, put it in an appropriate uh, bus into a launch platform and launch into an orbit that will meet our sovereign needs. Companies who can achieve that for Australia will be well placed to actually get products into the global market. And that's the change of thinking we need. The last part, I'm going to run out of time to talk about energy, but the last part on this procurement is that for many companies, particularly in the defence and national security space, but even for things like personal protective equipment, they do need the government to move beyond giving them a grant to actually purchasing things from those companies. And PPE is a classic example that we looked at during the COVID-19 report that my then committee, the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade, conducted. And what we found was that the focus of both the private sector and governments of both persuasions to go competitively to the international market for things like uh, respirators and surgical masks meant that in 2015, Kimberley Clark closed down the last remaining spun bond factory here in Australia, which is a critical component. Now, through COVID, massive investment to rebuild the capability to make things like respirators. But what we find is that government departments continue largely to buy through panels or other policies that push them to overseas suppliers. There has been some change in some states, some change in the Defence Department here. But what we need to see is federal governments not just looking at these large industry policies from a grant perspective, but then following through with contracts, because it's the contracts that will actually enable these businesses to become sustainable, to invest more in workforce and innovation 
so that we can have sovereign capabilities, whether it be in space, whether it be in medical products or other areas. And on another occasion, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, sorry, Mr. Deputy President, I will come back to talk about energy because that is a critical thing for this nation's future. Senator Cox. Thank you, Deputy Senator President. Cork. I rise to speak to the National Re Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023. And firstly, I want to echo the comments of my colleagues, Senator Ormond Payne, uh, Barbara Pocock, and Senator Waters, and acknowledge the huge win that Senator Ormond Payne and our leader, Adam Bant, have managed to negotiate with the government. Due to the hard work of my colleagues, the National Reconstruction Fund now and under future governments will not fund fossil fuels and native logging projects. It was confirmed in the most recent round of Senate estimates that there was nothing currently stopping the proposed corporation investing in these destructive industries. We have seen in the past the coalition try to use public money to fund coal and gas through the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, and they were unable to do so because of the guardrails that the Greens and Labor put in place. Now we have the same assurance of that for the NRF, which won't be used to fund the climate crisis. The amendments that the Greens have secured will ensure that the National Reconstruction Fund will be focused on creating high quality jobs across a diverse economy, particularly in regional Australia, which my fellow uh, West Australian senator earlier, Senator Brockman, spoke of the importance of for our home state. These amendments that have passed in the other place create a class of prohibited investments within the legislation that are explicitly banning the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation from financing the extraction of coal and gas, the construction of gas pipelines and the logging of native forests, which is absolutely critical in the climate crisis, because we simply can't keep pouring petrol on the fire while we're trying to put it out. The Greens have also secured government amendments a government amendment so that the investments made by the board will also have to align with the legislated climate targets and any future updated commitment by Australia under the Paris Agreement. I cannot understate how important this is as the Greens continue to fight for stronger climate action and for the government to listen to the climate science. This is a huge win for our climate, jobs and the economy, and it's aligning us with the global movement and not propping up some of those dying industries. The Greens took a policy for manufacturing, uh, a manufacturing fund to the election, and in fact I was in regional Western Australia in Kalgoorlie talking about the importance of investment in manufacturing, and we strongly support public investment in rebuilding manufacturing in Australia. Every sp cent spent on coal and gas would wreck the climate and divert much needed funding from manufacturing initiatives, especially in regional Australia. This win is extremely timely as the IPCC report was released last week. This will in fact be the first report until the 2030s, and many are seeing this as a final warning as we are on track to fly past the 1.5 degrees and beyond under this current regime. This report clearly states that we cannot open any more new coal and gas projects and that we must rapidly move away from this approach. That means that there is a sprint required, not a casual walk, that we've been taking away from fossil fuels, and we have to do that in order to, in order to work, move towards a decarbonised economy. Now, that means that the 75 per cent reduction in emissions by 2030 is required, which is not on track for meeting uh, meeting this for the key reason that this government's emissions target is not even close to what we need. It also means that we must stop giving public money, yes, that's right, taxpayer money, to fossil fuel companies to fund these dirty projects. And I'm so pleased to see that this fund will not be doing that. But there still is, in fact, a long way to go before we see not a single cent being given to these greedy companies, who quite frankly don't need or in fact deserve this money. So in the 21-22 financial year, the Australian government handed out $11.6 billion in fossil fuel company, uh, subsidies. Let me repeat that, $11.6 billion just in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, and that's almost 
the size of the National Reconstruction Fund that we're debating today. So let's just cast our minds and imagine what could be done with that money. It could be added to the NRF to almost double it. It could support our health sector, our education sector, and to help with flood recovery. We are in a cost of living crisis and a government that is willing to give billions of dollars and place them straight into the pockets of these companies that are seeing record-breaking profits is absolutely unacceptable. This $15 billion fund will help support our economy, create jobs, drive regional development and grow our sovereign capability. But what we must ensure is that it's sustainable and that these investments will help us face the climate crisis, not actually make it worse. This fund, if we use it well, could go a long way to helping us transition away from fossil fuels and into that decarbonised economy. What could also go, go a long way in helping the uh, transition is also the commitment to a national transition authority, something that Senator Ormond Payne has also done some amazing and incredible work on. So I congratulate you. As the Green spokesperson for resources, I'm pleased to see that this will not be used as a slush fund for greedy fossil fuel companies, but will help us extract the resources we will need as we transition away from fossil fuels. The minerals we need to make our solar panels, our wind turbines and batteries. And I'm also pleased to see that the NRF will be used to invest in renewables. However, again, it is so important we we ensure that this is done sustainably and also not just in consultation with traditional owners but actually obtaining their free, prior and informed consent. And also having First Nations people own some of those projects that are happening on their country. This goes beyond simply signing an Indigenous land use agreement and paying them some royalties. This will ensure that the traditional owners are deeply involved in every and all aspects of projects that are happening on their land and that they will have a say about the types of projects, the locations, who will operate and maintain them and be involved in restoring their country. There is so much possibility for First Nations people to be the owners and beneficiaries of what is happening on their land. And I would like to point out that the benefits aren't only in terms of money and jobs. These projects could foster connection to country and culture and having people work on the land, know, know which areas are sacred and therefore should be left alone. Areas that need to be preserved and protected from development and what areas will be suitable for solar panels, wind turbines, offshore wind and whatever else is required since we have been the custodians of this country for 65,000 years. In terms of mining of critical minerals, we must ensure that the mining rehabilitation is at the forefront of these projects. And in fact, it must be included as part of the approvals process. And that companies behind these projects are actually committed to the pro process before they begin. Far too many of these companies will take government money to operate mining projects again without free prior and informed consent from traditional owners. They will make enormous profits which they give to their executives and shareholders and at the end of the life cycle of the mine cry poor and claim that they cannot afford to rehabilitate the mine. So either the infrastructure is left on site, pits are not closed and potentially harmful chemicals are not cleaned up or as we've seen with the Northern Endeavour case the government, but really it's pseudo for the taxpayer, has to step in and foot the bill. Again, think of all the possibilities that we could do with this money that is tied up in bailing out mining companies. We cannot keep making the same mistake. It is unacceptable that mining companies are allowed to get away with this in this country. We know that many companies will put away bonds, but as we've seen with the Ranger mine, Bonds that are put away to cover rehabilitation costs were estimated at the start of the mine. In this case, some 40 years ago. Now, don't, they don't even come close to covering the cost because the standards have changed since then and since the mine opened. 
there have been many unforeseen circumstances that are not accounted to. Or four. We have a lot of work to do in this space, and I acknowledge that we need these minerals for the transition to the net zero economy, but we must carefully consider the need for these minerals and the risks to the water, environment and also to the destruction of cultural heritage. This will not be an easy balance, and I know um, we must consider all of those factors, but we cannot keep contaminating water sources, destroying sacred sites and driving native and endangered species out of their natural habitats. On another note, this fund will be critical in the research and development of new technologies and methods, which has the science, as the science portfolio holder, I'm glad to see this investment in research and development. And we need to see this through from, from the research and development stage to production, and preferably here on Australian soil. Another exciting potential for this fund that has not been widely discussed is the growing native botanicals and bush foods. This has been so many benefits in relation to uh, food security, caring for countries, supporting First Nations businesses, creating and sustaining a First Nations-led bush foods market, both domestically <coughs> and internationally, but also investment in this sector that can also <coughs> support connection to country and culture. And this is particularly important in northern and regional Australia. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of plants that grow only in Australia and that have been used in a variety of ways in First Nations communities for thousands of years for food and also for medicines. Recently, I've noticed an increase in company using these ingredients that are not, in fact, First Nations businesses. And due to this, these ingredients are not always used in a culturally appropriate way. To give you an example, the mudja tree, which is the commonly known Christmas tree that grows in Western Australia, this tree contains the spirit of our old people, the spirit of our ancestors. And I have seen companies place this into alcohol, in particular gin, which is not appropriate for its use. If we made sure that First Nations people are not only growing these botanicals and bush foods, but are also owning the businesses that are processing and developing the pro products using them, this could be avoided with good legislation and regulatory frameworks. I really hope the government sees this as potential. The large number of benefits that may bring, encourage and support First Nations businesses to access this fund to grow native botanicals and bush foods on our country. This fund represents so much opportunity for First Nations communities for addressing the climate crisis, for science and technology, and for jobs right across this country. I would also like to move a second reading amendment on sheet 1896, circulated by my colleague, Senator Wish Wilson, on his behalf. This amendment highlights the need for the NRF to invest in a circular and decarbonised economy, and that as, as such investments can bolster Australia's capability and reduce supply chain vulnerabilities. And the amendment reads, uh, for the Senate is that of that opinion that build a circular economy is central, a central element of the delivering of net zero emissions. Uh, a circular economy can bolster Australia's capabilities and reduce supply chain vulnerabilities. And the benefits of the circular economy could add two, uh, 210 billion in GDP by 2047-48, creating an additional 17,000 full-time equivalent jobs calls on the government to invest in projects to facilitate and establish a circular economy for renewable energy and other pro products, incorporate circular economy principles into the investment mandate for the NRF and seek that the NRF board give regard to the outcomes and advice from the Circular Economy Task Force. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cox, before you take your seat, you've sought leave to move an amendment to a second reading amendment, is that correct? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Is leave granted? Leave's granted. I, I amend the amendment. Yeah, well, I'm doing what they said. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thank you, Acting Deputy uh, President. Um, I rise to speak to the National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023. 
And I, before commencing, I want to acknowledge the contributions of my Senate colleagues, uh, Senator Cox and Senator Ullman Payne. And in fact, I particularly want to give credit to the work of um, our Queensland Regional Senator, uh, which has been critical to ensuring amendments that will see this $15 billion fund deliver long-term security, long-term jobs and clean, renewable investment uh, across not just her state of Queensland but across this entire country. It's an example of Green senators, Greens MPs, understanding their brief, talking to their community and then delivering real measurable change in this place. And we saw those amendments adopted downstairs, and they will make a nationally significant contribution to this bill. The National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill um, is designed, from the Greens' perspective anyhow, to move us towards a decarbonised uh, manufacturing industry, with an actual focus on rebuilding manufacturing and, and rebuilding a renewables industry, literally stepping into the gap that has been created by the dead years of the coalition government federally, and before that, a lack of strategic investment in green renewable manufacturing by the previous Labor government. But, um, but I think we should acknowledge just how much ground there is to cover. The last near decade of the coalition's dead hand on manufacturing, its dead hand on any kind of investment in a renewables industry, its, its, its direct messages to that industry that the then coalition government didn't want those jobs, didn't want that investment, didn't want that future to Australia. We have to lift that dead hand off. Now, the Australian public went a long way to doing that in the last election when they put in a minority Labor government and a big increase in Greens representations in this place and downstairs. And we're hopefully seeing through that, that, that commitment from the Australian voting public, millions of Australians, not only throwing out the coalition, uh, but also voting in a parliament that's going to be looking to rebuild Australia and rebuild Australia with those green jobs and that renewable investment. Um, and critically, having this parliament in, in what sometimes looks like a petro-state, where both major parties are literally owned by the fossil fuel industry, somehow turning this parliament around and it getting that investment in jobs that are not only going to be there for our kids but are actually going to sustain our kids and our grandkids' future. So what will the National Reconstruction Fund deliver? This is, Deputy President, a $15 billion fund to help rebuild an industrial base in Australia. And the National Reconstruction Fund will have seven priority areas. The first, and it's one that I've been passionate about throughout my political life, is renewables and low emissions technologies. And again, this is about lifting the, 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 the rotting corpse of the previous coalition government out of the industry, out of manufacturing, so as actually we have that future. Um, and, and seeing significant investment in renewables and low emissions technologies, and we're talking about a $3 billion investment in renewables and low emissions technologies, which will hopefully be leveraged with other investment from industry, that will make a significant difference. The second priority area is in medical science. And if, if you wanted a lesson in how important it is to have uh, domestic capacity in medical science, well, we've just been through a three-year lesson on that with COVID, haven't we? And the need to have onshore manufacturing, the need to have onshore facilities, the need to have the R&D in Australia um, has been proven to us. And what I'm hoping we see with this is the parliament is listening. Well, at least the parliament that's sitting in the majority on this and supporting this bill, which includes the Greens. Of course, again, the coalition are trying to tear it down take us back to the 1950s. But thankfully, a majority in this House are listening to those millions of Australians who want a different future and are putting aside $1.5 billion for medical manufacturing. The third is transport. Um, uh, I, I've got to tell you how frustrating it is to see government after government in the past 
not actually investing in low emission transport, but investing in reports and studies. If I see another study on a fast train um, uh, from Sydney to Canberra, or another study on a fast train from Sydney to Newcastle, and I don't see another fast train, I think like five million other people from the Greater Sydney region, we're just going to just, um, I don't know, have a have a, a singular revolt. Um, we don't want another study. We don't want another brochure. We don't want another you know, episode of utopia, which is what we really got from the coalition. Um, we actually want investment in clean, green transport. And um, I would love to be catching a low or zero emission fast train home from here at the end of every session. And I can tell you, so would every other Green senator and MP in this place. And let's start making it happen with this kind of strategic investment in transport. The fourth area is value add in the agriculture, forestry and fishery sec sectors. Low emission, um, securing regional jobs, securing regional investments. And I can tell you from a New South Wales senator perspective, when you go into the western slopes and ranges in the southern half of our state, or you go around Oberon and the region around Oberon in my home state of New South Wales, and you see the jobs and the industry and the regional wealth that follows from investment in the plantation industry, rather than the destruction that happens in native logging, it gives you a sense of hope about how strategic government investment can fundamentally change lives in regional New South Wales. And what we're hoping on the, on the part of the Greens is this will provide that value add investment in, in industries like plantations um, that will make a real and meaningful change for generations to come in regional New South Wales. Um, and I'll speak briefly about the amendments negotiated by my, my colleague, Senator Norman Payne, that are going to prohibit investment in native forest logging later. But that's a critical part of ensuring this investment goes where it needs. Not in native forest logging, but in plantations and value adds, genuine long-term value adds in agricultural, forestry and fishery sector. It's also going to invest in value adding resources. And again, that cannot be and must not be fossil fuels. And thankfully, critical key Greens amendments will make that happen. Um, investments in defence capability. Um, uh, well, that, that is a matter that we're going to have a watching brief on. The obscene amount of money that this government seems to want to spend on defence is something that should trouble anybody interested in their, in their kids' future. But if we are going to have an expenditure on defence, and there will be some, um, ensuring as much of that is spent locally rather than in part, as part of a global arms industry is actually going to be an important way of keeping Australia safe without fuelling a global arms industry. And lastly, in enabling capabilities. And we're talking about, out of that $15 billion fund, $500 million for that value adding in agriculture, a $1 billion for the advanced technology, and a $1 billion on critical technologies. This, I hope, will be nation-shaping investment. Um, I, I do want to, though, highlight and give credit to the amendment that was moved in the other place on, the part, on behalf of the Greens, but negotiated by my Senate colleague, um, securing an amendment that ensures coal and gas and native forest logging are prohibited investments from this fund. That was a make or break for us, for this investment fund. And we told the government that straight up in negotiations, that we will not see billions of dollars more of public money going into coal and gas or native forest logging. That was an absolute red line in the negotiations. And thankfully, we've been able to deliver on that in the amendment in the other place. And that, let's remember, is the same amendment that was put in by the Greens for the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ARENA. And that prevented the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and ARENA being used as a slush fund for the coal and gas industries, as the coalition so wanted to do. Like, you know, the coalition has never seen a bucket of public money that they don't want to tip in to the corporate coffers of the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I've got to say, it has taken the Greens using their balance of power in this place to prevent Labor doing exactly the same with this bill. Um, to prevent Labor doing exactly the same with this bill. Um, I'd, I'd like to call it renewable power sharing, Senator Scar, is what we're saying. We're saying renewable power sharing um, in, this, in this and delivering 
delivering the hope and lifting that dead hand of the coalition of investment in renewables, investment in a green, clean future for regional, for regional Australia. And of course, that amendment also ensures that the NRF will be focused on the task of rebuilding a manufacturing base. Because we don't have endless amounts of public money. And every dollar that we tip into the corporate coffers of the fossil fuel industry, the gas industry, every dollar we spend destroying our native forests, which I know is where the coalition likes sending public money, but every dollar we send down there is a dollar we can't spend on actually building our manufacturing base. And I know that there are you know, minor right-wing parties that want to see endless amounts of taxpayers' money paid for by hard-working Australians go into fossil fuel corporations. They just love doing that. Greens don't. And we won't let it happen on our watch. And those Greens amendments means it won't happen on our watch. The Greens have also secured an amendment that ensure that investments made by the National Reconstruction Fund Board must align with the legislated climate targets and, of course, any future updated commitment by Australia under the Paris Agreement. This will track in line as, I hope, our national targets become more ambitious, our climate targets become more ambitious and start getting close to meeting the science. This will mean that investments by the National Reconstruction Fund Board need to also align with those improvements going forward. Why do we need this investment in manufacturing? Well, if you look at some of the data and you look at Australia's economy and you compare it to other economies around the world, we have an economy that is excessively reliant on the resources industry with, 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 with a lack of complexity that makes our economic future extremely fragile as those changes happen as they will happen in the fossil fuel industry and in other parts of the mining sector. Because Australia ranks 91st in the country for economic complexity. And that's because we have literally, through years of neo... Uh, of, of, sorry, Paul. Thank you. Uh, I, I, just, I, I choked on the word liberal, that's all, in the Australian context, Paul. Um, uh, through years of neoliberal economic policy agenda of tearing down every protection for local manufacturing, handing it over to the, uh, to the brutality and the, and the lack of love of the global market, we have literally destroyed our self-sufficient manufacturing base to become an almost entirely fossil fuel reliant economy based on extraction. And it's those industries of extraction that keep coming here and trying to derail national policy. And, and that's why we need this key investment, to step back some of those aggressive attacks on Australian manufacturing that have been designed really to destroy manufacturing at the expense of a few extractive industries. That's why we need this investment through the National Reconstruction Fund. Um, and, and what we saw from the coalition was literally the squandering of the mining boom. And we saw that partly from Labor too. The, 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 the massive increase in offshore gas, the massive increase in revenues being generated by multinationals. Both the Coalition and Labor have joined together to prevent there being a fair share of tax revenue being put into things like a National Reconstruction Fund to build our future. Tax concessions for big gas, tax concessions for big coal. That's been a joint ticket from the Coalition and Labor over the last um, over the last decade and a half, and hopefully we are going to see some of that being turned around, because that has meant that the mining boom has literally been squandered. It hasn't translated into that sophisticated economy capable of handling the shocks that our economy will face in the future. And that's why we have to have this spending to rebuild our industrial base. I do also want to commend the second reading amendment moved by my colleague, uh, Peter Wish Senator Wish Wilson, Talking about a circular economy, building that into our planning is a critical way forward. Um, and, um, and with those comments, I commend the amendment to build the House. Senator Hanson-Young. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
Uh, I speak uh, in support of this legislation today. The Greens have been able to negotiate with the government to improve this package to ensure that the money that comes from the reconstruction fund is actually spent on high quality future proofing high quality jobs that are going to future proof our nation and uh, of course that key amendment is to ensure that none of this money is squandered away by the fossil fuel industry who for far too long uh, have taken dollar after dollar after dollar tens of millions, in fact billions, of taxpayers' money uh, in order to simply carry on polluting and ruining our climate. It's time they stood on their own two feet and they don't need any support going forward from uh, any type of government fund. I'd say that this should be uh, the first break on handouts to the fossil fuel industry. The first break in what should be a long list of cuts to handouts to corporate welfare to the coal and gas industries in this country. Now, we've heard the Resources Minister herself, Madeleine King, saying that if fossil fuel industries can't stand in their own two feet, uh, well, um, you know, uh, it's, it's up to them. Well, come on then, Minister. Scrap all the fossil fuel subsidies in this year's budget. Scrap all the fossil fuel subsidies that continue to be a drain on the public purse that, in fact, should be going into projects and programs that help everyday Australians, not line the pockets of what are uh, these corporations who are continuing to pollute our environment, but of course, most of them, of course, being shipping all of their profits offshore as foreign entities. This amendment that the Greens were able to secure to ban this fund going uh, to any fossil fuel projects is fundamental, and it is a shot across the bow to an industry that needs to evolve move, and move on. When you hear of those statistics. When you hear the science from uh, the world's scientists and through the IPCC report released last week, we are running out of time, not just as a nation but as a globe, to tackle dangerous global warming. And for every step we take to reduce pollution, you've got the fossil fuel mafia doing what they can to make the job even harder. In the dying throes of the fossil fuel industry, they want to double down, get, while they, get it while they can, make the profits while they can. And yet, time after time after time, they have their hand out for, the, for public subsidies and support of the public purse. So this amendment is fundamental, is fundamental to how this parliament and the current government must start dealing with the fossil fuel mafia in this country. No more corporate blackmail from an industry that is pushing our climate to the brink, that is sucking our public purse dry and continues to mislead the Australian community with their bogus greenwashing claims. I'd like to commend uh, the, amount of, the huge amount of effort that my colleagues uh, in this place have put into getting this bill to a point where we can support it. Senator Almond Payne from, uh, the, um, uh, from the great state of uh, Queensland um, has put in an awful lot of effort in relation to this piece of legislation. Um, someone who understands that if you want a thriving community, you must invest in the jobs of the future. Someone who understands what real transition means for a community like Gladstone. Someone who is willing to pull, roll up her sleeves and put in the effort to ensure that when we pass pieces of legislation in this place, it actually has a real impact on people's lives. So I'd like to thank 
her for her efforts in this. This legislation, of course, is being debated on the day that the Greens have just announced that we will pass the government's safeguard legislation. It too, when first drafted, did far too much to help the fossil fuel industry than it should have. And thanks to the abilities of the Greens to negotiate and drive a hard bargain, we will now see pollution under the safeguard mechanism go down and not up. I mean, it is ludicrous that the government thought that they could put a piece of climate legislation in 2023 into this parliament that would have allowed pollution to grow. The rank greenwashing that comes from suggesting as long as you can offset everything, you can keep pushing pollution sky high. Well, the Greens' hard cap on pollution will mean actual pollution goes down and not up. And that is a significant win for the climate and a good move from the Greens in this place to deliver an outcome that is much better for our environment. And I'm sure as the days roll out this week, we will hear the squealing from the mouthpieces of the fossil fuel industry in this place about how hard done over they are. Well, I hear, let me say this. For every squeal of the fossil fuel industry this week over these negotiated amendments, there is a smile from Mother Nature. For every time you hear the mouthpieces of the coal industry over these coming days as we debate this legislation, just remember that future generations know and will be thanking us for pushing pollution down because we are on the brink of climate collapse and tinkering around the edges is not enough. And what we've been presented from in this government is a pretty, has been a pretty weak attempt at dealing with the issue. Their climate target is too weak. Their impost on the fossil fuel industry is too weak. But we have managed to improve and strengthen that legislation. So for the first time, we now have a cap on real pollution, that pollution will go down and not up. And that is exactly what the scientists are telling us we need to be doing and we need to be doing quickly. We also know that we have to clean up the bogus offsets in this country. It's not good enough to have a set and forget scheme where some people are raking in the millions of dollars because no one's really looked at the legitimacy of their offset project. So one of the key recommendations, one of the key negotiations that the Greens have managed to get out of this package is that those integrity, the integrity of those carbon offsets will be frozen looked at, considered, reviewed. Those offsets that are found to be dodgy will need to be scrapped. It beggars belief that it even had to be a negotiation, frankly. If we are determined to set the train back on track to have a livable climate, we desperately have to be acting now. But of course we know who pulls the strings in this country in terms of the politics of both major parties in this place, and it is the coal and the gas industry. They continue to roll out the donations, they continue to have the slick PR machines, they greenwash their way through the halls of parliament and they put their hand out every chance they can get for a public, for a public subsidy and a cash handout from the public purse. Well, it's time that that came to an end. 
And both in this reconstruction fund and through the safeguard mechanism negotiations, the Greens have blown a hole in the fossil fuel industry in this country. And we are very proud of that. I can't wait to hear the squeals from the fossil fuel mafia. The type of manufacturing jobs that we need to be investing in and using this fund to invest in should be the high quality jobs of the future. And I say this as a proud South Australian. And when our car industry collapsed in South Australia, workers were promised new manufacturing and they're still waiting. Funds like this should be used to invest in an electric car industry in Adelaide. It should be used to invest in the renewable energy industry right across the country, creating the real clean jobs of the future. We know that during COVID, one of the biggest problems we had was accessing supplies because we had <laughs> seen a decade of undermining and unhelpful policy from the government, which meant we had a sovereign risk. We couldn't uh, even make— Senator, you will be in continuation. It's now time for two-minute statements, and I call Senator Canavan. Just heard it there that uh, this dodgy deal by the Labor and the Greens announced today to introduce a new carbon tax is a massive new stop sign uh, in front of every coal, gas and melt mining project in the country. Because the deal announced for today, the deal announced today says no more emissions, a cap on emissions. All new projects have to do that. So even iron ore mines, they've got to use a lot of diesel. They're gone. New iron ore mines won't be possible to be put in place here because they'll have to offset. It won't be net zero by 2050. It's net zero today. This is absolutely insane. Now, it won't be net zero overseas. It'll just be net zero here because in, in Mr Bant's own statement, he said the Beetaloo gas field will be required from day one to offset all of its emissions, scope one, scope two and scope three for domestic use. So that means you can export the gas and the coal to China and you don't have to worry about it. But if you happen to have the temerity to want to use our energy resources here, you'll be taxed and penalised. This is a pro-China deal from the Labor and the Greens, not a pro-Australian one. It is a pro-China one. And it gets worse. All new offshore gas projects my, for my friends in Western Australia, all new offshore gas projects that will be feeding LNG terminals will be required to be net zero CO2 from day one. Again, Vladimir Putin's Russia, they won't need to be net zero from day one, but the gas projects here in our own country that create Australian jobs will have to be. And closer to home for myself in central Queensland, there is a coal mine being built right now. There are 500 people working on that coal mine. It's not in operation yet. It's called the Olive Downs Mine. It's producing coking coal, which we need to produce wind turbines uh, and steel. And, and 500 people there, they don't know tonight whether they'll have a job. Thanks to this deal being announced in Canberra, they haven't been spoken to. No one's spoken to them, but they're a new coal mine. And will they need to offset their emissions from day one? And if they do, if they do, those 500 jobs will be lost and the 1,000 jobs that would have come from the operation of the mine will never start. This is a policy that's been announced today that is dead set against the interests of this country. We should be making this country go, not stopping the, 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 the jobs being created in Thank Australia. Thank you, Senator. Senator Stewart. Deputy President. The Federation of Ethnic Communities Council of Australia, also known as FECA, is the national peak body representing Australians from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Last week, I met with Mohammed al Kavaji, the Federation's CEO. In Victoria, FECA's members include the Ethnic Co Community Council of Victoria, the Ethnic Council of Shepparton and District, Sunraysia Mali Ethnic Communities Council, Incorporated. FECA's role is to advocate on issues that affect ethnic communities and promote the ongoing success story of multicultural Australia. FECA strives to ensure that the needs and aspirations of Australians from diverse cultural and linguistic backgrounds are given proper recognition in public policy, something that is very close to my heart. Mohammed spoke to me about the incredible work FECA does in supporting the wonderful diversity of Australian communities. We spoke about the importance of uniting communities through a voice to parliament, something they are passionately advocating for. We also spoke about, spoke about many 
different issues multicultural communities experience, particularly in health. We shared stories about the various challenges of operating in a Western system and how this disproportionately impacts people from multicultural communities and particularly in spaces as, such as health and wellbeing. Experiences of discrimination uh, that aren't too unfamiliar for me and people from my community as a First Nations woman. It is absolutely critical that Parliament, the People's House, truly reflects the country, the people who elected us, because it is the people who have elected us to represent them. We must make sure we use our platform to amplify the issues our multicultural communities uh, care about in this place and emphasise how important it is that these communities are reflected in the public domain. We cannot underestimate how powerful it is to see yourself reflected in this way, in this place. Not as an after afterthought, you, but Senator, front and centre. Senator Hanson Young. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to reflect on um, the latest figures that show more than half of Australians, in fact two thirds, want to see urgent action taken to curb gambling advertising on our televisions, our radios, uh, radio stations and online. Gambling is a and gambling addiction is a scourge. Here in Australia, about $25 billion is lost in legal gambling each year. That's the highest in the world. $25 billion. And it is extraordinary, not to mention then the ramifications on people's welfare, well-being and mental health. I'm extremely concerned that we have a Minister for Communications who is in charge of the advertising rules who has taken donations from the gambling industry and has sat down having dinner with Sportsbet, taken the $9,000 and yet here we $19,000 in donations and yet here we have a crying out from the community for her to actually wind this influence and scourge from this industry back. This is a moral issue. Madam Acting Deputy President, it is simply wrong. It is simply wrong that gambling companies are able to target our Australian children, target them through online advertising, and target them through running betting ads during sports matches. It is morally wrong. And I don't care how many dinners the minister has or how many dollars in donations she collects. She must accept that her job now Thank is you, to Senator. clean Your this time up. Has expired. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. Wall-to-wall -wall labour on the Australian mainland has sent a shiver down the spines of West Australians. Wall-to-wall -wall labour on the mainland is now wall-to-wall -wall opposition to the GST deal that was secured by this parliament in 2018. It's worth reminding people of some facts. Without the GST deal, Western Australia's GST relativity could have fallen to 0.1. Think about that for a second. 0.1. In Western Australia, we know the GST relativity did fall to 0.3. Just last month, we heard the great news for West Australians of a $6.5 billion GST dividend to Western Australia next year. That is good news and only because of the GST deal that was struck in this parliament. So West Australians are right to ask. Why is it that Jim, Chambers, Jim Chalmers is hi hiding GST documents from the Senate? Why is it that the Prime Minister continues to hide GST documents from the Senate? Is it because there could be something to hide? Yes. Because when the Labor Treasurer was forced to reveal GST documents last week, guess what we saw? We saw an attempt by the Board of Treasurers, led by the ACT Chief Minister, to set in place a plan to unwind the GST deal. 
And I know that Senator Brockman and Senator Sullivan and myself are very, very keen to know what are the GST documents that Prime Minister Albanese has but will not release to this Senate. Yeah, yeah. Why will he not release them? So tomorrow I hope that the Greens, West Australian Green Senators, will support my motion to ask Penny Wong to come into Senator Wong to come into the chamber and explain oh, what is it that Prime you, Minister Senator. Albanese is hiding. Senator Rob Ah, Senator McCarthy. Oh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Over the weekend uh, in Darwin, uh, hundreds of Territorians gathered outside Parliament House uh, following the tragic death of young 19-year-old Declan Laverty while he was at work. They went there, uh, Senators, to support uh, the family of young Declan, but also uh, to call on uh, the Northern Territory Government and others across the community uh, to, to do something. Many Territorians have spoken of their frustration of living with crime, uh, but they also went there, as I said, to stand in solidarity with the family of young Declan. And this comes in the midst of concerning rates of crime, antisocial behaviour and alcohol-related issues, which we have been dealing with quite significantly, uh, in particular since uh, January this year, uh, beginning, of course, with Alice Springs, very conscious of the concerns uh, in Tennant Creek, Catherine, Darwin, and I know that uh, the Northern Territory Government is very aware of that as well, and I'll certainly be in touch with them once I return uh, from the Senate. But I'd also like to um, say to Senators that today in the Australian newspaper we saw an article by journalist Liam Mendes, and he has heard directly from the family of the accused. And there's no doubt uh, there will continue to be a lot of reflection, especially for the family of the accused, a family from, from the Tiwi Islands. Uh, and I know that they are reflecting very deeply on what has occurred and the tragedy uh, that has taken place uh, with the uh, Laverty family. Uh, and I just urge Territorians to remember on another level that there is a legal process that has to be taken now. Uh, in terms of the court process, and whilst that is going on, of course, uh, there must be other issues uh, touched on in terms of the concerns around crime. Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, I propose there should not be a new body called The Voice. The Voice, if a referendum approves, would constitutionally enshrine differential treatment based on skin colour or an identification with a race. I'm completely opposed to introducing such a divisive, discriminatory concept that is racist. At this stage, there's been no detail telling voters how this voice would be exercised and what obligations would need to be met, nor by whom. Locking the voice into the Constitution would perpetuate parasitic white and black activists, consultants, academics, bureaucrats and politicians in the Aboriginal industry. It's known that activists want the voice to have significant influence on creation of laws. It's not known how much consultation would be needed before laws would be made. It's not known how much it will cost to implement a run. It is clear this detail will not be in the referendum question put to voters. Now, I've travelled widely across remote Queensland and listened to many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders from Deeping Creek in the south, across Cape York and to Sabai Island in Torres Strait. Few of the people I spoke with or listened to had even heard of The Voice. Last week I met with a delegation of Aboriginal leaders strongly opposing The Voice because these real Aboriginal leaders say it's racist. They fear that The Voice will divide the community into two distinct groups, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, when they say in reality, we are all Australians. Doesn't proposing The Voice admit that the current 11 Aboriginals in federal parliament and the current National Indigenous Australians Agency are failing to represent Aboriginals. I oppose perpetuating the Aboriginal industry suppressing Australians. Instead of treating people differently because of race and entrenching racism, we need to ensure Aboriginal Australians can access the same opportunities given to all people within our beautiful nation. We are all Australian. We are one nation. Yeah. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, hypocrisy has a name, and it's the Labor-Green Alliance. We've heard it here today. The Greens stand up in this chamber in the same speech attacking quote-unquote corporate welfare and worse, railing against corporate welfare, while at the same time in the same bill signing off on 
fifteen billion dollar slush fund for the La billion dollar slush fund for the Labor government. And that hypocrisy again has shone forth in the deal done behind closed doors on the safeguard mechanism. The, the Orwellianly named I mean, the, the reconstruction fund is Orwellianly named in and of itself. Reconstruction was the recovery after the Civil War. Uh, to call uh, uh, manufacturing in Australia in need of reconstruction is, is highly Orwellian. But this safeguard mechanism, which is now a, a, a sort of Damocles hanging over the heads, particularly of industries, very, very important industries like the uh, gas industry of Western Australia, an industry that's over 40 years old that employs many thousands of Western Australians. And we've seen, and we've seen the hypocrisy shine through in the way that the respective leaders of the Labor Party and the Greens Party have approached uh, the safeguard mechanism. According to the leader of the Greens, half of new gas and coal projects are going to face the axe. Half of them have faced the axe. According to the Prime Minister, oh no, that's not right, none of them, none of them. Well, goodness gracious me, the left hand doesn't know what the other left hand is doing. And I think you'll see as we examine the, the impact of this bill that it's going Thank to you, hurt Senator. Your Australians. Thank you, Senator. Your time has expired. Senator Green. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to stand here today um, in the Senate. Um, as a North Queenslander, not only am I am very lucky and proud to have the Great Barrier Reef on my doorstep and all the jobs that the Great Barrier Reef supports, but I'm very pleased to say that we are also home to some of the best scientists in the country, if not the world. I'd like to put on record a few recent achievements of our homegrown talent and how their efforts day to day, day in, day out, are making a difference to the Great Barrier Reef. Late last week, the 34th Banksia National Sustainability Awards were held. These awards are about recognising leaders, changemakers and innovators who are making a positive impact on the world. The awards are aligned with the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. I am very pleased to advise the Senate that the Reef and Rainforest Research Centre, or the RRC, have taken out the silverware and returned to Cairns not with one but with two awards. They picked up the Biodiversity Award for their science-led approach to combat the highly destructive marine pest that is the Crown of Thorns starfish. It is the innovation of groups like these that have ultimately led to the serious focus and serious investment in the fight against Crown of Thorns. I'm proud to say that the Albanese Labor government is investing $162 million over the next eight years in the COTS control program to suppress outbreaks of the coral-eating predators. The ARRC also have taken out the Agricultural and Regional Development Award. They have been doing some incredibly impressive work in the Mus Russell Mulgrave catchment just south of Cairns for a few years now. They have teamed up with James Cook University's Tropwater and worked in very close partnerships with cane growers in the region to achieve sustainable change in farming practices. In February this year, I am very pleased to say I had the privilege of hitting the road and jumping in the water in far north Queensland to, with these groups to see the work that they are doing for themselves. Congratulations. We are so proud of the work that you Senator, do. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. The definition of ecocide. Severe harm to nature, mass damage and destruction of ecosystems committed repeatedly over decades. Senators, this is what ecocide looks like. Uh, this Wilson. distressing, shocking and bloody infuriating photograph is of an endangered Tasmanian devil burnt to a cinder by a forestry regeneration burn. Over decades, hundreds and thousands of hectares of habitat and precious forests with their wild animals wantonly destroyed by the Tasmanian government and so-called Sustainable Timbers Tasmania. This photograph was taken by a bushwalker after a burn, ironically, on International Day of Forests. If you support native forest logging in this country, you are supporting ecocide. For those people out there who have fought for decades to try and protect the Tasmanian devil so it doesn't go the way of the Tasmanian tiger, you have a right to be bloody angry today at the Tasmanian government and at the federal government and all senators in here that continue to support 
native forest logging in this country. We can end it. These forests, these trees are our first line of defence in our climate emergency, and yet we are still clear felling them and burning them and their habitat and their precious animals every day. When is it going to end? When are we going to wake up to the fact that we are in a species extinction crisis and these poor Tasmanian devils need our help? They don't need to be burnt to a cinder after a helicopter is thrown out napalm onto a forest. It has got to stop. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. Christian schools educate almost a third of Australian school children. But thanks to the Australian Law Reform Commission, Christian schools are under threat. The, L the ALRC wants to force religious schools, colleges and universities to teach secular ideas on sex and gender. The ALRC wants to make religious schools abandon beliefs about human sexuality that have been around for thousands of years. In place of those sacred beliefs, they want to turn Christian schools into a mouthpiece for their own woke fads that weren't even in fashion five years ago. They want to convert Christian schools into hypocrisy factories full of people who say one thing but do another. They have Christian schools in their crosshairs. But make no mistake, their discrimination will hurt Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist and all other religious schools. The ALRC has decided that religion is just some afterthought for religious schools, that the secular has triumphed over the sacred. What a joke. Imagine forcing the Labor Party to hire staff who openly oppose Labor's platform. Imagine forcing the Liberal Party to hire Adam Bant. Imagine forcing the Greens to hire a staunch patriot and a staunch conservative like me. Doesn't work. We would never tolerate this kind of compulsion in political parties, so why force it on our nation's religious school? Let's look at the facts. Religious schools exist to foster communities of faith. Their purpose isn't to educate, but to show isn't just to educate, but to show students how faith speaks to every facet of life, including sexuality. For religious schools, religion is not an afterthought. A Christian school's ethos is not just the sprinkles on top of a secular education. Their beliefs are their heartbeat. It is the very reason these schools exist. Everyone in this place should reject the ALRC's woke bigotry. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Well, as we all know, Australia is currently facing a skill shortage. To address this, we need organisations with the experience and passion to train our apprentices and tradespeople. I wish to congratulate the National Electrical and Communication Association's apprentices, who have just graduated and will now be at the forefront of the electrification of our nation. This class of 66 graduates is the first to complete certi Certificate 3 in Electrotechnology mm. at NECA's Chalora Centre of Excellence. The class of 2022-23 had their studies disrupted by COVID. NECA was able to switch to an online delivery model within three days of lockdown occurring, whereas apprentices studying at some other facilities endured delays of up to six months in their course delivery. NECA's Chalora Centre of Excellence uh, currently has more than 350 students completing electrical apprenticeships, 15 per cent of which are female, compared to at least uh, the national average of just 2 per cent of electricians being women. So what makes NECA stand out is their completion rates as well as the diversity of their apprentices. The completion rate for apprentices at NECA's Chalora Centre of Excellence is more than 90 per cent compared to a national average of 55 per cent. This is assisted by NECA's mentoring and support programs, offering a range of services to ensure that apprentices are well supported throughout the completion of their studies. In addition to de developing and growing workforces of tomorrow, NECA is also crying out for their contractors to get a fair deal from this government. Yeah, yeah. The apprentices of today are the subcontractors of tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. In February this year alone, the number of insolvencies nationally already exceeded the whole of last financial year, and we Your still have months expired, to go. Senator Tyrrell? I have been flooded with messages from early childhood educators. They are understaffed, under-resourced and underpaid, and we give them one of the most important jobs in the world to do. 
They are teaching our children manners, how to read and write, to do basic sums. They work just as hard as teachers. For people like me who depended on childcare to support us as working parents, you need to trust the person who is looking after your child. You trust them with your child's education, safety and wellbeing. You trust them to help raise your children as good human beings. I still see the women who looked after my kids around Alveston today, and I love to stop them and have a chat. Sometimes we talk about what rat bags my kids were, or that time one of them fell through a glass door, and I apologise to that carer. Sorry to Rebecca for all the trauma that day. It was worse for you than me or Liam, I'm pretty sure. Early childhood educators aren't paid enough for the work that they do. You could work at Woolworths or on a spud harvest and be paid better than they are. And no wonder we have a shortage of workers. In my patch of Tasmania, there is a childcare centre that has 140 children on the waiting list. They can't operate at their licensed maximum capacity because of the lack of staff. The flow-on effect of this is huge. Parents end up having to choose between working or caring for their child. Employers miss out on staff because parents need to stay home. And the loss of income contributes to cost of living pressures. It really is a ripple effect. I think the pay for early childhood educators should reflect the work they do, and that's far more than they're getting right now. They give our kids a home away from home, and that shouldn't be undervalued. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The ACD is full of innovative small businesses. Over the past few months, my team and I have visited dozens of small business owners entrepreneurs and passionate advocates for innovation in Canberra. I want to share some of their stories as I believe their names should be known to the legislators in this place. Flint Pro provide carbon estimates for land used at highly var variable temporospatial scales. Wildlife drones, whose drones can track more frequencies simultaneously than anybody else in the market. Geospatial Intelligence, whose patented technology, Mercury, can do things in the geolocation and intelligence space that I didn't know were possible until they showed me. Majura Valley Free Range Eggs, who are proud to boast the oldest occupied house and the oldest operating farm in the ACT. Aurobox, whose world-leading software allows for the seamless sharing of medical imaging between doctors and patients. CDFS, who started out as a small IT house and have since grown to become Australia's leading supplier of digital, digital forensic tools and training. GoTerra, whose insect-based waste management system turns waste into fertiliser. Wing, who chose to base their world-first drone delivery service in Canberra and specifically uh, chose it to work with the regulators here. And Pen10, whose world-class cyber defence and security products were first being used by governments in the UK before they managed to win an Australian government contract, despite being founded here in Canberra. I could go on. I've only got two minutes. I'm proud to represent an electorate with so many smart, forward-thinking people working to make Canberra a world-leading innovation hub. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you. Rural, regional and remote Australia is often the canary in the coal mine when it comes to health. Um, and the challenges that it's currently facing. And right now, this could not be a truer statement. So I was delighted this morning to join the National Rural Health Commissioner, Ruth Stewart, to launch the National Rural Remote Nursing Generalist Framework. The framework has been designed to utilise, be utilised by registered nurses across rural and remote Australia to support and sustain our nursing workforce into the future. And I commend the work of peak nursing bodies in leading this development work. The launch comes at a critical time, because we know the health workforce shortages are a serious issue across our entire health system. Workforce is raised as the single biggest issue currently facing healthcare professionals, but it's out in the country where access to additional workforce is already a challenge and has now become even more acute. To solve for rural, regional and remote Australia will almost definitely solve for the whole country, because we know that solving for a problem in one area alone will only make it worse in another unless we look at the whole picture. We saw this with Labor's changes to the distribution priority areas for overseas trained doctors, which saw GPs redirected into the metropolitan areas in an attempt to solve for workforce shortages in the cities. In doing so, the pressures faced by rural, regional and remote communities have only been made worse. These communities are now struggling to retain their doctors 
uh, or to bring new ones because they can't compete with the bright lights of the city. It's clear that unless we grow the total number of GPs and nurses in Australia, attempts at solutions will only continue to redistribute the problem to other areas like a giant game of Mac whack-a-mole across the Australian map. We know that immigration is the obvious and immediate short-term answer, but unless the distribution of those international healthcare workers is well considered, it will be a disaster. In the long term, we need to make sure that we attract a multifaceted approach so we attract uh, healthcare professionals to our regions. We must stop making a problem worse in Thank one you, area Senator, to solve for another. Expired. Senator Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. When you come from the best state in the country, like I do, uh, you're given many, many opportunities to feel, to feel proud. And Sunday was no exception when the great state of South Australia became the first state in our country to legislate a First Nations voice to our parliament. I stood on North Terrace on Sunday with thousands of other South Australians. There was barely a dry eye on North Terrace yesterday. This is a momentous occasion for our state. South Australia led with the right for women to vote. It's leading now on a voice. This is an opportunity for us to do different, to do better. And we know we need to do better. Despite the good intent over many, many decades, this is our opportunity to consult, to engage, to make a difference and to close the gap. I am so deeply proud to be South Australian, deeply proud of our government, of Attorney General Kyan Ma, of Premier Peter Malinowskis, and indeed every South Australian who has lent their voice in support of the voice, every South Australian who stood in the rain on Sunday backing in the voice. It's a fantastic achievement for our state, and let's get it done at the federal level. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, the time is now for question time, and I'll move first to Senator Rustin. Yeah, yeah. Ah, thank you, <clears throat> President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, last week the Senate agreed, without dissent, to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill, requiring the listing of all medicines approved by the Pharmaceutical Benefit Advisory Committee on the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme. Is the government policy to list all medicines approved by the PBAC on the PBS? Minister Farrell. Um, thank, you, um, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Rustin for, uh, for her uh, question. Um, um, well, um, well, well, of course, um, we have seen uh, what the Liberals do when uh, they are in control of uh, the health, uh, uh, the health budget, uh, and of course, uh, we've seen what uh, Leader Dutton did when uh, he was. Uh, uh, Senator Birmingham, wait to be called. Senator Birmingham. In a point of order on direct relevance, as you point out, interjections are generally indeed always disorderly, but you allow some degree of latitude. But what we outrageously have here is the Leader of the Government in the Senate responding to interjections that are really not interjections, they are prompts from the ministers uh, sitting Senator behind Birmingham. him. The Senator opposition, Birmingham. the coalition was silent Senator as Birmingham. the minister was answering. I'm going to ask you to draw order. into the question. Order. Senator Birmingham. Uh, Order. I'm waiting. As Senator Birmingham, you got two feet. Please do the respect and listen to my response. Um, that is not a point of order, but I am going to remind the minister of the question, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you, President. And uh, of course, it was the uh, Curtin and Chifley governments that took the first. Well, it's worth it's worth putting it in its historical uh, context. Uh, because, I mean, I, I won't repeat what I said earlier about uh, um, uh, Leader Dutton's uh, performance in this area, but it is worth pointing out that the Curtin and Chifley governments uh, took the first steps to make medicines affordable for uh, all Australians post uh, the Second uh, War. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. President, on a point of order in relation to relevance, um, I would ask you if you could reflect on the minister's answer so far to this question, which I believe has gone in mm -hmm. no way uh, to my question that was very specifically targeted to a vote in this chamber or an agreement in this chamber last week 
to say that all medicines that were approved by PBAC would be listed on the PBS. I'd ask you to draw the minister's uh, thank attention you, Senator to the Rustin, question. And, um, I'm sure you noted that I have already directed the minister to your question, and I will direct the minister again. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Thank, uh, <coughs> thank you, uh, uh, President. Um, uh, we're listing medicines, uh, and we're making them cheaper for all Australians. The government is committed to ensuring Australians have access to affordable medicines by listing medicines recommended by the Independent Pharmaceutical Benefits uh, Advisory Committee the PBAC, on the Pharmaceutical Benefits uh, Scheme. The government, the government uh, has uh, delivered on our election promise to cut the cost of medications for millions and millions of Australians by reducing the PBS co-payment to a maximum of uh, 30 uh, per Minister script. Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, Chair or President, on a matter of, of relevance again, I have not asked about the co-payment for medicines. I clearly asked about the listing of PBAC approved medicines on the PBS. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Rustin. You did refer to the farmer Suitable benefits scheme, and I think the minister is being relevant. And I will listen carefully to the remainder of his question, Senator Russell. Uh, the same point of order. They are two different things. Uh, thank you, Senator Russell. Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, uh, President. Um, since the 1st of July 2022, the government has committed additional funding for 67 new and amended PBS listings. Um, a further 83 uh, items uh, were also approved. Thank with you, the Minister. Budget. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, last week the Senate agreed without dissent to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill, which called on the government to urgently intervene to ensure FIASP remains permanently available on the PBS for the 15,000 Australians who rely on it beyond the six month funding cliff. Considering this, when will the government announce to these 15,000 Australians that you have the, uh, that a permanent, ongoing and affordable access to FIASP on the PBS has been agreed to by the government? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, and I think I indicated when I was asked this question last week that, uh, I do, <coughs> being a diabetic myself, I do have uh, some familiarity with uh, the drugs. Uh, that uh, are uh, on the, uh, the, the PBS uh, system. Um, and of course, the drug that you've just mentioned, uh, FIASP, FIASP uh, is a fast acting insulin drug for, uh, for diabetes. Uh, <coughs> Minister Butler's, very important drug, <coughs> Minister Butler's office uh, was made aware on the uh, 22nd of February 2023. Um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Um, Senator Rustin. Oh, on relevance again, um, the question was very specific about the <coughs> agreement of this chamber for the medicine to be permanently listed ongoing. I'm just asking the minister, through you, Chair, if he could please advise when the 15,000 people who rely on this drug are going to be advised of the decision by this government to actually permanently list it. Having Thank a you, lecture, Senator Rustin. Um, I believe the minister is being relevant, and I will uh, listen to the remainder of his answer. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. And uh, I don't know why the opposition keeps asking me questions and then stops me from answering them. But let's see how we go. Minister Butler's office was made aware on the 22nd of February 2023 of no Novo Nordisk's intention to delist uh, the drug from the P PBS on the 1st of April 2023. The government appreciates the distress that a delisting. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Time for answering has expired. Second supplementary, Senator Rustin. Minister, last week the Senate agreed, without dissent, to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill, which called on the government to urgently list Trikafta on the PBS for children aged between 6 and 11 years old with cystic fibrosis, noting that PBAC recommended it be listed in November last year. Considering this, when will the government announce the listing to the 500 children aged between 6 and 11 with cystic fibrosis who will benefit from the affordable access of this life-changing medicine? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank, you, uh, uh, thank you, President, and thank you, uh, Senator Rustin, for her, uh, her question. Um, uh, Trikafata is a drug used to treat uh, cystic uh, fibrosis. Uh, the government will expand the listening of that drug on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme for the treatment of uh, cystic uh, fibrosis 
in patients who are aged between 6 to 11 years as quickly as possible. The Department of Health and Aged Care is working— uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. Um, could I just seek a point of clarification from the minister? Is he saying that it, the government hasn't agreed to do this? Is he actually saying that uh, the that's chamber— That's not a point of order, Senator Rustin. So the, order. the agreement of the chamber order. is somehow Resume being your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. <clears throat> Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you, President. I'll repeat uh, my answer in case uh, Senator Rustin missed it. The government will expand the listing of the listing of the drug on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme for the treatment of cystic fibrosis in patients who are aged between 6 to 11 years as quickly as possible. The Department of Health and Aged Care is working with the company that produces that drug, Vertex Pharmaceuticals, to finalise all necessary listing requirements. Thank you, Minister requir Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Over the weekend, we saw another United Labor government elected in New South Wales. And yes, we are all pleased. It was clear, a clear message that the people of New South Wales want government to focus on the things that matter them rather than focusing on internal party divisions and political point scoring. How will the Albanese government work with the New South Wales government to deliver meaningful outcomes for the people of New South uh, Wales? Senator Sheldon, and indeed please resume your seat. Calling out across the chamber is incredibly disorderly, and not only that, it's disrespectful, because I've got a senator on his feet seeking to ask a legitimate question. Minister Sheldon, please continue. How will the Albanese government work with the New South Wales government to deliver meaningful outcomes for the people of New South Wales and, indeed, all of Australia? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Uh, and can I congratulate, uh, on behalf of uh, the rest of your Senate colleagues, uh, Senator Sheldon, for the terrific work that you put into the wonderful result on the weekend. And over the weekend, over the weekend, the people of New South Wales had their opportunity to have a say, and they spoke with a loud and clear voice as they voted for a fresh start under the terrific leadership of uh, Chris Minns and Labor. The people of New South Wales echoed the messages that we heard last year from the people of South Australia, uh, from the people of Victoria and for the people of Australia when they uh, voted for Labor governments. People voted for Labor governments because Labor governments are focused on tackling the issues that matter to Australian people. People voted for Labor governments who are focused on their needs as opposed to the internal party fights as those opposite continue to do. We welcome, we welcome, we welcome the Minns uh, Labor government. We will be working with the Minns government in the same way we work with all state and territory governments as we address the cost of living challenges people are facing as the result of a decade of Liberal and national neglect. We will support all state and territory governments to deliver support for Australians based on need as opposed to the colour-coded uh, spreadsheets that the former Liberal national government relied on. And we will work with all state and territory governments uh, to make uh, Australians' uh, lives uh, better, because that's exactly what Labor governments do. Thank you, Senator Labor. Farrell. Senator Sheldon, first supplement. Senator Watt, I've called you about four times. Senator Sheldon. Now, it's great to hear how the Albanese government will work with the Minns government to deliver meaningful outcomes for the people of New South Wales and, more broadly, Australia. Can the minister update the Senate on the measures the Albanese government has already taken to make Australia lives much better? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. As uh, Senator, uh, Minister Farrell. Sorry. Thank you, President. Thank uh, Senator Sheldon once again for his uh, very perceptive uh, question about uh, the links between uh, the new Minns government and the Albanese government. And of course, the Albanese Labor government has been delivering meaningful outcomes for Australians over the last 12 months. In just in just 10 months, uh, we've made childcare cheaper. We've made medicines cheaper. We've got an increase in the minimum wage. We've got a pay rise for aged care workers. 
we created 180,000 fee-free play, uh, TAFE uh, places. We've created uh, 20,000 university places. We've expanded the Commonwealth Senior Card. We've extended paid uh, parental leave. Um, we supported regional first home buyers and we've repaired international relations. We've delivered so much that I can't list it all in just the minutes that I have in this answer. But Australians can Minister, rest assured. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Thank you for the very informative response. Unfortunately, many of the Albanese policies, which are designed to tackle the cost of living pressures and make Australians' lives better, become the subject of political games in this place. What messages does the minister have for those who are putting internal party divisions and political point scoring ahead of delivering outcomes for Australians? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank uh, Senator Sheldon for his question. And I've, I've noticed this issue too, uh, Senator Sheldon. And sadly, many Liberal and National Party members and senators spend their time fighting within their own party. They spend their time seeking to score cheap political points. They spend their time looking for the latest social media video instead of looking at how they can help make Australians' lives better, like the uh, uh, Labor Party uh, does. I have a message to those opposite. Op opposite. Cheap political stunts don't help Australians with their cost of living challenges. They don't help put a roof over Australian families' heads and they don't uh, make Australian lives better. It is clear from the results in New South Wales <coughs> this uh, weekend um, Australians' cheap political point scoring. I call on all of those opposite to stop the political games and work with this government to deliver meaningful change that benefits the Australian people. Thank you, Minister. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, look, my question, is to, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. In reference to the Greens' deal with the Albanese Labor government on the safeguard mechanism announced today, Mr Adam Bant, the leader of the Greens Party, has said that the Beetaloo gas field will be required from day one to offset all of its emissions – scope one, scope two and scope three for domestic three. use. Will all co new coal and gas projects require their scope one, scope two and scope three emissions for domestic use to be offset from day one under the Albanese Labor government's deal with the Greens? Thank you, Senator Canavan. I remind you I'm the President. Uh, Minister Farrell. Yes, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thanks, uh, um, uh, Senator Canavan, for his uh, question. And of course, um, after a uh, wasted uh, decade, of course, uh, today is a very good day. Um, uh, we uh, we are legislating uh, for a 43% reduction, um, uh, and. Uh, Today's uh, changes, of course, are how we're going to uh, deliver that. <coughs> uh, the safeguards will be a clear, stable and common sense framework for reducing uh, emissions. Um, <coughs> and the uh, only chance in this parliament uh, to reduce emissions of the biggest 215 uh, emitters in this uh, country. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and we thank uh, businesses right across Australia, um, and the, uh, particularly the Greens today, for their constructive uh, dialogue. If, this, if, the opposition, if the opposition has got some concerns about this particular policy, then you could have... Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. President, again, a point of order on direct relevance. Now, <clears throat> Senator Farrell likes to go through the background part of a brief. These points of order actually give him time to be able to come to the specific question that was asked. So, as he flicks through the pages in front of him, could we please draw him to Senator Canavan's very specific question about whether future projects will have their scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions for domestic use have to be offset? Uh, will they you. or won't they? Thank you, uh, Senator Birmingham. Senator Mackenzie. Senator. Um, Birmingham, I believe um, the minister is being relevant, but I will listen. Um, that question was very detailed. Yes, it had a direct ask at the end, but it was also very detailed. Minister Farrell. Thank you, thank you, thank you, President. And uh, uh, look, the reality, the reality is this, um, and at some point, it must 
going to sort of strike the coalition that um, when you deal yourself out uh, of Minister the— Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Again, President, direct relevance. The question went to a substantive matter of policy, not to whatever the minister wants to say yeah. about the opposition, but a substantive question of policy. Uh, Please you, draw Senator him Birmingham. to the policy. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will certainly draw the minister to the question. Minister. Thank you. Thank you, uh, President. <clears throat> Look, the, re the reality is, at some point, you've got to understand when you deal yourself out of uh, the Minister picture Farrell, by refusing Minister to negotiate. Farrell, please resume your seat, Senator Birmingham. President, you did just draw the minister to the question, and he is flaunting your ruling, ignoring your ruling, showing disregard. I urge you to please be proactive in reminding uh, him of that, or if need be, sitting him down if he continues to ignore uh, you. Senator Birmingham, I have drawn the minister to the question. I am. Senator McGrath, order. Um, Minister, I ask you to direct yourself to the. Um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Conversations across the chamber are disorderly. I've called the minister to the question. I'm going to call the minister to answer the question. Minister. Thank you, President. And I completely reject the suggestion that I don't respect the chair because I do. Now, the safeguards uh, framework, framework will help deliver. The commitment of uh, Scope 1 emissions, uh, given the uh, cross-jurisdictional nature of uh, Scopes 2 and 3 emissions. Uh, the government uh, will refer Scope 2 and 3 emissions to the Energy and Climate Ministerial Council. Thank you, Minister. Senator Canavan, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, in his statement, Mr Adam Bant has said that the deal will stop many of the 116 Australian coal and gas projects that are in the pipeline for construction. Is this correct? Based on government analysis, how many projects will be stopped Senator and how Watt. many Australian jobs will this deal cost? Uh, thank you, Senator Canavan. Um, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Canavan for his um, uh, his uh, first supplementary uh, question. Um, <clears throat> um, you've asked some questions about Mr Bant's um, uh, statements, then I suggest you go and ask him uh, about uh, what it was that he, uh, he intended to say. But as far as, as far as, <clears throat> as far as, uh, well, look, you keep asking me these questions, I start to answer them, and then you, you try and stop me from answering them. Well, Australia's oil and gas sector will continue to play an essential role in guaranteeing the energy security of Australia and our regions. Um, as we uh, know on this side, gas is a key enabler for Australia and our region's net zero transition. And I might, I might remind you, Senator Canavan, you used to have a policy of net zero by 2050. You may not have agreed to it. But that was the policy you took to the Australian people. Thank you, people. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Canavan, second supplementary. Not net zero in 2050. It's net zero today. Um, right now, 500 Australians have jobs helping to construct the Olive Downs mine near Moranbar in central Queensland. The mine will also provide 1,000 1, permanent operations jobs. Will this new mine have to offset all of its emissions from day one? Will any of these jobs be impacted by the Albanese Labor government's deal with the Greens? Thank you, Senator uh, Canavan. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. And again, I um, reiterate: um, once once the coalition decides to deal themselves out of the debate, well, then <clears throat> you can't complain when, in order to in order to implement the policies that we took to the uh, last uh, election, including our policy to get to uh, net uh, uh, net zero by 2050. Which was also your policy. Which was also your policy, um, and of course, if you cared so much about these uh, places, of course, you, you, Senator Canavan, uh, would have pushed Farrell, your party your... and the Minister rest of the. Minister Farrell, Sorry. please resume your seat, Senator Canavan. Thank you. Just on a, on a point of order on, on relevance, um, the question was clearly about the 500 jobs, and those workers, Minister, deserve an answer to know if they have a job tonight. It's not thank a question you. that I'm asking. Uh, I'm asking on behalf of yes, them. I'm aware they of the deserve question. an answer, Minister. Do uh, they still have a Senator job Canavan. after they wake up tomorrow? Senator Canavan, resume your seat. I am going to remind senators that point order. Senator Canavan. 
Senator Canavan and Senator Ayres. I've just had you on your feet. Senator Canavan. Order across the chamber. Senator Watt. Order across the chamber. Senator Canavan. You've just been on your feet with a point of order. As I went to respond, you engaged with other senators in interjections across the chamber. That is disrespectful. I'm also going to remind senators in this place, if you jump on a point of order, make the point of order succinctly. Don't make points of debate at the end of it. Minister Farrell, I'll draw you back to the question. Thank you, uh, President. And, uh, as you know, I'm a well-known um, supporter of uh, coal workers, as uh, was uh, very clear. The government supports scientific, uh, independent and evidence-based decision-making when it comes to the resources exploration and other commercial uh, developments. The coal industry gener generates more than uh, uh, $10 billion uh, annually in royalties and provides Thank you, for Minister. over— Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cox. Thank you. My question is for the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Minister Farrell. The government has updated the Thrive 2030 strategy to invest and increase the visitor economy in Australia. In this document, there is considerable mention of increasing First Nations tourism sector, which is welcomed. However, it is important that we invest in First Nations tourism, that we ensure that our cultural heritage is protected and First Nations people are beneficiaries of this investment, especially considering the recommendations of the Dukin report. My question is, how will Thrive 2030 protect First Nations cultural heritage as the First Nations tourism sector grows? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Thanks, President. And I thank uh, Senator Cox for her question. And I know, particularly based on uh, my uh, <coughs> frequent discussions with her, just how, um, uh, how important this issue is to her and uh, just how important um, getting uh, this part of our tourism sector right uh, is important to the country uh, generally. Um, as you say, uh, in the uh, revised uh, uh, Thrive 2030 project, which was relaunched uh, a couple of weeks ago in Sydney with all of uh, Australia's uh, trade uh, ministers, including, interestingly enough, both the, uh, the uh, um, Liberal trade minister and the incoming uh, Labor uh, trade minister, um, this government is, is all about um, uh, improving um, the lives of uh, Indigenous Australians in particular. And as you know, uh, we, uh, we're promoting uh, the recognition of ind Indigenous Australians for, through a voice to parliament. <coughs> um, in, in a sense, everything else sort of flows um, from that uh, commitment because what it means is, uh, as a government, uh, we see not only the opportunity of improving the lives of Indigenous Australians through uh, greater uh, tourism uh, focused on, uh, in, on the Indigenous uh, experience, uh, but also uh, projecting to, to the world um, the commitment that this government has got uh, to, uh, to, in particular, Indigenous, uh, indigenous uh, issues. Um, in all of the uh, discussions that I have with um, <coughs> companies uh, overseas, we promote um, uh, Indigenous tourism as a unique aspect to the Australian uh, tourism experience. And uh, I'm, I'm extremely hopeful that, based on that, uh, that uh, revised uh, Thrive 2030, that we can build on what we're already doing in this space. Thank you, Minister. But the time for answering has expired. Senator Cox, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister Farrell. How does Thrive 2030 fit with the government's broader trade strategy and, in particular, creating economic, social, environmental and cultural opportunities through capacity building and investment uh, growth, um, particularly in relation to the ratification of the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, which was uh, recommendation two of the Jukun report, which your government committed to? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, President, and again thank uh, Senator Cox for her first supplementary uh, um, question. <coughs> um, the, 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 the focus of the government, of course, in terms of our trade strategy has uh, been one of diversification. We've, we've learnt from 
a bitter experience uh, that putting all of your eggs in one basket, whether it be tourism or trade or education, um, has some real downside risks when uh, that particular um, aspect of uh, the economy that you've devoted your resources to, um, there's a change of uh, economic circumstances uh, there. So um, by promoting Indigenous uh, tourism in this uh, country, by promoting the experience that uh, people overseas can, uh, uh, can get by engaging in that Indigenous uh, experience, we think that, that that's part of our overall diversification. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Cox, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister Farrell. How will this government, in the implementation of Thrive 2030, uphold Australia's obligations under, U under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, such as free prior and informed consent and, again, the ratification and the convention of the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage from 2003? Thank you, Senator Cox. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and thank uh, Senator uh, Cox for her second supplementary question. I don't think you've uh, got a, a government in this country more committed uh, to um, raising and promoting the issues uh, of, uh, of Indigenous uh, tourism uh, in this country. And it's, it's not just because it's the right thing to do. There's actually an economic uh, advantage. Um, in the post-pandemic world, every country is trying to get some aspect of their tourism experience will, which will attract uh, tourists back to their, uh, to their country. Um, this um, offers a real opportunity uh, for Australia to have a unique offering uh, which will achieve all of the... Oh, sorry. Sorry, Senator Cox. Um... Senator Farrell was blocking my line of sight. The question was quite specific about the, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and free and prior informed consent, and I didn't once hear the minister refer to that. Uh, thank you, Senator Cox. Your uh, question also went to the 2030 matter um, and other matters. Minister, please continue. Th thank you, President. Uh, well, um, we are committed to um, all of our international Ob obligations, but more particularly uh, later Minister this year. Minister Farrell, the time for answering has expired. Senator Mario Smith. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister please update the Senate about the impact of unfunded or terminating programs on budget deliberations and how the Albanese government has had to clean up the mess left by the Liberals and Nationals? Great Minister question. Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank uh, Senator Smith. Uh, for her question, and yes, I can update the chamber on just the work we are doing to clean up the mess that's been left behind by the Liberals and Nationals when in government. We all knew that the former coalition government was addicted to spending taxpayers' money like it was Liberal Party money, and we heard uh, Senator Rennick uh, outline that in one of his contributions last week. The October budget also uncovered, if people remember, $4.1 billion of holes that we had to address in terminating measures in funding cliffs and in zombie measures, some which had sat before the parliament till 2016, propping up the budget with a decision taken in 2016 and never moved upon. And we've had more time to go through the books. Order. The May budget would deal with more of the spending traps that the coalition deliberately baked into their bottom line, leaving the budget billions of dollars worse off. More funding cliffs for government programs, like no ongoing funding for my health record, no ongoing funding for public dental, uh, adult dental health, chronic underinvestment in the key cultural institutions that Australians treasure and are crumbling around us, literally crumbling around us, no funding for key commitments made by the former government. Remember the Olympics were 50-50, the Brisbane Olympics but no provision made, no provision for the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, underfunding and erosion of capability in key public service agencies, meaning government can't deliver services like the Department of Agriculture, and drop-offs in funding for the Australian Radioactive Waste Agency. Do you reckon we might need that after December? 
What about the National Emergency Management Agency? And what about the E-Safety Commissioner? Do you reckon they might need ongoing funding to keep their programs going? Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Marielle Smith, first supplementary. Hmm. Um, after coming to government, what has the minister discovered about the economic mismanagement of the coalition that confirms the electorate's distrust in the Liberals and Nationals? Uh, uh, Senator Smith, thank you. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can. We've inherited a trillion dollars in debt and ongoing $50 billion in structural deficits with not enough to show for it. The former government spent money on rorts and waste to bolster their electoral chances with nothing to show for it. Our first budget in October uncovered those unlegislated zombie measures. Bank 6 2016 and not going to progress. Funding cliffs of programs which were ended purely to improve the forward estimates, even though any government would continue them. Failure to provision for necessary funding issues like COVID-19. And of course, let's remember their big save in their budget on robo debt. Remember when you pursued hundreds of thousands of Australians for debts they didn't owe to make sure your budget looked better than it was, and it backfired against those, the lives of those Australians, but also in the settlement you had to pay to get out of it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, President. What measures is the Federal Labor Government undertaking to dig the country out of the fiscal hole that the Coalition created for ordinary Australians? And um, how is the Albanese Labor Government working to protect Australians from pressures related to the cost of living? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I thank Senator Smith for her supplementary. Well, I think the Australian people know that the Albanese Labor government is one that can be trusted, both to be upfront with Australians about the state of their budget. We are cleaning up the mess and doing the job that the Liberals and Nationals refuse to do, funding the necessary services, funding the ongoing programs and addressing the spending shortfalls in key areas in the May budget. Unlike the Liberals and Nationals, our government will have the difficult conversations with the Australian people about the economic Senator challenges Hume. that we face and make the responsible decisions to Minister ensure a better Gallagher, future. Please resume your seat. Senator Hume, I called you twice. I expect you to be silent. Thank you. Minister Gallagher, please continue. Uh, thank you. We're doing this work to ensure we can deliver for the Australian people, making room for targeted cost of living relief services that the Australian community expects. That, that's what Australians expect from their government not a dodgy set of tricks and, and uh, booby traps hidden in the budget to make your bottom line look better all the while the Thank Australian you, people suffer. The time suffered. for answering the question has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Last week, Senator, I asked questions about the funding for the Deposits Guarantee Scheme, which was designed to protect the money in the bank accounts of everyday Australians, capped at $250,000 per account, $20 billion per bank and $80 billion total. Minister, when the scheme was brought in, the eligible deposits being protected were $650 billion. According to Schedule 9 of Budget Paper 1 of the October 2022 Labor budget, your budget, eligible deposits are now $1.2 trillion. Minister, how can $80 billion possibly protect $1.2 trillion in deposits. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. And I think this question goes to some of the concerns that we're seeing in global uh, financial markets uh, at the moment, um, the impact on uh, some banks overseas and some concerns that um, Senator Roberts is raising about the potential for uh, impact here in Australia. And the answer is uh, the same as I gave last week. Uh, Thank you, Senator Rennick. Would you like leave to speak to this question, or am I allowed to? Oh, uh, you'd like to, would you? Minister Gallagher, sorry, your comments to sorry, President. To Order. I know responding. Order. To, I know responding Senator, to. Senator Rennick, resume your seat. Tell us about your master's of applied science. I know Minister. responding to interjections are disorderly, but uh, Senator Rennick. He, Senator Rennick's Order got verbal diarrhoea. It seems this question time. He can't keep it in. Um, and as I said last week, um, this is something the government is monitoring closely. In fact, the Treasurer uh, is being briefed twice a day on um, 
what's happening overseas and also being provided with feedback from regulators uh, and from the banking system here. Uh, and I think it is very good, and I would think that it's something that this Senate would, would um, welcome, is the fact that our financial markets, our system, our banking system, well regulated, well re uh, led, well capitalised, with good liquidity, we are not seeing uh, the issues that are being seen uh, overseas. Um, now, I did undertake, and I'm not sure if we've done this, to provide you with a written response to the question that you raised. Um, last week, uh, and I'll chase that if that hasn't got to you. Um, but also, if there is anything further I can provide in relation to the answer I've just given. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, first supplementary. Thank you. My constituents, as I expressed last week in the last question, was, are concerned. Minister, the protected amount is not indexed and would need to be increased to $380,000 per account and $115 billion overall, just to cover the same amount as the scheme did in 2008 because of inflation. Minister, will you increase the caps on the bank deposit guarantee to make up for inflation since 2008? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Well, in line with the, the answer I gave uh, last week, of course the government would respond in relation to concerns that were raised about the operation of our banking system uh, and the impact it was having here. We are not seeing that. Um, I think Australians should be reassured that the Australian banking system is resilient and all of our banks, as I said, are well capitalised, have strong liquidity coverage. Uh, the, Treasur Thank you. the Treasury and um, uh, regulators are closely monitoring the situation about potential impacts for Australia. And when I say that, very closely monitoring. Now, I can understand that people watching uh, what they've seen uh, with Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse and that would have raised concerns. I can understand that. And the response is that since the GFC, uh, since the Banking Royal Commission, uh, we, there are uh, measures in place to ensure the strong performance of our banking system, and we don't have any concerns Thank about you, it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you. Reviewing the Minister's answers to my five questions on the guarantee so far, Firstly, the guarantee has not been adjusted for inflation and so it offers 34 per cent less protection than when it was legislated. Secondly, the guarantee is not funded. There is no money available to implement it. Thirdly, the scheme only covers seven cents in the dollar of deposits. Fourth, the minister has refused to commit to activating the scheme if it was needed. Minister, can you explain why constituents should not conclude, as many have, that the bank deposits guarantee is a fraud, is a lie? Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't agree with that representation by Senator Roberts uh, at all. Uh, and I have answered the question in a general sense by saying that if there were concerns, uh, as we saw in the GFC, then of course the government and I presume the parliament would act. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that at this point, we don't have concerns. We do not share the concerns. In fact, we've been given very strong reassurance by the regulators, by the banks themselves, by the systems that have been put in place by this place and the other place to ensure that we have a strong, well-regulated, well-capitalised banking system to, you know, to precisely um, you know, uh, insulate from some of the um, financial instability that we're seeing elsewhere. So yes, of course, the government would respond if we had to. At this point in time, uh, we are assured that it's not the case. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, the presidents and other representatives from the Western Australian shires of Leonora and Laverton wrote to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Albanese, earlier this year about the increase in alcohol-fueled violence that is ravaging their community, children not being fed, and the increasing violence against women, all following the abolition of the cashless debit card. Minister, my question, very sincere question to you is, have these reports been verified by the West Australian Police and what information does the government have about the changes in crime rates across these communities? Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator O'Sullivan, um, about uh, an important issue that uh, affects um, uh, his community in uh, in these uh, in these areas. Uh, let's call them the, the goldfields uh, uh, areas of uh, 
of Western, Western Australia. I understand there have been um, some meetings um, between the uh, uh, Laverton uh, Shire and the uh, relevant uh, um, Albanese government uh, minister. I think there's been some discussions with uh, Mr Patrick Hill, the president of the Shire of Leverton, uh, Mr Peter Craig, um, <coughs> Shire of uh, Leonora, uh, Phil Marshall, um, chief executive officer of the Leverton Shire Council, Mr Jack Carmody, Leverton Shire councillor, and Mr Marty Sealander, chief executive of uh, uh, Pakanu. Um, and I understand those discussions um, and uh, other positive uh, discussions um, uh, have been about uh, what support services that uh, those uh, those uh, community leaders want to see um, in uh, in uh, in their community, um, and uh, I understand uh, there's been a, a willingness uh, by the Shire to uh, reinstate the uh, the jobs uh, uh, hub. Um, there was. Particularly in the in Laverton, I think there was um, some uncertainty about the uh, long-term uh, funding of the uh, Jobs Hub, um, because under the previous government, of course, um, it was going to run out in uh, in June. Um, so I think uh, there are some positive uh, signs there. Um, when it comes to the issue of uh, alcohol use uh, in remote Thank you, Minister. and the regional, the time for answering has expired, Senator. O'Sullivan, first supplementary. Reports published on the weekend indicate that the number of offences committed in Sojuna has doubled since the cashless debit card was abolished four months ago. Minister, given you didn't quite answer my last question about the police, uh, I'd ask you in relation to South Australia, have the, these reports been verified by the South Australian police and what information does the government have about changes in crime rates across the Sojuna community? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Uh, thanks, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, uh, Senator O'Sullivan for his question about uh, Sojuna. Um, I think the most recent uh, reports that the minister has uh, received um, from her department indicate that there's been a decline uh, in admissions and presentations due to alcohol uh, and drugs uh, or injuries in Sojuna. Um, stakeholders. Uh, well, I'm just telling you. <coughs> telling, I'm. I, I'm just telling you. I mean, you asked the question. You asked the question. I'm giving you a direct answer to the question. You may not like the answer, but with respect, Senator Rustin, you're no longer in charge of this uh, of this uh, area. You're no longer in charge of this area. We've got a terrific minister in the in the person of uh, Amanda Rishworth, who I know takes a very particular interest in uh, issues uh, in, uh, in Sejuna, Thank you, Minister. as she the does. The time for answering has expired. Senator O'Sullivan, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Months later, why hasn't the Prime Minister responded to the correspondence from the representatives of affected Western Australian communities? And when will he visit any of the negatively impacted communities? Uh, thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Minister Farrell. Well, as I recollect, <coughs> one of your complaints was that the Prime Minister didn't go to uh, Alice Springs when they were having uh, um, a, a range of uh, issues there. And my recollection is I saw <coughs> um, uh, the Prime Minister and, uh, and Minister uh, Burney both uh, um, attending uh, up uh, up in Alice Springs. And uh, I do note, I do, I do, I do note, I do note that uh, in the. I, I do note. I do Order. note. Order, Minister Farrell, please continue. Thank you. Um, I do. I do note that uh, the Prime Minister has been to. I, I do note. I, knew, I do note. Uh, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath and Senator Watt, calling out across the chamber, chamber constantly is disorderly. The minister is on his feet answering a question. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Um, I, do, I do know that uh, the Prime Minister, I think I'm right about this, has either been to Western Australia nine or ten times since becoming uh, uh, the Prime Minister of, uh, of this country, which is, which is a lot more 
lot more than in the previous Thank 12 months. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi. President, my question without notice is to Minister Farrell, representing the Minister for Housing. Minister, reports last week revealed Australia is one of the worst places in the developed world to be a renter. Rents are a staggering 22 per cent higher than they were in 2020, and renters in Australia are projected to pay $10 billion in rent increases this year alone. More people than ever are living in cars, caravans, and tents. More and more people are struggling to pay rent and having to make the choice between rent and food, between rent and medication, between rent and childcare fees. Will the government finally do the same thing they did for energy caps and coordinate a national freeze on rent increases and coordinate national tenancy standards? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you um, President, and thank uh, Senator for, uh, Faruqi for her uh, question, and uh, I know her sincere um, concern uh, about the uh, plight of renters uh, in this uh, country, which, which the Albanese government uh, um, shares with, uh, with you. And uh, of course, um, this government has been coming um, to the, the parliament with um, solutions to. Um, the difficult issue of, uh, of housing in this, uh, in this country. We know that a lot of people across Australia are struggling right now uh, to, to uh, find a, an affordable place to rent. Uh, we hear their concerns and we hear your concerns, uh, uh, Senator uh, Faruqi, uh, and we are acting to address them. The answer to rental stress is a sustained booth, boost in the supply of homes to rent and a substantial investment in new social and affordable houses. And that's uh, what this government um, is, uh, is aiming uh, to do, Senator Faruqi. Um, the government uh, struck a national housing accord between all levels of government, investors uh, and industry to build the affordable homes our country desperately needs uh, to boost the supply of new houses. In addition to the accord, we've now passed legislation for the $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund through the House of Representatives, although I note not yet the, uh, the Senate. Our ambitious uh, reform agenda to deliver more social and affordable homes uh, right across uh, the country includes the widening of the uh, National Housing Infrastructure Facility with up to $575 million available to invest in more social Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Faruqi, first supplementary. Minister, the government is cutting funding for 27,000 affordable national renter affordability scheme homes while proposing a fund that gambles $10 billion on the stock market, which doesn't guarantee a cent to be spent on housing, and last year would have lost $120 million. Do you accept that currently the government's housing plan will make the crisis worse for renters. Thank you, Senator Fruki. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, pr President. Uh, well, I, no, I don't. Uh, th I thank uh, <coughs> Senator Faruqi for her uh, first supplementary question. Um, no, I don't accept that uh, pro proposition, uh, Senator Faruqi. Um, <coughs> for instance, the regional first home buyer guarantee uh, was uh, brought forward by three months by this government. Uh, and more than 2,000 places have already been taken up, with hundreds of Australian families now in their uh, new homes. With Help to Buy, a new program to help Australians get their uh, own home sooner. Uh, establishing uh, a permanent uh, National Housing Supply and Affordability Council. Uh, the Interim Council has been operating since the 1st of January of this year and it uh, provides uh, independent expert advice to government, but particularly developing a new national housing and homelessness plan. Um, the government has been talking Thank with state minister, and territory housing. The has expired. Senator Green. Oh, I'm sorry, Senator Faruqi. Please, uh, second supplementary. Minister, the government's own 
National Housing Investment Corporation, has reported that Australia needs at least $15 billion a year in investment in public community and affordable housing. How does the government justify proposing to spend $368 billion on nuclear attack submarines and only a maximum of $500 million on housing? Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, Senator Faruqi for her um, uh, second supplementary question. I think you're, with due respect, uh, Senator uh, Faruqi, I think you're conflating two separate issues. Um, one of the obligations, like it or not, that uh, federal government have uh, is to ensure the uh, defence and security uh, of Australia, and uh, the Albanese <coughs> government takes that issue seriously. And that's why we've uh, made some announcements in the last couple of weeks in terms of defence. Um, we are bringing to this parliament a very significant reform package uh, in terms of uh, housing, which will, we believe, uh, assist uh, both people getting into their own homes, but more particularly renters, ensuring that they uh, have an opportunity to rent and there's downward pressure on those rents. Can I say this? That project uh, of this government was much more likely to succeed. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Green. <coughs> Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Watt. Uh, can the Minister explain why funding certainty is important for essential government functions like emergency management and national security? And what happens when governments don't plan for the future by providing that certainty? Thank you. Senator Green, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. And thank you very much, Senator Green. As a Cairns-based senator, I know you've provided a lot of support to regional communities experiencing floods uh, and other disasters in your time here. Uh, in the 10 months that I've been Minister for Emergency Management, I've obviously seen a lot of floods. Every time I visit a different flood or storm-impacted community, I hear the same stories over and over again. People keep saying, it's always flooded in the past, but never like this. Or they say, this exceeds anything we've ever seen before, or this isn't normal. And this pattern was evident all the way back in 2019 with the Black Summer bushfires, when we saw unprecedented fires in Queensland rainforests, when we saw the entirety of Kangaroo Island under a bushfire warning, and when we saw fires across New South Wales and Victoria burn for months. It's been blatantly obvious for a very long time that long-term investment in disaster funding and taking action on climate change has been required. And while those of us on this side of the chamber have acknowledged the impacts of climate change for some years, those opposite are still living in the dark ages. These ideological beliefs and climate wars have hamstrung their ability to prepare for natural disasters. The fact is that for nearly a decade, the coalition failed to make our country more resilient to the impacts of natural disasters. And despite all the evidence over all those years, they seemed to think that the disasters would stop. In fact, they even came up with a precise date that they thought the natural disasters would stop, and that was the 30th of June this year. Now, I say that because it's, the, it's that date that nearly 25 per cent of the funding for our national disaster agencies runs out. That's right. The former government under Senator Birmingham and Senator Mackenzie didn't fund their national natural disaster agencies past the end of this financial year. According to the forward estimates, if the coalition had won the election, our national you, disaster Senator agencies White, could not have continued operating. Senator Green, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how is this funding uncertainty impacting on the Commonwealth's ability to support states and territories in responding to the increasing number of natural hazards? Thank you, Senator Green. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Thank you again, Senator Green. Now, let me repeat that. Under the former government, 25 per cent of the funding for our national disaster agencies runs out on 30 June this year. So despite all of the floods, all of the bushfires, all of the cyclones, they just said it's going to be OK, it's going to stop raining on 30 June 2023 and we won't need that funding beyond that. 
Now, what does that funding uncertainty mean? Well, what it means, if it's not fixed by our government, is that a network of, our network of recovery support officers around the country uh, is impaired, along with our ability to provide payments to disaster-impacted communities and any national planning to build nation, national resilience. They're the things that would have occurred had the coalition won the last election. As I say, it's almost as if the coalition thought that these events would just stop and that everything would be fine, the sum would come out, we'd get precisely the right, right, right amount of rainfall in precisely the right area Areas, and we'd never have to worry about natural disasters. This is the economic Thank vandalism you, we've inherited and we're fixing up the mess. Five. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, how could former governments have better prepared for the increasing number and intensity of natural hazards? Thank you, Senator Green, Minister. Thank you, Senator Green. Well, maybe as a starting point, the former government, when it was pre preparing its budget just before the election, could have thought, well, you know, we've been having a lot of floods lately, we've been having a few bushfires lately, a few cyclones. Maybe we need to make sure that our National Natural Disaster Agency has the funding to continue its operations. But no. Their budget, Senator Birmingham's budget, Senator McKenzie's budget for the Emergency Management Department, actually was going to cut 25 per cent of the funding for that agency from the 30th of June this year. Since our election ten months ago, the Albanese government has shown that no matter what state or territory you live in, when a natural disaster strikes, we will be there with you and we will provide the funding that is needed to respond properly to natural disasters. And that's why we've been fixing the neglect of the past decade. We're overhauling the emergency response fund, the $5 billion fund that never built a single project with our disaster ready fund. We're overhauling disaster funding arrangements. We are fixing the mess that we have been left in so many portfolios including Thank disaster you, Minister, management. The time for answering has expired. Senator Scarf. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Is it correct that the Keating government released the Solicitor General's advice provided to the then government's advisory committee ahead of the referendum to establish an Australian Republic? Is it also correct that the Gillard government released the Solicitor General's advice in relation to border protection policies? Thank you, Senator Scarf. As Minister Farrell. Um, look, I don't know the answer to either of those questions, uh, um, but uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, make some inquiries and find out what the answer to those two questions are. Uh, thank you, Minister Far uh, uh, Senator Scar. Senator Scar, first supplementary. Hmm. Well, Senator Farrell, I can, I can uh, save you the work and say it did. Uh, and given these precedents, including the um, provision. Just a moment, uh, Senator Scarf. Uh, um, uh, the Senator knows the answer to the question. Why? What's um, the point Senator, of asking me Senator, the question? Minister Farrell, that is not a point of order. Senator Scarf. Given these precedents, including the provision of Solicitor General's advice for the last proposed referendum to change the Australian Constitution, Will the Albanese Labor government make the Solicitor General's advice relating to its proposed constitutional amendment available to the Australian public and the parliamentary select committee that it proposes to establish? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Farrell. Um, my understanding um, uh, is that uh, uh, the Attorney General is not proposing to make that uh, advice uh, public. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Scar, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, President. On what public interest ground? On what public interest ground is the Albanese Labor government refusing to release the Solicitor General's advice relating to its proposed constitutional amendment prior to Australians having to cast their votes on it? Thank you, Senator Scar. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank you, Senator Carr for his second supplementary question. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, ask the. Uh, Attorney uh, General uh, to come back with an answer on that question. Thank you, Senator Farrell. <coughs> Senator Farrell. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. You are too slow.
Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting President. I rise to take note on all questions from opposition senators to ministers today. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr President. Well, well today uh, there were a lot of questions, a lot of important questions asked of the government on a, on a day where they've announced a huge deal with the uh, Greens Party to establish a massive new carbon tax on job-creating projects in this country. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately there were no answers uh, given uh, about these very important questions. Uh, uh, this deal, this dodgy deal that's been done between the Labor and the Greens, potentially means that all new coal and gas and, and other mining projects will require to have all of their emissions offset. What that means is they'll have to buy carbon credits for all of the emissions uh, that they did. Previously, previously, the government announced that they only have to buy offsets for the amount of emissions they're reducing, 5 per cent a year. Now it'll be not 5 per cent next year, it'll be 100 per cent for these projects next year. Now there is a mine, there's a new mine being built in my area in central Queensland near Moranbar, the Olive Downs mine. I asked about that particular mine and uh, the minister couldn't even tell the 500 people that are working there tonight. They'll be going to sleep in a camp away from their families tonight. And the leader of the Labor Party in this Senate couldn't tell 500 Australian workers whether they have a job tonight. They claim that they're the party representing workers. They claim they represent the people that go to work for, uh, to help this country be strong, and they can't even give them basic answers. They haven't done basic analysis. Maybe the people responding to this take note could, can provide these answers to workers in this country. Can they provide them answers? Will they have to? Will this mine, this Olive Downs mine, have to offset 100 per cent of its emissions? And if it has, what analysis, what consultation have they done with the mine to know whether those people will have or lose their jobs overnight? What, what have they done? Because, according to Mr Bant, according to the Leader of the Australian Greens, who seems to be in charge in this place right now, according to Mr Bant, uh, yeah, and it's been confirmed, he's in charge. He's in charge of the government. No one, hardly anyone voted for Mr Bant in this country, uh, but he's in charge. He's in charge of this place. He says he's giving more detail than the Labor government at the moment, but he says that the Beetaloo gas field, one of these projects, will be required from day one to offset all of its emissions, scope one, scope two and scope three for domestic use. I just want to pick particularly remind people what that last bit means. Scope 3 for domestic use. Scope 3 emissions are the use of the gas. So when you use the gas or the coal and you burn it to create energy and electricity, which still more than half the world's energy comes from those sources, that's Scope 3 emissions. So the deal that the Labor Party have done with the Greens would tax, would penalise the use of coal and gas in Australia for domestic use. That's what Mr Ban said, for domestic use. If you send the coal and gas over to Japan and Korea, they're tax-free. <laughs> or China. China, tax-free. How absurd is this? that we're going to penalise the use of our own energy for our own purposes, but not other countries. Not other countries. Well, this deal that's been announced between the Labor and the Greens today, it's a bit like the Game of Thrones. It's a bit like Game of Thrones. Winter is coming. Winter is coming. And it's going to be, unfortunately, if this deal goes through this place, it's going to be a long, cold, dark winter, many winters uh, for those to come in this country, because we're not going to have enough energy for our own use. They're not going to be the gas projects, the coal projects we need to keep the lights in this country. We know, and the government knows from the Australian energy market operator, that we are facing massive gas shortages in the next few years. We have a huge problem that the Bass Strait is declining as an oil and gas producing field. We need to replace it with new projects like Narrabri in New South Wales, like hopefully the Beetaloo in the Northern Territory. The Greens want to stop it. We know that. But they, they are going to mean that people have to pay massive amounts for their power. If you, thought, if you think your power bill is bad now, wait, wait until we stop all new coal and gas projects in this country. We still need coal and gas for more than 70 per cent of our electricity needs. Wait till we stop all those and then, and then see uh, what real pain looks like in your power prices. prices. We'll be paying what they are in the UK and Europe and Germany before you know it. And that will hurt poor people in this nation. And the Australian Labor Party here is an absolute embarrassment that they cannot answer uh, questions right now about the impact of these policies, because, because these, policies, these policies will mean that there are more than a million Australians that rely on the mining sector for their jobs now face uncertainty. And keep in mind, it's not just coal and gas. Lithium mines, nickel mines, copper mines, they're all, they're all captured by the safeguard mechanism too. They use a lot of diesel. Uh, Senator, Senator Stirl knows this. They don't have a lot of electricity in some of these parts of Australia. They have to use diesel, and they're in capture. And so why would we put restraints on mining the very resources we need to have batteries, wind turbines and all these other stuff? How stupid are we? They're going to, they're going to put a massive constraint, basically a stop, a big stop sign, to nickel mines, to lithium mines, the stuff that they think they need, uh, they claim they want to power the, the world. 
This is going to be an absolute disaster this country in every power price rise, every blackout is on the heads of the Greens and Labor parties that are in charge in this place. Senator Still. I clarify the record before I respond. So in her first question to Minister Farrell, Senator Rustin stated, and I quote, last week to send the greed without dissent to the Coalition's second reading amendment to the National Health Amendment Bill requiring the listing of all medicines approved by the Pharmaceutical Benefit Advisory Committee on the Pharmaceutical Benefit Schemes." Unquote. This is a mischaracterisation, Mr Deputy President, of the government's position. Whilst we did not call a division, the government did not support the second reading amendment for the reasons Senator McCarthy outlined in her summing up speech when she stated, and I quote, there are long-standing considered processes for PBS listings through PBAC, not second reading amendments." Unquote. Now, Mr Deputy President, I'd like to touch on the question that was asked of Senator O'Sullivan to Minister Farrell and about the cashless welfare card. Now, it is an extraordinarily well known in this chamber and outside of this chamber. I am a loyal member of the Australian Labor Party, but I had a bit of a different view on the abolition of the wealth, cashless welfare card. I believe that it was not the silver bullet. I honestly believe we could do a lot better. But I made it very clear here in this building on a number of occasions talking to my mates, uh, the Aboriginal leaders in the Kimberley, that there were mixed views. I also remember the, the, uh, the uh, passionate arguments when it first started, not only in Oran, Lavedon and Kalgoorlie, but certainly up in Kununurra and then into Wyndham. And I remember the leadership in Kununurra of the Indigenous uh, um, uh, corporations and communities up there, my very dear friend Ian Trust, Lawford Benning, Teddy Carlton. And I remember the passion in the speeches, because as they had made it very clearly to me what was happening up in the Kimberley, I'm only talking about the Kimberley, I know it happens all over Australia. It is not unique to just Aboriginal communities, but they were sick of seeing their children being buried. They were sick of seeing their, their, their population, their people being buried way too early. And they wanted change. They wanted something different. Unfortunately, the card didn't deliver what was hoped it would deliver. It split the community. There's no argument about that. But I do want to say this. I think it's disingenuous that a lot of us sitting here in Canberra, uh, and I, this is not a slight on Senator O'Sullivan, because Senator O'Sullivan works very hard up in the Kimberley, like I do. Senator O'Sullivan and I are both co-chairs of the Gurama Yani Yu, the, chair, uh, the uh, men's uh, um, uh, shed in Fitzroy Crossing. And I know Senator O'Sullivan's commitment to Indigenous advancement in his previous life working for Mindaroo. But I must say this, Mr Deputy President, I have worked in Indigenous communities in the Kimberley longer than any other senator in this building. And I'm not saying that I've got all the answers. I don't. But one thing I take dearly as I wander through the Kimberley, not only in my role as a senator but in my role that I provide pre-loved furniture to communities in Fitzroy Crossing, to, fit, to, to supply bedding through Fitzroy Crossing, to supply this is all donated stuff, road trains are the stuff where my mates in the trucking industry throw a prime mover at me, three trailers, two dollies, and I run all that pre-loved furniture up to the Kimberley in Fitzroy and in Kununurra to help service uh, those in remote communities through Kununurra, Wyndham, Warm and Halls Creek. We've even had people coming from Balgo to uh, get hold of this second-hand furniture very, very cheap, and we create the opportunity for Indigenous people to get training and employment throughout the Fitzroy Valley and through the East Kimberley. But it really does point to one thing, and I must say this. I cannot stress through all my tours, through all my meetings, through all my conversations in the Kimberley for the last 30 odd years as a truck driver, longer, 40 years as a truck driver and also as a senator, that there is one thing that Aboriginal leaders say to me, whether they're male, whether they're female, whether I'm talking to the, the Women's Resource Centre or whether I'm talking to training and employment service providers or I'm talking to health providers or those in the justice system. My Indigenous leaders and my Indigenous friends throughout the Kimberley make it very, very clear to me. When I go there, they say one thing to me. There is one common denominator. And they say, Glenn, when is someone going to listen to us? When is someone in Canberra or in government actually going to ask us what we want? I cannot think of a more powerful reason to stand up and support the referendum to deliver the voice 
so Indigenous people can actually have their say and they can actually be listened to. I cannot wait for the referendum. And I applaud everyone in the Aboriginal communities that I work and represent. I will be there alongside you, for you and with you. Senator Bragg. Deputy President, and no right to take note of the answers as well given today. Um, and uh, I take the point Senator Steele makes about uh, the, this issue. I think it's, fair, it's a fair point that uh, we haven't done a very good job of listening to people when we've sought to make policy uh, in this country over the last 250 years. And there are a range of views on how this should be done. And when you travel into remote parts of uh, the states we represent, uh, you'll get a range of views about uh, how that could be improved. And I think people do want to see new institutions. And I think that is the best argument for the voice, that there should be new institutions to help communities make decisions uh, about their own affairs and their own arrangements. And that has always been my view. And we're now at a point in time where uh, there is going to be a referendum. And I think we need to give people comfort that this can be done in a way that is going to preserve the institutions that have otherwise served the country well. Because, of course, you wouldn't seek to introduce new institutions if you thought they were all working well. And I think the average, uh, I think the, the reasonable view here would be that Australia has been a very good country, uh, but it has is, it is too often let Indigenous people down, chiefly because of this uh, terrible problem of paternalism. And uh, that is what the, these... Uh, these initiatives are about. And so, uh, as someone that wants to recommend a yes vote, uh, I would like to understand exactly what the advice is. I think that's a reasonable proposition. And uh, I'm not seeking to make any political points here other than uh, we want to make sure that this is a safe change for our constitution. Uh, I, I think it is a reasonable point uh, that there could be cases where the voice as a new institution or as a institution that's been running for some time uh, would seek uh, uh, legal remedies through the High Court. That, that may be reasonable from time to time. But the point here is we wouldn't want to see a situation where things were extraneous to the core function. And that is the question for me is... Are the words that were released last week good enough to ensure that the voice is going to be effective? Um, it is going to have all the power it needs, but it isn't going to bung up the system of government we have and bind up the courts. Now, that's, that's the question. Now, um, there may be good reasons why it can't be released. I don't know. Uh, it appears to be the case that there are conventions here or there have been precedents where advice has been released in connection with referenda. Uh, but if there is a good reason, then I look forward to understanding that when we hit, hit the committee stage of this process, because I understand that there is to be a joint committee of the parliament which will look at this bill, this constitution alteration bill. That's what we're talking about at the moment. And uh, that will be the opportunity to ask the department in the hearings about this wording. Now, if, if the advice isn't going to be provided through the usual way, then I'm sure that the committee uh, can find a way to get a sense of what the department's view is, but also the, the various legal minds. And there are many former High Court justices and other legal people with much bigger brains than mine uh, that are offering their view on this wording. And people will have to make a decision about whether they are prepared to support or oppose something uh, based on the legal interpretation of various people. And these people will be in the department, there'll be the retired judges, there'll be people who are working in the law today, and we will all have an opportunity to hear from uh, those various minds. And I look forward to doing that and then uh, landing a position. But I would say, and I'd just, just, repeat myself again, uh, that I don't think this is a good place to play politics, but I, I do think it would help if we could have the advice or at least 
some sanitised version of the advice so that we could be more satisfied that these changes that were made last week um, are going to be satisfactory. Because I personally have an open mind about these changes, but I don't understand the genesis behind these, uh, frankly, uh, new changes uh, made last week. Senator Payman. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, there's one thing that my good friend Senator Bragg and I agree with, and that is that the previous government could have done better. And they had 10 years, in almost 10 years, in government, um, and we saw what the outcome was. And you know, if laughter is medicine, then the track record of those in government, those opposite in government, must be curing the world, don't we think? Um, I would like to take note on what uh, Senator Canavan, um, Senator Canavan's question was to um, the minister, and he said, "Winter is coming." Well, Senator Canavan. Winter may be coming, but the Albanese government is manning the walls whilst your party is bickering on who will sit on that throne. You know, we saw in the election just over the weekend, and if anyone missed out, let me just remind you that those opposite lost in New South Wales. They, you suspended your whip in Victoria and you don't exist in WA, but also you don't participate here. So it's just one way of Australians saying that they've had enough. They really have had enough of your decade of delay, denial and destruction, and they want to see action. And you sit there asking us, what are we doing? What are we doing for workers? What are we doing for Australians out there who are doing it tough? What are we doing with the housing crisis? What are we doing with climate change? Well, let me just tell you that with the announcement today, Australia is one step closer to achieving net zero by 2050, with confirmation that, there's, that we've secured additional parliamentary support for the safeguard mechanisms reforms. Now, these are overdue, sensible reforms, which ensures Australia's largest emitters are competitive in a decarbonising global economy and that they're doing their fair share. They're making their fair contribution in ensuring that we reach that reduction target. Now, those opposites have, of course, made themselves irrelevant despite calls across industry for bipartisan support for these reforms. You know, these reforms are, you, are the chance, our first chance in over a decade to implement transformative climate change action that gets us towards net zero and has broad support across economy and community. You know, we've had extensive consultation with business groups, with industries, with community groups. And this is what they've been crying out for way too long. It has been carefully designed. These reforms have been carefully designed to cut pollution in our biggest industrial emitters while minimising costs and allowing flexibility at at least cost abatement opportunities to be deployed. Now, the Albanese Labor government recognises that Australians and Australian industries out there are smart. They'll choose the least cost abatement, and these reforms allow them to do that. Now, unless the parliament passes government safeguard reforms, Australia's 2030 emissions reduction projections will be 35 per cent, not 43 per cent as we legislated. So no MP or senator can criticise this government about emissions reductions targets and say that they're not good enough if they then come into parliament and vote against policies to achieve emissions reductions. Now, it's important to understand that there are sensible and prudent buffers in the scheme which take into account the possibility of new entrants. You know, we've been hearing from those opposite who I think are probably suffering from delusions of adequacy. They think that you know, they've done so well in the last decade and we're not doing enough in the last 10 months. 
But I'd like to highlight and remind you who the Australian people trusted and put in government. Who elected us to be the adults in charge to fix the mess that your government put us in? You know, we know ScoMo doesn't hold a hose, but can any of you hold a hammer to fix this mess? Senator Little. Thank you, Deputy President. We know that ensuring continued and improved access to affordable medicines is now more important than ever, with the cost of living continuing to put significant and rising pressure on all Australians. It was great to see the government pass the Coalition's amendment to their National Health Amendment Bill last week, which noted the Coalition's strong record on affordable medicines and called on them to intervene in the remo removal of FIASP on the PBS to urgently list Trifafta for children and cystic with cystic fibrosis and to commit to listing all medicines on the PBS that have been recommended by PBAC. It is important to acknowledge the importance of the government continuing the former coalition government's record on the PBS, which has ensured affordable access to critical medicines for all Australians. The coalition is proud of the fact that in government it listed almost 3,000 new or amended medicines on the PBS. This represented an average of around 30 listings or amendments per month, or one each day, at an overall investment of nearly 15 billion. That's a lot of people helped to get greater access to medicine. However, we remain concerned by Labor's record on affordable medicines, noting that they had to stop listing new medicines when they were last in government because they couldn't manage the money. We know that Labor went to the election with a promise of cheaper medicines, but it seems they have already broken this promise because they have decided to remove a life-changing diabetes drug from the PBS FIASP which is being relied on by 15,000 Australians who suffer from type 1 diabetes. The coalition government listed this very important diabetic medicine on the PBS in 2019. The coalition understood that FIASP is an innovative mealtime insulin that improves sugar blood levels at a faster rate than other diabetes medications, resulting in improved quality of life for the people who take it. But Labor, in the middle of a cost of living crisis, has made the decision to remove affordable access to a life-changing drug that's been relied on by 15,000 Australians with diabetes. The most concerning part is that we know that Minister Butler, as the Minister for Health, has the ability to intervene, but so far he has chosen not to. Ministerial discretion to ensure critical medicines like FIASP can, can remain commercially viable on the PBS and therefore affordable to the Australians who rely on them. Minister Butler must explain to the 15,000 Australians with diabetes who rely on FIASP why he is refusing to exercise that discretion to solve this issue. To add further concern, in November last year, the PBAC recommended that the innovative drug, drug Trifactor, be added to the PBS for treatment to the children with cystic fibrosis aged 6 to 11 years. However, government has so far failed to add this life-changing medicine to the PBS despite the months that have passed since it was recommended. Under the coalition, we listed every medicine on the PBS that was recommended by PBAC, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. The government must do the right thing by the 500 children with cystic fibrosis who would benefit from affordable access to this life-changing medicine and list this medicine on the PBS. Time and again, they continue to prove that they are all talk and no action. There is no more critical a time to ensure affordable access to medicines than right now with the cost of living skyrocketing under this government. Labor continues to prove that they will say one thing to get elected and then turn around and do the opposite when in government. Their broken promises are adding up. They promised cheaper mortgages. That hasn't happened. Lower inflation, we've seen that go up. And real wage increases. Mm -mm. 
But to borrow their phrase, right now, everything is going up except for wages. I, just excuse me, Senator Cox, I have to put the question, and I think you're going to take note of something else. I'll put the question, those for the question say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Minister Farrell about uh, Thrive 2030. Now, I want to thank the minister for giving some of the answers that I asked uh, of my questions, and I'm pleased to see the government are taking uh, the opportunity to invest in the tourism sector seriously, both after the disruptions of COVID-19, but also bushfires and floods that we've seen across the country, which in fact has hit the tourism industry quite hard. We are slowly seeing uh, recovery in some aspects and borders are opening and starting to welcome people uh, both domestically but also internationally here to Australia. And it's a perfect time for this government to invest in a sector um, which is essentially what uh, Thrive 2030 is about. Um, as highlighted by the minister, there is an in and, and indeed the reason for this question, the reason I asked it, is that this strategy relies heavily on First Nations tourism. And First Nations people have experiences that cannot be held anywhere else. And he referenced the unique aspect, aspects of First Nations culture. But in order for us to do that, in both investing in First Nations tourism and also empowering First Nations people to share both culture and stories with tourists, it's critical that we ensure that First Nations people are both the owners of that uh, information, they operate their own ventures, uh, they have control over what can be shared, where they can take people, what's sacred and what, what, they can, what, what they can provide in that experience to people because it, not everything is appropriate to be shared and particularly um, around culture. And it's only First Nations people that know this information. So it's important when we talk about the aspect of cultural heritage protection, it has to be legislated, and it has to be legislated in a way that we can protect it. Now, cultural heritage is at the heart of any First Nations or First Peoples uh, tourism industry. And it relies on sacred sites, it relies on song lines, dance, song, art, bush foods, botanicals, medicine, um, and other practices which are appropriate to share. But it doesn't allow anybody to culturally appropriate that. And if we don't legislate it, if we don't put it in our trade negotiations and we fail to include it, um, it just becomes words on a paper. It becomes the strategy that everyone goes to Sydney and all the ministers have a lovely little gathering and stand up and say how wonderful this is. It doesn't actually protect cultural heritage on the basis of creating a thriving tourism industry that empowers First Nations community, but is also for the health and wellbeing, the connection to country that this provides. And we need a good legislative framework in order to do that. Now, in First Nations communities, we don't see ourselves as separate to nature. So this is why um, you know, last week I was at the World's Indigenous Tourism Conference, so the week before, talking to people globally about the experience of sustainable tourism and how we can ensure that we are providing both economic, environmental, social and cultural factors into protecting our cultural heritage so that the experience of Jook and Gorge, 40,000-year-old rock shelters in the Pilbara, in my home state, the destruction of those was at the forefront of people's minds. Because internationally, there were headlines about how tragic this was, how the system failed at all levels to protect First Nations cultural heritage in this country. And we have a committee report, and I, I had the... Um, opportunity to sit on this committee and the report um, was basically what I asked Minister Farrell about. How, when, when are we going to see those minimum standards included in legislation and good regulatory frameworks that allow cultural heritage to be protected in this country? Because without cultural heritage being protected, we have nothing to show people when they come here. We have nothing. A set of rubbled rocks that say that's where it used to be. We need to fix that. 
And the reports, funnily enough, the title is Never Again. So it never again should happen that we are in this situation. And UNDRIP is also the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Again, when I asked that question twice, the ratification of the Convention on Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage, I didn't get an answer. I look forward to working with this government, though, in continuing to pursue First Nations cultural heritage and tourism. I in this put the country. question, those the questions say aye against no. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons. Senator Wong for today and Senator Dodson from 27th to 30th of March 2023. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Nampajimpa Price for the 22nd of March for personal reasons. Senators Cadell, Hume and Patterson for the 24th of March for personal reasons. Senator Payne for the 24th of March to the 30th of March for personal reasons. And Senator Patterson for the 27th of March to the 30th March for parliamentary business. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to a leave of absence. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Steele John for the 27th of March for personal reasons. Clark. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Uh, General Business Notice of Motion Number 197, standing in the name of Senator Rice, postponed from the 27th of March to the 29th of March. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I note no senator has made such a request. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Birmingham, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. The question is the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. I now come to 185, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I actually seek that this motion be withdrawn. The record, uh, Senator Dunningham. Yeah, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? One minute, just that. Senator McKim, is that leave granted? Not necessarily a criteria. One minute. Well, I have to say how terribly disappointed I am. We won't have a chance to vote on this very important motion today. Uh, at the beginning of last week, I had my hopes set extremely high that, in the interest of transparency and good governance, the Australian Greens and the Coalition would be able to work together to extract out of this government that hates sunlight and hates transparency the modelling that underpins the safeguard mechanism. Unfortunately, though, and I did smell a rat early on in the piece, when I had my motion ready to go, asking for this modelling, saying, hey, Australia, we are not going to deal with this bill until we get the modelling, this modelling that couldn't be shown to us because it was one, cabinet incompetence. Suddenly then the excuse changed to market sensitivities. Take your pick, whatever day of the week it is, the government will choose its excuse depending on which way the wind is blowing. But we couldn't get there with it. We had to have a motion, an alternative one which has now been withdrawn, that enabled the Greens to decide when they bring the bill on. Now they want to bring it on. They've done a deal. Sorry, Australia, you miss out. Senator Pocock. Barbara. I've got 187. I'll come to you, Senator Robert. Sorry? 185. Is leave granted? One minute. Thank you. The Greens used this motion 185 to blackmail a gutless, uncaring government selling out workers. 
Come on, what was the dirty deal? The Greens talk about transparency, so come on, what was the deal? Empty platitudes about transparency. Labor selling out workers, again. Labor selling out manufacturing, again. Labor selling out taxpayers, again. Labor selling out families, again. This was just a stunt by the Greens to leverage and put pressure on the Labor Party. And the Labor Party has caved yet again to the, to the tail that is wagging the dog. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 187, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Pocock. I move that the following bill be introduced. The question I is that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Pocock. I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. I put the question that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Senator Pocock. Oh, I so move that no, this. I'll clerk first, my apologies, and then I'll come to you. Um, introduction of Fair Work Amendment Right to Disconnect Bill 2023. I was too keen. Senator Pocock. I'm very keen also. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to table an explan explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. If leave granted, leave is granted. We now come to. I, Senator Pocock. Uh, I, let, I table an explanatory memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Roberts, we come to 199. I ask, uh, thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 199 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the motion. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. Against, no. I think the ayes have it. A division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that motion 199, standing the name of Senator Roberts, an order for production of documents improving access to medicinal cannabis bill 2023 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, those to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there being 37 ayes and 14 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. We now come to general business item 200, Senator Roberts. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 200 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. I put the question that the motion number 200, standing the name of Senator Roberts, order for production of documents MRH 90 helicopter Jarvis Bay incident be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. I think the ayes have it. We now come to notice of motion 202 and 203, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator er Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notices of motion number 202 and number 203 be taken together as formal motions. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move the motions. Uh, Minister, you seek, seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. As Senator Cashwell knows, the wording of the proposed constitutional alteration is the product of a Cabinet process. The Referendum Working Group provided Cabinet with advice as part of the process, so did the Solicitor-General. Consistent with the long-standing practice followed by all governments, Cabinet should be able to be conducted in secrecy so as to preserve the freedom of deliberation of that body. It would harm the public interest to undermine the confidentiality of the Cabinet process by producing the documents sought by Senator Cash or by producing legal advice. I intend to put the question. I put the question that motions 202 and 203 moved together by leave, standing in the name of Senator Cash and moved by Senator Askew, orders for production of documents, voice referendum be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division is required. Ring the bells. Four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that notice of motion 202 and 203 moved together, standing in the name of Senator Cash, and moved by Senator Askew regarding the order of production of documents on the voice referendum be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair, no to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there have been 26 ayes and 27 noes. It's passed in the negative. We now come to notice of motion 204, standing the name of Senator Smith. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Dean Smith, I ask that general business notice of motion number 204 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion be taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator Askew. I move the motion. I put the question that motion. Sorry, Senator McKim, is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, uh, Deputy President. The Greens won't be supporting this order for the production of documents. To date, the Greens have. Uh, regularly supported motions by the opposition requesting documents in the Treasury space, as spurious as some of those requests have seemed at the time. But let's be clear about what this is. It's an order calling for the release of documents relating to a bill that is currently before a Senate inquiry that has not yet closed for submissions and is yet to hold any hearings. Uh, we're going to wait for the Senate inquiry to at least take a couple of steps down the road before we start supporting OPDs like this. I intend to put the question. Order, order. I'm about to put the question. I put the question that those of motion 204 standing in the name of Senator Smith are moved by Senator Askew for order of production of documents, Treasury Laws Amendment 2023, Measures Number 1, Bill 2023. Schedules four and five be agreed to. Those of the questions say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. No, I've, de I've, de I have, I've declared it for the noes. Does it, do you, a division is required. Ring the bells.
lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that motion 204, standing in the name of Senator Smith and as moved by Senator Askew, in order for production of documents in respect to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2023 measures number 1, Bill 2023, schedules 4 and 5, be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair. No, to the left of the chair, I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there have been 26 ayes and 29 noes. It's passed in the negative. We now come to notice of motion 205, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie. Really? Mm. I think it was it was actually Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Mackenzie, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 205 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any, any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being no objection, Senator? I move the motion. The question is that motion No. 205, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie, and is moved by Senator Askew regarding attendance by a Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries and the Organic Market be agreed to. Those of the question say aye. Against no. no. I think the ayes have it. No. Uh, vision required. <laughs> Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the Senate is that notice of motion 205, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie, and moved by Senator Askew regarding the attendance of, by the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, be agreed to. Those the question passed to the right of the chair, no's to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urdekert teller for the noes. Honourable Senators, there being 37 ayes and 14 noes, it's resolved in the affirmative. That completes the placing of business. We now come to matters of public importance and urgency. Senator McKenzie has submitted a proposal under Standing Order 75 today. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I note the proposal is supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. I now give the call to Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Uh, it is uh, my great pleasure to be able to stand and, and support uh, this very, very important, very important motion. Uh, in the Albanese government's first budget last year, my state of Western Australia, my very great state of Western Australia, uh, saw the first budget cuts to infrastructure, the first, no doubt of many, and certainly the first in a long line of budgets, because we had, while we were in government, a very proud record of uh, of, of continuing to invest into the infrastructure needs of, of Western Australia. And uh, we've seen some, some cuts, unfortunately, that, uh, that have hit Western Australia, Western Australia's infrastructure spending. And, uh, and I think it's a great shame. So I, I do take pride today in standing up and, and bringing this to the awareness of the Senate, indeed. Now, this government over there likes to talk the talk in Western Australia. They said that they're going to put WA first. And they ran a very WA-centric campaign. To their credit, they ran a very WA-centric campaign over there. You didn't have Eastern States ads run over in WA, which was a very good move of the, uh, the Labor Party, I've got to say, something that, that we should take uh, a leaf out of in, uh, in the next campaign. I'll be making sure that, uh, uh, that 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 point is made when we're designing our campaign again. But so they, they did they did put it, make a claim that they were going to put WA first. But what we're seeing though is that it's all just talk. So they kinda hoodwink the Australian the West Australian people into supporting them. And you know, West Australian people, sadly, uh, did put a lot of 
strength behind their uh, behind their decision. Uh, they made a decision to, to elect the, the Albanese government, and in Western Australia, uh, we lost a lot of seats as Liberals. And and uh, and it's on the back of the fact that they ran a campaign that said that uh, they were going to put Western Australia first. But what we're seeing is they're not doing that. They haven't done that. Uh, it's across many areas, and in particular in relation to infrastructure. They're all talk and no action. Uh, all up, infrastructure programs in Western Australia saw cuts uh, to over the forward estimates, including $22 million from the Northern Australian Roads Program, $114 million uh, from the Roads of Strategic Importance and $1.3 million from the Road Black Spots Program. So let, let's look at some of these cuts and, and what it represents to the southern suburbs of Perth, where, where I'm from. My office is down in the southern suburbs and I live down in the southern suburbs of Perth. Uh, there's a $17.8 million and completion delay of one year to the Quinana and Mitchell Freeway barrier upgrades. There's a $1.3 million uh, and project commencement delay of, of one year to the Leach Highway and Stock Road grade separation project, very important project to take uh, freight off that uh, very busy intersection and, and to deal with the, have that grade separation. $3.5 million and a project completion delay of two years for the Nicholson Road and Garden Street grade separation and the Electra to Burt. There's a $101 million budget cut from the 2022-23 budget and a $17.8 million in the forward estimates for the Tonkin Highway Stage 3 extension in the seat of Canning. And there's a $99.7 million cut from the Pinjarra heavy haulage deviation stage one and two and project delayed for two years. Now, these are significant projects that were necessary, that were committed to by the previous government and uh, because they're needed. They're needed and we're seeing this government is, is cutting them. These are just a couple of the projects where the Albanese government has made cuts from the last budget and, and or, or put uh, 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 delays that directly impact Western Australians, and it's a shame. West Australians, uh, the West Australian Labor government uh, are not very good at uh, delivering projects. They, they keep delaying them. We saw the, uh, the, the, the airport rail link uh, delayed many, many years. I mean, it actually started under the Barnett government, and now two terms in, they've only li literally just, just completed that project. It was delayed significantly. Uh, now, not to mention, of course, the, the, uh, the, the cancelling of the Row 8 and 9 project. Uh, this is an important. The freight link to, to Fremantle was an absolute, uh, is, is a vital project that has been uh, abandoned by this government. We kept it in the contingent liability when we were in government, and this lot over here have taken it out, and it's a it's a real shame because it means that there was you know there was over 1.8 billion dollars I think it was that was earmarked to be able to go into delivering that project. And this Labor Time government is turning their back on Western Australia. I call to Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I now rise to speak on the matter of public importance raised um, today by Senator um, Mackenzie. And, to, and I will start off by correcting the record because there's infra there has been no infrastructure. Um, cancelled in Western Australia, um, regardless of what you might have uh, understood from that previous, um, um, previous contribution by Senator O'Sullivan. And one of the things that uh, Senator O'Sullivan didn't talk about in his um, contribution was that the Liberals and National Parties left us with a mess to deal with. After nine years, of using infrastructure investment as a political weapon, not as funding critical infrastructure for uh, states and territory, but as their own a political weapon to garner votes. Now, the um, former government spent more time, more time thinking up announcements than addressing the deterioration of the nation's road networks. Now, these are the facts. We now have a motion brought to the Senate by Senator Mackenzie, who is the absolute front to raise concerns after nine years of inaction. The only action they actually uh, did take were 
making announcement after announcement, sometimes multiple announcements on the same um, piece of uh, infrastructure, nine years of using the regional grant programs to fund inner city swimming pools, nine years of drafting and releasing me media releases with no real plans and no real evidence or, or outcomes for um, Australian communities. And as a result, it left an infrastructure pipeline line full of zombie, zombie projects under costed commitments and a challenge to manage delivery in the context of rising inflation and supply pressures. That's the real, that's the real um, situation, and that's what Senator O'Sullivan, in his contribution, um, should have been honest about. That the infrastructure pi pipeline <coughs> left by the Liberal Coalition government after nine years was full of zombie projects under costed commitments and a, chal and a challenge to manage in the co context of uh, rising inflation and supply pressures. Now, there's no better example of the coalition's failures than the hopelessly mismanaged urban congestion fund. And as I've been speaking to the sector um, since I've become an assistant minister, I have to say I, I've lost count of how many times they've talked about the fact that they are so pleased that the urban uh, congestion fund has, um, has killed. been killed. Yeah because it wasn't being used um, in, any, in any fair way. It was being used as the Liberal Party's slush fund. So the urban congestion fund, full of imaginary car parks in marginal seats, projects that would require two or three hundred per cent more investment to actually deliver, and years, years of delay. And I could mention the former Treasurer's commitment of a $260 million um, um, commitment to remove a level crossing in his own electorate without even telling the state government about it. Or, and I, I have to also let the Senate know that it was hundreds of millions of dollars short, short of the actual funding required to do the job. And that is exactly how the former government ran um, the infrastructure in this um, country, was wholly underfunded, mo only uh, used to get votes, only as their own private slush funds, and that's the reality. So after nine years of in in inaction, I'm pleased to say to the Senate Thank that you, the work Senator of the Albanese your, Labor government has already done— Your time has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, the first point I wanted to make about this uh, matter of public interest, which I thought was interesting, was uh, Senator McKenzie uh, talking about uh, roads have been deteriorated and become potholed due to floods and rain events. Um, I just, uh, just before Christmas, I, I drove across Victoria and South Australia and did the Nullarbor myself, and I uh, must admit uh, it was just post the very significant floods in Victoria. And uh, yes, the roads were terrible, and there were roadworks everywhere. It's also what I experienced in uh, northern Queensland after, after uh, record record rains this year. And I, the first point I want to acknowledge is um, climate change is a very big impact on infrastructure and is going to continue to be a very big impact on infrastructure. Um, and the second point I want to make today in my very brief time is the circular economy. Now, um, I've been pinging away at various estimates in, in recent years to Osteros and Infrastructure Australia asking when the government's going to step up and start procuring recycled content for the use in roads. So we spend tens of billions of dollars a year at local, state and federal government level on roads. And um, while not probably the highest value use for recycled product, uh, they certainly do provide uh, a home for recycled products. And if the government was to actually buy uh, recycled products for our roads, then we would have 
create a market for the recycling industry who's telling us they can take uh, soft plastics, for example, like in the Red Cycle scheme. Uh, but the reason they haven't been taking them and recycling them is no one's buying them. No one's buying the product they're creating. So I'll give, give you this as an example, which I put to uh, Infrastructure Australia recently. Sustainability Victoria's website says one particular project, which they put up as a case study, down a soft plastic asphalt road in Craigieburn in Melbourne's north. And as a metric, they talked about recycled content breakdown. Now, every one kilometre of road, which is two lanes, is paved with plastic and glass modified asphalt. It uses approximately, this is one kilometre, 530,000 recycled plastic bags, 170,000 recycled glass bottles, 12,500 used printer cartridges and 130 tonnes of reclaimed asphalt. How's that? That's for one kilometre of road. Now, if we're building thousands of kilometres of road every year and uh, we can use these products, why wouldn't we create a circular economy, um, provide them, the government steps in and provides a market for the recycling industry, gives us the confidence they need to invest in upgrading? Uh, we can actually take these soft plastics from our supermarkets, for our recycling systems, curbside, etc., and we've actually got a ready market for it. That's, that's circular economy thinking. So anyway, the Greens have been pinging away for some time on this. We are starting to see more, uh, more interest uh, from Infrastructure Australia, uh, and I just want to put it on the Senate's table today because I think it's a very exciting opportunity. Thank you, Senator. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, and it is my pleasure to rise and speak on this matter of public importance moved in the Senate today by my friend and colleague, Senator Bridget McKenzie. I'm very pleased to be speaking here today about the neglect of critical infrastructure funding um, as a result of the new government's actions. We know infrastructure investment is absolutely critical for economic development, for productivity, for road safety. And that is why the former coalition government placed such a high priority on investing in infrastructure across the country that we need for the future. And certainly uh, in my first few years in this place, being in the government, it's felt like almost um, every, every week or every month that we're back at home in Tasmania, um, I was going out and talking about a new roads project around the state, whether that was um, more funding for the Midland Highway upgrades, whether it was um, funding the uh, South East traffic solution through to the Southern Beaches and Sorrell. Um, very exciting projects and projects that um, Tasmania needs to ensure that we have the infrastructure, particularly the roads infrastructure for our growing population, for our transit corridors, for our tourism industry to support our economy and our population into the future. Um, and it was my great pleasure to um, be advocating for those projects when we were in government. But in contrast, in its first budget last year, the Albanese government cut more than $9.6 billion from infrastructure programs across the country. And we know that 36 infrastructure projects have been cancelled entirely and many more have been delayed. Um, many of the cancelled and delayed projects are, are dam projects, and there are also huge cuts to road and rail infrastructure programs. And I think that's really disappointing because that is the sort of infrastructure that we need to be investing in in the longer term. And it's no surprise that Labor are cutting infrastructure projects, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, because as we've seen today, uh, their political strategy is always to do deals with the Greens. They've decided that their strategy for their time in government is to side with the most anti-development, anti-jobs and anti-infrastructure party in Australia. So it's no surprise uh, to see them reducing spending on infrastructure. And it's no wonder that they've decided that one of the ways they're going to try and plug holes in their budget is to cancel infrastructure projects and delay infrastructure spending, reprofile infrastructure spending. This is an attitude that is going to put uh, at risk really important projects right across the country. At the very least, uh, it is going to delay the completion of road projects which Australians are relying on to make our highways and our road networks safer and more efficient. In my own state of Tasmania, we have seen the Labor government drop tens of millions of dollars in project funding out of the budget across a number of projects which the coalition funded and was building, some of which I uh, referenced in the first few minutes of my speech here today. 
In government, the coalition made record investments into Tasmanian road and rail infrastructure. More than $4.5 billion was committed by the previous government, including funding the largest infrastructure projects in Tasmanian history. The last budget we handed down included $639 million for Tasmanian infrastructure projects, but in Labor's first budget, in contrast, $66 million of that has disappeared off the books. That includes funding for projects like the Tasmanian Roads Package, the Hobart to Sorrell Corridor, the Freight Capacity Upgrade Program and the Tasman Bridge Upgrades. These are incredibly important projects. They were projects that I was certainly very proud to be um, fighting for in government, and I'm incredibly disappointed to see the funding slipping away under this new government. And there is no doubt that when we get another budget in just a few months, in May this year, we are going to see the same tactic repeated again. If they want to save a few million dollars to plug a hole in the budget, they'll cut projects, they'll push funding from one year out to the next to get it off the books. And of course, when they have finished cutting infrastructure programs to save some dollars, they will come for Australian workers and slug them with more taxes. This is a government which would prefer to be doing deals with the Greens than building infrastructure. And today's dirty deal between Labor and the Greens isn't the first deal they've done which is terrible news for investment in Australia, and I certainly don't think it's going to be the last. We are going to see this again and again and again. Labor and the Greens in a back room stitching up a deal to attack job-creating investments. What we saw today was nothing but was um, the Labor government's agenda rather being announced in a Greens press conference, and nothing could sum up this government better than that. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Stool. Oh yes, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I do wish to make my contribution, unlike some others. I actually got a bit of skin in the game here. I actually know what I'm talking about. Actually, for sins of my previous life, I've had to sit through rat Senate estimates day in, day out, to, to ridiculous hours of the night, listening to all the same questions being regurgitated year in, year out, day in, day out. You get the drift, Madam Acting Deputy President. But I think I'll have a crack without a written speech and see how far I go, shall I? All right? And you won't hear me having to parrot party lines, because unlike some of them over that side, I actually ran my own business. I didn't just come through the system, you know, work for Senator. I like said some, like Thank some, you, I said. Senators. I've actually run my Thank own you, business. Senators. I know what it's like, Madam Deputy President, when you sit there at the end of the table after a hard run to Kununurra or Broome and you're actually exhausted. You get home to see the babies, get home to see the wife, and it's all right for us blokes on the road because all we had to do, that the bill came through the mail. Fiona would go and get the mail. There'd be the tyre bill, there'd be the fuel bill, there'd be the repairs and maintenance from, from Kenworth or there was from Scania or whichever truck out at the time, and there'd be a finger thing there, you know, like the finger with the piece of ribbon tied on it? Remember 30 days, then sometimes remember 45. Oh, I don't know what it's like to sit at the end of the table and think, where are we going to get the next dollar? Where's that next dollar going to come to pay off our debts, to pay the fuel, to pay the tyres, to pay the repairs and maintenance, to pay the, the taxes that we had to pay? All the good stuff that goes with being in business. So on saying that, it's very, very easy, and some of my colleagues over there, particularly Senator Scar, who's, who's been uh, uh, had a lifetime in business and employing people on that, you actually understand you can only spend what you've got. And I'll rephrase that. There's only so long you can go spending what you haven't got until you get caught out. And what worst time have we seen this year? And we'll talk about roads and infrastructure. And I love roads and infrastructure. I love roads for an obvious reason, because we get to drive big trucks on them and deliver freight all around the nation. We bring it in, we take it out. We talk about our agricultural industry, how wonderful it is, and so we should. We talk about our mining industry and how wonderful that is. But the majority of the stuff moved in this nation goes on the back of a truck. We need good roads. Sadly, in this nation, we don't have good roads. But I do know when you start making promises that you cannot keep, there's going to be a problem. And you see, you hear the lines parroted by, by members of the other side that don't know what to talk about, but they've got to fill 15 minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes, and they've got to take one for the team. So they'll go in, they'll say, what's the speaker notes? Give me something to talk about. And then they just go to the lowest common denominator. Now, I've been here a little while, and I've seen the standard of the conversations in this room deteriorate over the years, to the point where I'm embarrassed. We see kids coming through the galleries up here. We see people sitting in the chamber coming to see how this democracy works. And there's nothing wrong with some good, you know, entertaining uh, banter. There's nothing wrong with a 
fierce defence of my ideas versus your, your ideas and the other way around. But the standard in this chamber has absolutely deteriorated over the years. You hear all the same things like, you know, grubby deals, your green mates, and you think, haven't you got something? If you, if you can't make a if you can't make an intelligent conversation or intelligent point in the conversation, tell your whip you're not going to get up there and make a googie yourself. Sit down and leave it to others to put in some good information and put forward some good ideas. So I have to take my good friend Senator Sullivan, and this is the second time today I've been blowing wind up the back of your shirt, because I have a great respect for you, Senator O'Sullivan. But you're only... I can't blame you because you're parroting the lines that's coming from your opposition, your uh, not your opposition, your mate, um, the shadow minister's office, Senator Bridget McKenzie's office, that Labor's slashed $9.6 billion. I had the mispleasure of having to sit in Senate estimates alongside a number of senators here. Senator McKenzie was asking questions and the Canavan and, and talking about all these projects Labor slashed. What Labor did was the grown ups got in. Now, 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 you're not going to like this. But we had Mr Frydenberg and we had Mr Morrison running round the nation, announcing project after project after project in infrastructure. And I'd love to be able to make stuff up, but you've got to pay for it. Nothing was slashed. There were projects that were unfunded. There were projects that the state governments hadn't even agreed on. There was projects that there was no plans for, and quite rightfully so. The grown-ups have got, whoa, hang on, we've got to get infrastructure in this nation, but we've got to have the ability to pay for it. We've got to have the ability to have contractors that can provide the staff to do it. And we've got to, whether Mr Morrison liked it or not, you actually got to get agreement from the state governments and the local governments. I don't blame you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator McKenzie set you up for a four. Senator Hanson. I rise, to <clears throat> I rise to speak in support of this matter. One of the best investments the government can make is in the infrastructure needed to support future prosperity. However, this government has shown its contempt for regional Australia and slashed almost $10 billion from vital nation-building projects. Last week, I met with representatives from the Doomagee and Berkshire councils affected by the floods in northern Queensland. They are having helicopters fly in supplies at $40,000 per trip because they have been cut off by floods for two months. They desperately need $75 million to raise crossings and bridges outside Burke, Doomagee and Mount Isa, which will secure their communities' links with the rest of Australia. Labor must prioritise infrastructure as a long-term investment, supporting regional Australian communities over useless measures like increasing the foreign aid budget by $241 million to more than $4.5 billion. This must include projects like the $5.4 billion Hellsgate Dam in North Queensland, which Labor scrapped in the budget. The, there were substantial benefits from this project, more than 10,000 jobs during construction, contributing about $1.3 billion to the local economy, more than 3,000 ongoing jobs, up to 60,000 hectares of new irrigated land producing a diverse range of high-value projects worth at least $800 million per year and up to $6 billion per year contributed to the local economy. It is nation-building, wealth-creating projects like these which must be prioritised by the government to give regional areas like North Queensland the chance to thrive. And I will continue to keep pushing for the Bradfield scheme that will give water security to Australia. But that makes too much sense for the brain dead politicians in this place. Senator Cadell. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This government and their New South Wales colleagues are intent on slashing and burning funding in regional New South Wales, my home state. It's no wonder when Labor's camp own campaign bus can't leave Sydney without having a flat battery to go flat. Not only can they not represent us, they won't even visit us. When this Labor government was elected, last year they did cut, and I thank Senator Stirl for reminding us, $9.6 billion from the infrastructure projects. Now, what does that mean to regional Australia? There was $7 billion just cut from dams across the estimates, including two New South Wales major dams at Dungowan and Wyangla. These vital water storage projects that secure essential water supply for our regional communities have been gutted. The communities around them are gutted and the, the ability to plan for the future destroyed. What is more concerning, Mr President, is that we know that Labor and New South Wales Labor doesn't care about New South Wales regional uh, areas either. These people are all about cost-benefit ratios or CBRs. And where there aren't people, 
they don't stack up. When we put money there, it's called a rort or a waste. But it's a chicken and the egg. If you don't build the roads, if you don't build the infrastructure, if you don't build these things, people can't go there. And in COVID, we saw people move to the regions. They move for lifestyles. They move for tree chains. They move for sea chains. They realised they could have a better life outside of cities. But housing supply was tight, infrastructure wasn't there, and they have moved back. If you spend this money in regional areas, they will come. We have regions of dreams, not fields of dreams, in our country. Thanks, Build it and they will come. But this government, they cut, they delay and they rip the hearts out of uh, regional communities. And it is important to expose the legacy of this federal government after just nine months in office because it is a foretaste of what the t ten months, sorry, even worse, the uh, people of New South Wales can expect under the new uh, Premier Chris Minns and Labor. Now, of course, we're used to, and we'll see this in New South Wales, Labor saying one thing before the election and do something else after the election. And it's not just inf infrastructure. We've seen it across all things. I'm sure senators of the Greens Party see the promises were made in the green areas that haven't come through after the election. We're seeing that in super. We're seeing that in energy prices. And it's because regional Australia doesn't vote for you because they see through you. It's because Labor doesn't understand our communities and when the promises come down to Labor, the regions and the bush is expendable. It is a cost of doing business regional infrastructure. But it just doesn't affect national party seats. Labor party seats, I'm looking in um, Dan Repicoli's seat in Hunter, Minister, uh, member for Hunter. Here's a great road, a great business waiting to open up in Mandalong Road. Lake Macquarie Council is Labor mayor, Labor seat. That funding is unsure of going forward to open up huge potential in that area under this budget. And so what we see is more of the same. We experience, of, and I now say 10 months under this, we are going to get the same in New South Wales. What does that mean across Western Highway? Well, the Liberals and Nationals understand how critical the Great Western Highway is to upgrade the Central West to get that pathway through to open up freight lines, to open up potential businesses, to open up so many things. It's a project that has been spoken of for decades and its ability to transform travel for thousands of people and tens of millions of, of dollars worth of business. But again, the Labor campaign bus never made it that far, so they've never seen what it's going to do. The federal government and the state gov uh, the last federal government and the last state government promised to commit to that Great Western Highway Tunnel as an essential piece of nation building. But the weekend's result has ended 20 years of progress on this vital upgrade. Labor has promised to scrap the tunnel and is not prepared to invest in the big infrastructure projects that keep the state going. It's becoming clear that day after day that Labor will not build the infrastructure our regional Australia and regional New South Wales leads. New South Wales Labor built nothing for 16 years when they were last in office, and now they have won election, they will go back to doing what they are doing. We've seen this government already slash and burn regional programs and projects all over New South Wales with a growing list of broken promises. At the last election, the slogan was, it won't be easy under Albanese, now Prime Minister. We've seen mortgage holders and superannuates know that the statement has been proved right. To, that New South, to the new New South Wales government, I say, do the right thing, keep New South Wales, uh, regional New South Wales moving, because next time under the state election, I think it will be nobody wins under Chris Minns. Thank you. The time for discussion has expired. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator McKim, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. I move the matter of urgency standing in Senator McKim's name. In recent weeks, we've seen reports from ACOS and analysis by Anti-Poverty Week confirming that poverty and homelessness are disproportionately impacting women and children. This is a crisis and it demands an urgent response. We know that women make up more than 60 per cent of those relying on the lowest income support payments. We know that women and girls make up more than 60 per cent of clients of homelessness services last year. We know that rental prices are skyrocketing 
and that the fastest growing people at risk of homelessness are women over the age of 45. Across the country, people are living in tents and cars. And we know that all these risks are compounded for women and children leaving abusive relationships. Women are given an impossible choice, stay in an unsafe home or leave and put themselves and their kids at the mercy of a system of inadequate support, stretched DV services, housing shortages and punitive income tests. I spoke last week in support of a bill to help close the gender pay gap in workplaces. And as I said at the time, that is critical, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. We cannot address economic inequality without looking beyond work and reviewing our approach to income support, to housing and to unpaid care work. The job seeker rate is too low. Ausstudy is too low. Pension rates are too low. Parenting payments are too low. In a wealthy country, there is absolutely no excuse for keeping income support below the poverty line, and there is certainly no excuse for keeping the most vulnerable in poverty while offering tax cuts to the wealthiest Australians. At a forum last week, we heard from single mum mums struggling to make ends meet. Brave mums Jacinta, Aradia and Angela talked about how their already strained budget was stretched to breaking point once their youngest child turns eight. At a time when it's getting more expensive to feed kids, to meet their public school fees, to pay for sports, to pay for braces and basic health care, that's when single mums are getting punted from parenting payments single onto the even lower job seeker rate, losing around $200 a fortnight. This could mean missing a rental or a mortgage payment. For Angela, it meant possibly losing her home and genuine fear that she would not be able to keep a roof over her kids' heads. It could mean putting off their own doctor's appointment to make sure the kids can eat. For one mum, her own disability needs took second place to make sure her disabled son could get the help he needed. It could mean putting further study on hold because they need to take on ex extra shifts to make ends meet. For Jacinta, further study would have helped her get higher paid work, but she had to defer completing the course for years after the drop in income support made it impossible to continue. I was encouraged to hear Sam Mostyn say that the Women's Economic Equality Task Force has advised the government to focus on the needs of women in the most precarious situations. They should start by reversing the terrible decision of the Gillard government to cut off parenting payments single when kids turn eight. Doing so would cost $1.4 billion, a fraction of a fraction of the stage three tax cuts and the AUKUS spending, but it would be life-changing for 500,000 single mums and their kids. Cost of living rises, housing shortages and the ongoing national crisis of gendered violence demand urgent action. The upcoming budget is the government's chance to start turning this around. Raise the rate. Restore parenting payments single. Invest in housing. Fully fund, fully fund frontline domestic violence services. Scrap the stage three tax cuts and the billions for submarines and fund the things that will actually help the people who need it. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm very pleased to rise in this place to speak against uh, this resolution. The first point we need to note, the first point we need to note is that there are millions of Australians, millions of Australians who are going to benefit from the stage three tax cuts. This notion that it's just the billionaires at the top end of town who are going to benefit, benefit from the stage three tax cuts is simply false. It's simply false. Let me give you some examples. A hairdresser earning $60,000 a year will benefit by $400 every year from these stage three tax cuts. A teacher earning $70,000 a year will benefit by $620 each year from these tax cuts. An executive assistant earning $80,000 a year will benefit $900 each year from these tax cuts. A scientist earning $90,000 a year will benefit $1,120 each year from the tax cuts. A qualified diesel mechanic earning hundred grand a year would lose more than $1,370 a year, $1,370 a year if this Greens resolution was accepted. So these are ordinary, hard-working Australians who are benefiting from these stage three tax cuts. And the fact of the matter is, in Australia, we have a progressive income tax system, as we should have. As we should have. The more you earn, the more tax you should pay. Absolutely. And let me just give you an, a, an insight with respect to 
the pro how progressive our tax system is. Someone earning $200,000 a year pays eight times more tax than someone earning $50,000 a year. Now that's appropriate. That's appropriate. That's a progressive tax system. 60 per cent, 60 per cent of the personal income tax cut, personal income tax received by the government, 60 per cent is provided by the top 20 per cent of earnings, earners. Again, that's a progressive income tax system, as it should be. And in fact, the top 5 per cent of earners contribute 33 per cent of the personal income tax receipts of the federal government. Again, that is a progressive tax system. But when you have, when you have 7 per cent, 8 per cent inflation, you need to move, you need to move the tax thresholds. You need to move the tax thresholds, or else everyone, those people, the hairdresser, the teacher, the executive assistant, the research scientist, the qualified diesel mechanic, are all moving into higher tax thresholds. So you have to adjust. You have to adjust the tax thresholds. That makes basic common sense. Absolutely basic common sense. The other point I want to make about this, and this is an important point, the government went to the last election with a promise. The government went to the last election with a promise that they would stay true to the stage three tax cuts, which I voted for in this place before the last federal election. The government made that promise. The Greens, through this resolution, are asking the government to break their promise. Where's the integrity in that? Where's the integrity in that? The government, at the last election, went to the people and got a mandate, which I acknowledge and respect, on the basis they would deliver those stage three tax cuts. The Greens now come into this place. The Greens now come into this place, require, putting a resolution that the government should break their promise to the Australian people. Is that integrity? Is that integrity? Where's the integrity in that? The same integrity, the same lack of integrity. The same lack of integrity where before the last federal election the Greens said that their plan was fully costed and fully funded. That's what they said. That's what they said to voters in my home state of Queensland, that their plan was fully funded and costed. That's what they said. You know what was released after the last federal election? The Parliamentary Budget Office, which monitors election commitments, did a study, did a study on the Greens' promises before the last federal election. Were they fully funded and costed? No. No. And you don't have to take my word for it that the Greens misled the people of Queensland. The Greens misled the people of Queensland. The Parliamentary Budget Office, in their analysis of election commitments, this isn't Senator Scar, this is the Parliamentary Budget Office, in their analysis of the Greens' promises found that introduction of Greens policies that were supposedly fully funded and costed would result in the headline cash balance in the budget deteriorating by $112 billion. $112 billion. The Greens said, the Greens said, and they don't like hearing it, the Greens don't like hearing about their broken promise, how they misled the people of Queensland. The Greens said their policies were fully funded and costed, but the Parliamentary Budget Office, it's here in writing, said the Greens' policies would lead to a deterioration in the cash balance in the budget by $112 billion. A broken promise. Senator White. Acting Deputy President, it's true, it's true that the current rate of homelessness in Australia is too high. We saw in the census data reported last week that almost 123,000 Australians are experiencing homelessness. We also know that women on low incomes in the age group of 55 and older are the, are the most at risk of homelessness and have been for at least the last five years. We know that, that women and children who are fleeing domestic, family and domestic violence don't have enough secure housing. And so it is is often those who are the most vulnerable that are forced to turn to the street or to live in their cars. We also saw just a few weeks ago in the Closing the Gap statement that First, Australia, First Nations Australians continue to struggle with long-term and stable housing. Issues of overcrowding, lack of supply and housing that doesn't meet the needs and requirements of these communities is still a problem. Put together, these facts are a concerning snapshot of the current state of homelessness in Australia. Our government wants to ensure that every Australian has the security that comes with having a roof over their head. Because when you have a stable and secure housing, you've got a better chance economically, and getting a job is way easier than when you, when you have a home. 
Having safe and stable housing is a gateway to, a better, to better social outcomes across a whole range of life's important measures. And the Albanese government knows that this is the case. That is why we've, we introduced the Housing Australia Future Fund Bill. The legislation backs in a long-term funding strategy to build social and affordable housing and homes in Australia. A $10 billion investment which will deliver tens of thousands of better homes for those who need them. Th 30,000 homes, in fact. 4,000 of these will be allocated to women and children that I mentioned before who are most at risk. The women who are fleeing family and domestic violence and need a place to call home. The women who are over the age of 55 and living dangerously close to the precipice of homelessness. On, to on top of that, the Future Fund will build 10,000 homes for frontline workers. There will also be $200 million to improve and repair housing in remote Indigenous communities. These are the people who are at risk of becoming homeless homeless and the people who are homeless. They are the Australians who live on the edge and they are the people that Labor's housing fund will help, if only the Greens in this place would support it. We know that there is a huge demand for social and affordable homes in Australia, but no single level of government can solve these problems on its own. We need to work together, local, state and federal governments. That's why the Albanese government is recommitting to fund a $67 million to boost, uh, a boost uh, to is committing a fund of $67 million to boost states and territories through the National Housing and Homelessness Plan, which will secure hundreds of homelessness support jobs. These are the social workers and housing support workers that we need to attract and retain in the homelessness sector, because often it is only those workers who stand between a young family and that family becoming homeless. At the Australian Services Union, I work with these workers. The jobs they do are vital and important, and they daily work with those most at risk. What they tell me is that they need more housing stock. For them, there is nothing more demoralising than being forced to give someone facing homelessness a tent and sending them on their way. This is not just a story from one location. It is a story I've heard across Australia from many homelessness services for a very long time. So I'm proud of what the government is doing to make housing more secure and affordable for Australians and to tackle the issue of homelessness by getting more homes built more quickly. The Greens political party have been out campaigning against the government's plan to ease this problem, but if the Greens want to, to see more investment in social and affordable housing, if they really want to achieve something rather than just attempting to wedge the government, then they should support the Housing Australia Future Fund. If you want to make a difference, the Greens political party would stop politicising Labor's $10 billion investment and act. I can't imagine standing in the way of this legislation. And it's a similar story for the coalition. We have just experienced a dec decade of inaction on homelessness policy and saw the problem just get worse on the co coalition's watch. There was no leadership for the states, no long-term plan. And now when the Liberal and National parties have a chance to do something about it and support these reforms, they say no. Well, I believe it's time to support the largest contribution to social and affordable housing by a federal government in more than a decade and to celebrate it for the massive reform that it is. The Greens political party and the coalition would do well to put politics aside and rem remember these lines from a poem by John Howard Payne. Mid pleasures and palaces, though we may roam, be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The 2021 census showed the number of women experiencing homelessness increased by 10.1 per cent. We know that one in four women and children fleeing violence are not getting the accommodation support they need. We clearly need more social and affordable housing, which brings us to the half. Under the current proposal, the government will spend at best $500 million a year on new social and affordable housing supply. That's 30,000 social and affordable houses over five years. Translate to the ACT, that to the ACT, that's at best 540 houses. At the same time, the ACT is set to lose over 2,000 NRAS properties, 2,000 affordable rentals. But don't worry, we're going to get 540 social and affordable homes. Let's compare the $10 billion uh, off-budget fund uh, that will hopefully return $500 million to what the government spends subsidising investment properties through generous tax concessions. $23.7 billion in revenue foregone on capital gains ca tax discounts for individuals such as property investors and for, and for trusts. 
tax benefits of around $3.6 billion in 2019-20 through negative gearing. Even the Medical Research Future Fund sits at $21 billion, disperses more, more annually than the, half, than the half will. Then we've got the $250 billion stage three tax cuts. My community has made it clear to me that they expect these stage three tax cuts to be redesigned to deal with, with the big issues we face. Australians are sick of these issues being politicised by the major parties at the expense of all of us. Let's make decisions that are good for all Australians in our future. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I too rise to speak on the urgency motion moved by Senator McKim, and I thank the Senator for raising this issue because I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk about the importance of social housing and our government's commitment to it and the urgency of addressing the poverty, homelessness and, and violence affecting women and how we intend to go about funding it. Every Australian deserves the security of having a roof over their head, and too many do not have that security. Too many are battling homelessness. Too many are trapped in unsafe homes because they have no alternative, and too many are suffering extreme rental insecurity. And that is exactly why we are working hard to make the biggest single Commonwealth investment in social and affordable housing in a decade. The biggest single investment in a decade. There is no time to waste in getting more housing built, and the urgency of this situation is clear. So if senators want to see more investment in social housing, the opportunity is right in front of them. The $10 billion Housing Australia Future Fund is an ambitious bill. The Future Fund is how we intend to fund tens of thousands of additional houses for low-income people. In just its first five years, returns from the fund will help deliver 30,000 new social and affordable homes. This is in addition to existing housing and homelessness funding. In addition to that, this is a massive injection that Australians desperately need. And we know that women, particularly older women, are at greater risk of experiencing homelessness. That's why this fund will include 4,000 homes for women and children impacted by violence and older women at risk of homelessness. It will also specifically invest $100 million into crisis and transitional housing options for these vulnerable Australians. This is also in addition to the National Plan to End Violence Against Women. At the Economics Committee's recent hearings into the bill, um, which Senator McKim attended, we heard about the urgency of getting this done from almost everyone who came and submitted to the inquiry. Housing experts who came to our inquiry described the reforms as, and I quote, absolutely urgent, transformative, critical, and a timely reassertion of national leadership on housing. Advocates said further, and I quote again, we need to start building immediately and, quote, this is a significant and much needed new investment. This is actually about certainty, not just for the sector that builds homes, but also for the vulnerable Australians who need action right now. Again, this is a new funding stream. It is an additional funding stream. It is for additional social and affordable homes. It is the big, biggest single investment from the Commonwealth in over a decade. Um, and there is no time to waste. Um, we are making this commitment after a decade of disinvestment and disinterest from the opposition. Um, only this month, the Leader of the Opposition said that, and I quote, social housing is a responsibility of state government. We disagree. Again, it's why we're making the biggest single injection of funds in over a decade. Under the last government, affordable and social housing was smashed. Those opposite, they refused to take any responsibility. Well, we are taking action. We are showing leadership rather than passing the buck to the states. And the Greens are siding with those opposite. The Greens are siding with those who refuse to make this kind of investment over the last decade. The best way to see immediate action is to vote in favour of the Housing Australia Future Fund. We know that the Noalition is going to stand against this huge investment that the country desperately needs. But the Greens standing against 30,000 additional Commonwealth social and affordable homes, it is extraordinary. 
We expect that from the Liberals. We all know that. They are the people that we know turn away from people in need. We know it's in their DNA. They prefer to just let people slip through the cracks. Again, if the Greens want to see more people get a home, they should support the legislation that is actually in front of the parliament. Again, this is the single biggest injection of Commonwealth funding in social and affordable housing in a decade. And you know, Senator McKim, through you, Deputy uh, Chair, Acting Deputy President, that this is the biggest injection of funds in addition to the funding that is already there for social and affordable housing. This is a long-term sustainable model that the sector wants and that people who need a home need, and I urge you to support it. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It's the biggest injection of funds into the stock market um, from the government that I've seen uh, for some time. And I make the point that if you'd made uh, the investment that you're proposing to make um, last year, then you'd be $120 million down yep. on your investment. Uh, the idea that uh, bunging money into the stock market is a good platform to build more uh, public housing and more social housing uh, just goes to show how far into the minds of the Labor Party their neoliberal brainworms have eaten. Um, I mean, I know this is a radical thought, but perhaps if you want to build more public or social housing, just build more public or social housing. Like, this is not rocket science. Um, acting Deputy President. But what I can say is that um, far too many Australians are living in poverty at the moment and far too many Australians don't have a home. And both of those massive social problems are the result of political choices that have been made in this country. And over the last 10 years or so, those political pro choices were made by the Liberal National Party, but now uh, we have the same political choices or very similar choices and very similar political priorities being expressed by the new Labor government. And of course, of those Australians who are living in poverty and who are homeless, uh, women are disproportionately represented. And we know that it is single mums and kids that are particularly vulnerable to things like poverty and homelessness and who pay some of the highest price for poverty and homeless of any Australians. And that's why, when this government is proposing to spend a quarter of a trillion dollars on the stage three tax cuts, where 80 per cent of the benefits go to the top 20 per cent of income, to income earners, and when they are proposing to spend $368 billion on nuclear submarines that will make this country a more dangerous place to live, that's when we see the stark reality of the political choices that the Australian Labor Party is making. And I want to say to Labor members, how are you going to ever ever again look an Australian in the eye who needs government help and tell them that you can't afford to help them? How are you ever, ever going to be able to do that again? And of course, you won't be able to do it again because you can afford to help them. It's just that your choices won't allow you to help them because you are more interested in tax cuts for billionaires and more interested in spending 368 billion dollars on nuclear submarines that not only do we not need, but that will make this country a more dangerous place to live. The light on the hill, uh, acting Deputy President, has been flickering for some time. It is guttering away, uh, blowing in the breeze of neoliberalism and arguably has either gone out or is about to go out. How is it possible that we are talking about stage three tax cuts for the top end when the Labor Party refuses to raise income support for people who are starving on JobSeeker? How is it possible that we are living in this country? Well, it's possible because that's the choice that this current government has made. People voted for change. They're Order. not getting Senator it. Senator McKim, your time's expired. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. 
I thank Senator McKim for raising this urgency motion, but I cannot agree with his proposal to increase taxes on hard-working Australians. The legislated stage three tax cuts must proceed. And I'll go even further, even further, and I'll propose that the government reduce taxes on lower and middle income earners as well. Now I know those opposite sometimes or often like to pretend that they can play the role of Robin Hood. And I know that they do this with the best of intentions, but in reality they are just accessories to the crime of theft by taxation. More taxes will not sol solve any of our nation's social or financial issues. Socialism fails every time and everywhere. It appears easier to just blame the rich than it is to work hard, take risks and grow one's wealth. We must not forget that in our nation it is the top 3.6 per cent of earners who disproportionately pay more than 31 per cent of taxation revenue. One does not become wealthy by chance. It requires hard work, dedication and risk. Lots of risk. And if we want our nation to prosper, we must encourage entrepreneurship. Instead of taking money out of the pockets of Australian families, government should be responsible and get out of the way of hard-working Australians and their families. They could start with policies like income splitting, allowing families to split their incomes, pay less tax and spend more time with their precious children. There'd be less reliance upon taxpayer subsidies and far more stability in the family home. Increasing welfare is not the answer. Reducing taxation, red tape and green tape, there's your answer. Socialism doesn't work, it's never worked, and it will not help anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Babbitt. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. The stage three tax cuts are going to cost the budget bottom line $254 billion over the next decade. $254 billion is a lot of money. There is so much that this government could do with $254 billion instead of pissing it into the wind with the stage three tax cuts. It can be hard to comprehend just how much $254 billion is, so I want to list some of the other things that the government could do with $254 billion instead of giving it in tax cuts to the ultra-wealthy. For $88.7 billion, we could raise the rate of job seeker to $88 a day, above the poverty line, and make a huge difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people across the country. People like the amazing Mike and Liz from Wagga Wagga, who are struggling to raise a family on the inadequate income support rate. When job seeker was raised above the poverty line during, with the COVID supplement, you know what they were able to do? They were able to get new pyjamas and new jumpers coming into, wi into winter. They got their car registered and they didn't have to borrow money. These are the sorts of absolutely basic things that you increase the rate of income support, it makes a massive difference to people's lives. For $69 billion, we could raise the rate of youth and student allowance above the poverty line and allow young people like Bella Mitchell Sears, who is recently in touch with my office, actually stay studying. She had to quit her university degree last year because the rate of student allowance did not allow her to live. She wanted to keep studying, but instead she had to quit to go out and find a job just in order to keep afloat. For $73 billion, we could raise the rate of DSP so that people have to, didn't have to decide whether to pay for their medications, pay to eat or pay, to, or pay the rent. For $90.8 billion, we could make childcare free for all parents and caregivers. And $1.4 billion a year, a fraction, a fraction of the stage three tax cuts would mean that we could reinstate the parenting payment single so that when kids turn eight, people, can still able, um, people are still able to survive and to keep their families together. $50 billion over the next um, 10 years would fund hundreds of thousands of affordable homes and actually clear the waiting lists 
of, our, of, of public housing and actually properly tackle the, the housing crisis. Yes, the things that I've lifted, listed there actually do add up to more than $254 billion. But if you add in the $368 billion for nuclear submarines, you can actually fund all of this. There Order, is absolutely Senator no Rice, doubt. Your time has expired. I will now put the question, and the question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to, all those of, or Senator McKim? Senator McKim be agreed to. My apologies. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors.
The question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator O'Sullivan, teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division is ayes 10, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Oh, Senator Roberts, sorry, were you seeking the call on for the documents? Documents, oh, yep. Very good. Senator Roberts. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. I take note of the Auditor General's report for 2022 to 2023, specifically item number one, number 16, Performance Audit Management of Migration to Australia, Family Migration Program, Department of Home Affairs, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Are there any other senators wishing to? Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of the report by the Auditor General on the management of migration to Australia, uh, specifically the family reunion program. And uh, this is an important report on the family reunion program uh, that's been tabled in the Senate. This morning, and the Australian Greens welcome any analysis of Australia's very dysfunctional family reunion visa system. We do note that the Auditor General made six recommendations in this report, all of which the Department of Home Affairs has agreed to. But critically, this was more of a technical report that focused on performance and impact measurement, <clears throat> policy and program design and governance and risk management. Uh, what the report didn't address was uh, the elephant in the room, which is quotas and the backlogs and wait times they, are, they create. What Australia needs is a family reunion visa system that is faster, that is fairer and that is more affordable. Now, in February this year, the Greens welcomed the government's decision to scrap ministerial directions 80 and 83, and uh, that will provide for uh, the processing of applications for family reunion visas from refugees who arrived in Australia by boat, or at least the more timely uh, processing of those applications. But what that means in real terms is that instead of being kept at the bottom of the family reunion visa queues, people who arrived in Australia uh, by boat to seek asylum now get to move in those queues at the same glacial pace that everyone else gets to move. And it is beyond shameful 
that in some classes of family reunion visas, people are waiting literally for decades to have their visas approved. The current wait time, for example, uh, for a remaining relative visa is about 50 years. 50 years, colleagues. 50 years, five decades to wait for a remaining relative visa. Parent visas currently take about 30 years on average to process. Or if you're wealthy and you can afford the $100,000 if you've got two parents to jump the queue by payment of $50,000 each, you're waiting about five years for a parent visa. I mean, these are extraordinary waiting times. Even partner visas can now take over two years to process. Now, in the previous parliament, the Greens initiated a Senate inquiry into Australia's family reunion system, and the Labor chair of that committee uh, in the report uh, drafted by the chair and adopted by the committee acknowledged the problems inherent in the system and called for a review of Australia's family reunion system to improve efficiencies, to reduce complexities, to re substantially reduce waiting times and to provide greater transparency for applicants. The Greens, in our additional comments to the report, made a further 11 practical recommendations that the department could implement to achieve those objectives. But to date, we have not seen the action necessary from the current government. Our family reunion visa system causes social and economic exclusion. It disproportionately impacts women. It disproportionately impacts low-income families, and it disproportionately impacts families with children living across multiple countries. We need a family reunion visa system that is faster, fairer, and more affordable, one that actually reunites families rather than one that keeps families apart. So what's Labor going to do is the question. The most recent budget provided no comfort at all for people who are waiting for significant reform in this area. And with all signs pointing at an austerity budget looming, uh, the Greens have no confidence that we are going to see the action necessary in this budget. While I'm at it, we should remove discriminatory tests in Australia's visa system, including tests that leave uh, so many people who are disabled at risk of, uh, of exclusion from our country, along with our families. It's time for change. Thank you, Senator McKim. Could I ask you to seek leave to continue your remarks I do as seek, well? I do seek that leave. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Deputy Senator President. McKim. If there are no further speakers on the single document for today, uh, we will move to ministerial statements. Are there any? Senator Brown. Uh, I table documents relating to the orders for the production of documents concerning the resignation of the Freedom of Information Commissioner and the GST. There being no senators wishing to speak to that ministerial statement, I'll move on to pass I'm in the hands of the Senate. Did any were there no senators wishing to speak to that ministerial statement? Senator O'Sullivan. If we just wanted some guidance, if we wanted to, can we seek leave to continue our remarks on that, or is that not necessary? I don't, I don't think that's possible. Sorry, um, under the standing order, Senator O'Sullivan. So we will move on. There are no committee. Oh, so, um, Senator Shoebridge. Um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Greens supported this order for the production of documents because we were deep, deeply troubled. We were deeply troubled by the circumstances within which the Commissioner resigned. And we were troubled that there was so little transparency from the government about the circumstances of the resignation of the, FO of the FOI Commissioner only 12 months into a multi-year appointment, 
uh, in circumstances where the FOI commissioner had expressed in budget estimates the efforts he was making to try and resolve a, an incredible backlog, a growing backlog of FOI requests and FOI reviews, some of them dating back five years, and not one or two, but dozens and dozens and dozens dating back five years. And what was clear was the FOI commissioner had been trying to fix some of that internally in the office, working with the um, seeking to work with the department, and it would appear also the Attorney General's department and the Attorney General and the Attorney General's office, and had hit a brick wall. Absolutely hit a brick wall. And this is the Attorney General who, when in opposition, repeatedly railed against the lack of resourcing to this office and repeatedly said the delays were bad for democracy and repeatedly called on it being fixed. We, now he's in a position to do it. And not quite 12 months into the Attorney General, the new Attorney General, nothing has changed. In fact, things have got worse because Commissioner Hardiman resigned in frustration about nothing changing. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we had the call for papers. I'm concerned about the extent to which that will have been responded to, but I'm hopeful it's a full response. But let's be clear. What's required here is, yes, return the documents, but it's for the government to resource the office, to provide the funds for the Freedom of Information Act to actually work. At the moment, starving the office of funds, so reviews are five years, five years late, thousands and thousands and thousands of re reviews are years late, means we have freedom from information, not freedom of information at a Commonwealth level. And we were told by this Attorney General that he'd come in as a big reformer and fix it, but nothing's changed. In fact, the delays have got worse, they've got longer. And the place is in such a shambles that the Commissioner resigned in disgust. That's the truth of the matter. Well, there's a solution to this. Fund the office. Fund freedom of information. Walk the walk, don't just talk the talk. The attorney said, the now attorney said in opposition, the funding needs to happen, we need freedom of information. Well, let's see a direct budget commitment to double the funding of this office to actually get rid of the backlog, a, a targeted spend on the backlog and a commitment that going forward we actually will have freedom of information laws. And I say this to Mr Hardiman, to, to former Commissioner Hardiman. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you for trying to fix the thing internally. And on behalf of the Greens, we're sorry that it didn't work. But we need more public servants of commitment and integrity who are willing to say that when they're hitting roadblock after roadblock from the government of the day, that they're not just going to sit there and, and and take a salary and pretend that things can be fixed, but are actually going to take a moment of principle and say, actually, do you know what? I won't be part of this. And call it out in the best way you can, in this case from Mr Hardiman, saying, I won't be part of this, I'm resigning, I'm not going to be part of the problem. So this is an invitation to the attorney to heed the call of Commissioner Hardiman and to commit to being part of the solution. Uh, the question is that the Senate take note of the ministerial statement. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. <laughs> I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Um, messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Education Legislation Amendments Start-up Year and Other Measures Bill 2023 for concurrence. I call the Minister, Senator Brown. I move that this bill may be proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation in relation to education and research and for related purposes. Minister. 
Thank you. I table a revised explanatory mem memorandum relating to the bill and move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansart. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with Standing Order 111, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to the 9th of May 2023. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Mr Chester to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. That being the extent of the messages from the House, I'll call the clerk to call on business. Clerk. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Roberts, relating to a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee. I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. I seek leave to amend business of the Senate motion, a notice of motion number two, relating to a referral to the Foreign Affairs and Defence and Trade References Committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. I amend the motion as set out on the revised amendment circulated in the chamber. Senator Roberts, you may now speak to the motion. I move the motion as amended. As a servant of the many different people who make up our one Queensland community, I want to read out the amended motion because I want the provisions in, in the Hansard that the following matter be referred to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee for inquiry and report by the 1st of December 2023. That'll give plenty of time for consideration in detail. The World Health Organization's Pandemic Treaty, also known as the Pandemic Prevention Preparedness and Response Accord, with reference to the conceptual zero draft of the Pandemic Treaty and any other draft of the Pandemic Treaty. Australia's input to the drafting and negotiating process for the Pandemic Treaty. The principles of Australian autonomy in responding to health crises and pandemics, the effect of proposals contained in the pandemic treaty and any other related matters. I note that when one of the world's most influential people, someone famous for valuing the liberty and sovereignty of human existence, makes a comment about the risks that United Nations World Health Organization's pandemic treaty poses, it's worth listening to. In response to my video of my Senate speech last week criticising the proposed increased health powers of the pandemic treaty, Elon Musk said, quote, countries should not cede authority to the World Health Organization, end of quote. Regardless of what you think of Elon Musk, he's one of a handful of people invited into the global backrooms of power. He knows better than anyone sitting in this chamber what the world looks like when the press aren't watching. So threatened as a result of this comment was the Director General of the World Health Organization, Tedros Ghebreyesus, that he felt the need to reply to this tweet. Perhaps four million impressions and 1.2 million plays of my speech got his attention. Tedros is a man that no sensible Australian would want anywhere near the health response of this nation, not least because of his prominent role as a terrorist in a violent Marxist political party with a track record of using health care as a political weapon. In his reply to my speech in this, in this chamber three weeks ago, Tedros failed to address the key point that I was making. That key point is that 83 World Health Organization staff were found to have committed rape and sexual exploitation of women in the Congo, some women as young as 13. Who made that finding? The World Health Organization's own investigators. Those investigators went on to say that UN WHO to take any, must take any action against their staff. If they failed to take any action against their staff, it meant that the World Health Organization was rotten with rapists. Quote, rotten with rapists. Tedros deliberately ignored that part of my speech, so I can only assume those rapists will remain employed in the UN World Health Organization and free to commit further crimes. The World Health Organization really is rotting from the head. Tedros only replied on the issue of sovereignty, which I briefly mentioned. So now let's discuss that in detail, sovereignty. Tedros insists that countries aren't ceding sovereignty to the World Health Organization and that the pandemic treaty won't change the sovereignty of member states. It is, he promises, simply a device to help countries better guard against pandemics. Oh, really? 
And yet the United Nations World Health Organization's advice already achieves that. So why go to all this trouble of a three-year development cycle for a treaty that doesn't change anything? Here's the case that te suggests Tedros is deliberately misleading the public about what the World Health Organization are doing. Remember, this is out in the open. All these documents and statements are available on the World Health Organization website. The zero draft, they had to come up with a new number because the, the first draft was an embarrassment. The zero draft of the treaty clearly shows this is not an agreement about passive advice. The pandemic treaty, despite Tedros's lies on Twitter, proposes to hold the same authority as all other United Nations treaties. It is a set of instructions that nations, corporations and individuals scripted. People and organisations who have their own interests at heart, not the health, safety and welfare of the Australian people. Included in the pandemic treaty are the powers to enforce mandatory de detention, compulsory vaccination, lockdowns, forced medical procedures, vaccine passports, vaccine prisons really, closed borders and generally all the worst parts of the global gross COVID deceit and mismanagement. Australia could be locked down and its people medicated without public consent with no democratic mechanism to reprimand violations of civil liberty. None. Every country is different. Bespoke solutions are essential. The World Health Organization cannot maintain 195 bespoke solutions. It will take the bureaucrats' easy way out. One size fits all. The World Health Organization did not offer the best solution to COVID. Arguably, that was Sweden and with their business as usual approach. Several Indian states went their own way, which is now offering rich data around vaccination and herd immunity. If we had an all-powerful Tedros pandemic treaty in place at that time, Sweden and India would have had to comply and the world would not be able to have that information we now have about what worked and what did not work. Perhaps that's the point. If the World Health Organization can require the whole world to follow the same response, how will we know whether the response was the wrong one? We won't know. The United Nations World Health Organization loves to hide the truth. The World Health Organization has a proven record of hiding truth. As it stands, the only reason that a mob of unelected health bureaucrats based in Geneva is not governing Australia is thanks to a collection of African nations who voted down the first version of the pandemic treaty presented as regulation changes last December. This will not happen again. The 42-member African nations bloc has been offered money, technology, bribes and resources in exchange for their support. Western nations, including Australia, are actually being sent the bill for this bribing of African nations to the tune of billions of dollars. Australian taxpayer paying bribes. We won't have it. This is how much Western money Africa has been offered to support the pandemic treaty. How many understand that this treaty is not just about pandemic management? It's a permanent system of health care aid to the third world. The pandemic treaty proposes allowing health stakeholders such as vaccine companies, to sit as voting members to the World Health Organization Committee that would run a pandemic response with the United Nations World Health Organization declaring potential pandemics. They don't even have to declare a pandemic, just a potential pandemic. Vaccine companies will have the power to order the use of their vaccines around the world under World Health Organization orders. These would include companies like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who are the UN World Health Organization's second largest donor. In return, the World Health Organization promote vaccines from pharmaceutical companies that Bill and Melinda Gates owned and own. The Gates Foundation returns a profit from vaccine purchases to an organization that promotes vaccine use. It's a nice, cycle, nice circle. Welcome to cronyism and, and corruption, World Health Organization style, Gates style, Big Pharma style. In the detail, the World Health Organization has decreed this policy instrument makes the WHO the directing and coordinating authority on global health and the leader of multilateral cooperation in global health governance. It further insists that it will have powers to control the health response from a global to a regional, national and community level, meaning the World Health Organization, the crooked, corrupt, incompetent, dishonest organization, will have powers inside every Australian town, every suburb, every GP sur surgery, every state, and every federal health bureaucrat's desk. That would leave little room to doubt the intention of this document is to invade the domestic health processes of each country, right down to the local community health centre. 
Who will really exercise these powers? I'll tell you. The document clearly states that national sovereignty ends where the impact on other countries begins, at which point the United Nations World Health Organization takes over. Who determines that what impacts on another country? The World Health Organization, apparently, setting themselves up as judge, jury and executioner, with the only right of appeal being the World Health Organization itself. We should ask ourselves, if the World Health Organization declared Sweden to be causing harm during the last pandemic to perhaps neighbouring countries, what action would Tedros and the World Health Organization have taken against them? No one has given an answer to this. Indeed, no one is even curious about these hypothetical powers, extreme hypothetical powers, or what they would look like in even the most basic real-world scenario. The use of the SWIFT system to process international transactions financial transactions were used to enforce sanctions against Russia. This is the most likely method of delivering World Health Organization sanctions, and it has been mooted. The treaty will create a monstrous health bureaucracy that binds Australia to funding the health systems of developing nations, even though we can't seem to find the money to build hospitals in our own country. One only today reports in the media of mothers-to-be in Gladstone, Queensland, having to travel hours to get to a maternity centre. Gladstone is a city of 35,000 people. It's not a village and has a maternity unit that is effectively closed to new deliveries. This is a first world country, or was. Perhaps if the treaty comes in, Premier Palaszczuk can apply to the World Health Organization to pay for a new birthing unit. That's sarcasm, by the way. I'd never want them to build any damn thing. Our states have some of the worst health records in half a century, and yet we cannot wait to rush in as global saviors of international health and throw what little money we have left behind the World Health Organization. The zero draft of the WHO pandemic treaty, accord or instrument, whatever the rebranding is made, must be referred for a detailed review, including the costing. We need to know exactly what the price tag is going to look like. We need to know exactly how much sovereignty will be ceded to an international body that has proven itself to be politically compromised to China, a nation offering sufficient security concerns that our defence minister decided we need to sign AUKUS to provide, in part, protection against China. Under the pandemic treaty, the private medical data of citizens becomes the property of global health bureaucrats and their corporate stakeholders. Your private health data becomes their property. Will this data be de-identified? Not on the current wording, it won't. Our citizens, we all in this country, become vulnerable to foreign health rules, procedures and orders, dictates from bureaucrats that Australia cannot even vote out of power, from whom we cannot even protect ourselves. Nor can we hold these bastards accountable. Unlimited power? Unending unlimited power. The pandemic treaty will ensure that nations like Australia, who are the least likely to be the cause of a global pan pandemic, are required to bear an unfair burden of cost for the mistakes of other regimes. The pandemic treaty is a political document, not a health document, and must be treated as such. The treaty dictates how much money Australian governments must spend on pandemic prevention. Five per cent of annual health budgets. It cedes sovereignty to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in Geneva and New York. It requires Australia to give away a defined percentage of our GDP on international cooperation and assistance on pandemic prevention. Give away a defined percentage of our GDP. It cedes sovereignty to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats in Geneva and New York. Under our Constitution's external affairs powers, the Commonwealth Government is empowered to sign away our sovereignty and require the state to make this expenditure. The external affairs powers are being used here in a manner our founding fathers did not envisage. What about the other UN agencies? I imagine they're all eyeing this one off. What a way to extend their power and their funding, their control. Since when did Australia's governments allow the UN World Health Organization to make binding demands on public money and the allocation of funds? One nation completely opposes the UN World Health Organization being issued with a magic credit card with Australian taxpayers paying the bill. And what of reviewing the severe risk a unified health response places on national security? Do we want potentially hostile nations knowing exactly how Australia will respond to a pandemic, given that pandemic might come in the form of a biological weapon? Because that is what the pandemic treaty demands. Signing this is a violation of national security. We can't wait until the treaty is completed and the passing through parliament a fait accompli as every other sovereignty sapping agreement has done. We can't wait until then. We have to hit this now. This is far too important. People's lives are at stake. People's health is at stake. Our nation's sovereignty is at stake. Our negotiating committee, permanently based in Zurich, permanently based in Zurich, needs to receive their instructions from the Australian people, not from the pharmaceutical establishment. 
At the very least, the pandemic treaty must be submitted for a, a rigorous, detailed and forensic review to determine exactly what we are agreeing to. This must happen now so the negotiating body understands what the public will accept and what it will not accept. After which, the public must be allowed to decide if it is prepared to cede control of health care, something that has always been proudly under the control of Australia, if it wants to cede that instead to the international bureaucracy. It's a question so significant that it's worth a, worthy of a plebiscite. Yet the best we can do is to come into the Senate chamber and beg for a Senate inquiry. This treaty needs an inquiry now to help our negotiators make good decisions. Decisions in the national interest. Decisions everyday Australians struggling with an out-of-control cost of living can afford. I want to make a point that Senator Alex Antic, Senator Pauline Hanson, Senator Ralph Babet are co-sponsors, co-movers of this motion. This started, this, this work on the United Nations started in my very first speech in the Senate in 2016. It continued thoroughly, completely, continually until now. And it will continue because the United Nations and the World Health Organization are corrupt, dishonest, disgraceful entities, inhuman entities. And I will not shut up on this until we are exit, exiting from the United Nations. I call on an Oz exit. After years of Liberal, Labor, Greens gutlessly ceding sovereignty over many aspects of this country, we will chase and hold accountable governments on this, just like we did on the cash ban and one on that. So thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, and before I call you, Senator Babette, I will just remind senators to be diligent in their use of parliamentary language during these debates. Senator Babette. Thank you. And I thank Senator Malcolm Roberts for this motion, and obviously I rise here in this place today to support the motion. I too spoke about the uh, ever encroaching United Nations, WHO and all their sister organisations in my maiden speech. Now, during the 2020 election campaign, the UAP took to the people of Australia a serious concern. It went well, a serious concern. That concern, of course, was the ever encroaching power of the WHO, the ever growing power of the WHO. Specifically, we sounded the alarm, the alarm on the pandemic treaty. We did our best to get our warning out to the public. We allocated significant resources into an education campaign around the proposed treaty, which was swiftly dismissed by the majority of people here in this place and by the legacy media as just another conspiracy theory, just <laughs> more misinformation, even though our nation was already heavily entangled in the early stages of this treaty via the intergovernmental negotiating body. Just another conspiracy theory, they said. Well, it's now unfolding right before our very eyes. Not a conspiracy theory anymore, is it? Now, it is up to us in this place to ensure that our nation's interests are protected, protected from any agreement which could impact the autonomy of our people and, of course, our nation, our sovereignty. It must be protected. In the past three years, the past three years, what's it taught us? I'll tell you what it's taught us. It's taught us that secrecy and lack of disclosure erode trust and it produces poor outcomes. Like I keep talking about here in this place over and over again, we need transparency. Now, the Australian people, they were shielded, shielded from the truth when they voted in 2022 and we must do all that we can to ensure that no treaty is signed off until the people have their chance to look at the issue and properly dissect and understand the implications. What have we learned from the pandemic? What have we learned? We've learned that transparency and accountability is the best way forward. That's what we've learned from that. Even, even Elon Musk, Elon Musk tweeted just last week in response to Senator Roberts, as Senator Roberts mentioned, and I'll quote again for the Hansard, countries should not cede authority to the WHO. They should not. I ask all of you here one question. Who should control or guide our government? 
response to the next health emergency? Should it be the WHO, an unelected international body with no accountability, or should it be the Australian people? Should it be us, democratically elected here in this place, to serve the people? As a rhetorical question, of course it should be us. The Department of Health and Aged Care website states, and I quote, I'll quote, Order. once the new instrument has been finalised, the Australian government will make a decision on whether to agree to it. And changes to the international health regulations may create a new international legal obligation for Australia. Now, I urge everyone here in this place to consider the second statement carefully. We must understand what the WHO wants to achieve and we must ask our, our constituents, we must ask them if they are comfortable letting a foreign, unelected bureaucracy potentially take the wheel next time there is a public health emergency. Now, I was elected to this place because the people of Victoria disapproved of the last pandemic response. Never again can we allow basic, inalienable human rights to be tossed to the side. Never again can we threaten livelihoods, close borders, grant indemnity to big pharma or break out families. Here, here. We must learn from our mistakes and not offload our responsibility to unaccountable and, in my opinion, easily corruptible foreign bodies. Some examples I'll give them to you. Bill Gates was the second highest donor to the WHO in 2020-2021, the start of the pandemic. Greater even than the United States, Germany was the highest with US 751 million donated. In addition to this, the Global Vaccine Alliance, which Bill Gates created in 1999, has donated 1.5 billion US dollars from 2016 to 2020. They've also donated 452 million dollars to the WHO in 2020-2021. So basically foundations supported or funded by Bill Gates have donated in total over a billion US dollars to the WHO in 2020-21. Gates said in 2010 in the now infamous TED talk that if we do a good job on vaccines, we can reduce the world's population by 1.5 billion or so. Now I'll be clear, and I will say that may have been that comment may have been taken out of context, but it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder: Is he all about promoting vaccines, no matter what the cost? That he makes vaccines that he makes. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Now, Gates is also quoted as saying, and this is what he has said, he gets a 20 to 1 return on any investment he makes on vaccines. Doesn't that make you wonder what he's up to? The guy who funds the WHO, isn't that enough to make you say, hang on a sec, maybe we should look at this? Yeah. Now, I for one, I am opposed to the WHO pandemic treaty and millions of Australians stand with me. Now, just like the lyrics to that famous song from the band <laughs> The Who, I'll get on my knees and pray that we don't get fooled again. Thank you. Uh, Senator Rennick. Oh, sorry, Thank you, sorry Sir, Senator Rennick. Senator Brown was on her feet. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, Senator Rennick. I did see Senator Brown first. I thought she was calling a point of order, but I will give the call to Senator Brown. Thank you, Senator Brown. You're so kind, Senator Rennick. Uh, the, dev the devastating effects of the COVID-19 pandemic has been felt across the world, including here in Australia. Countries from across the globe are looking to determine how the global health system could better work in future pandemics so that they can better protect their populations, minimise economic effects and see a more effective and equitable global response. This parliament has a long established since 1996 and a significant role in uh, scrutinising treaties prior to, to binding treaty action being taken by government, led by the Joint Standing Co Committees on Treaties, JSCOT. Before Australia can ratify any new international agreement, once negotiated, the JSCOT will consider the, the agreement, undertake further consultation with stakeholders, 
and members of the public and make a recommendation to Parliament as to whether Australia should ratify the agreement. The proposed new instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response is still being negotiated, and key provisions have not been agreed between countries. There is not yet a final agreement for the Parliament to consider. Negotiations on a new instrument are not expected to be concluded until May 2024 at the earliest. We therefore oppose the proposed motion. And let me also take this opportunity to clarify a range of misunderstandings about this proposed instrument. Countries retain sovereignty regarding their public health policies, including public health and safety measures such as border measures, use of masks and vaccines. This is enshrined in the very first paragraph of the current draft agreement, which enforces the principle that each country retains responsibility and control of its own health policies. It is also enshrined in international law, including the existing International Health Regulations 2005. The WHO has no legal authority to force countries to accept any recommendations. The WHO can only provide assistance at the request of a country. Australian law can only be changed by an Act of Parliament, not by an international treaty or any other international legal instrument. No international instrument can change or affect Australia's constitution. Any changes to Australian law to implement the new instrument would also have to be considered and passed by Parliament through the usual processes. Negotiations are currently underway on the new instrument and nothing has been agreed. In particular, the specific proposals to referred to in the motion will be subject to extensive negotiation by member states and have not been agreed. The specific po um, proposals referred to in points B and D are not being considered for inclusion in the following in the new instrument. While this instrument is being negotiated, th negotiated through the mechanisms of the WHO, negotiations are between countries only. This is an opportunity to pursue Australia's objectives for improvement to global health systems, which include strengthening the international community's efforts to prevent and respond to future pandemics, allowing Australia to pursue international and regional health priorities while protecting domestic interests and sovereign rights, protecting the Australian community's health and wellbeing against the threat of future pandemics. Further information on these negotiations is available on the Department of Health and Aged Care website and on the WHO website. The government expects to commence public consultation on the proposed instrument later in the year, once the likely shape of the agreement is better defined. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Reddick. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak in uh, support of this motion because this motion goes to the essence of democracy. It goes to what our forefathers have fought for for the last 250 years. And I hark back to that great year, 1776, when the great patriots of the USA fought against the foreign oppression. And I know many of you on the other side like to laugh at that, but that was the flame that lit the light of democracy, and that was followed up with the French Revolution. And what makes Western civilization so great is that it is founded on grassroots movements, not unelected elite bureaucrats out there in Switzerland who make these decisions and then use uh, globally controlled media to influence decisions. So while I agree with you, uh, Senator Brown, on the fact that I, I don't think that uh, we are going to give up our sovereignty to the WHO uh, in terms of what's binding and non-binding, I do think that we do risk uh, being influenced by the so-called vibe. And we saw that in the COVID pandemic, where we would religiously slab, uh, uh, you know, follow the uh, orders or the uh, pro proclamations from the WHO without any questioning. 
and we had uh, great big organisations called uh, you know, big organisations under the umbrella of the Trusted News Initiative, uh, giving these commands. And you weren't allowed to actually question anything. You weren't allowed to actually question anything. And if you did, you were censored. And we've seen that uh, come out recently with the Twitter files, where the White House, for example, was influencing social media companies. And anyone that tried to put a story out there about you know, that might have questioned the safety of the vaccines was immediately barred from social media. And that is not right. And that was a globally coordinated effort. Now, there were no laws in place to say that any of that was legal, but what was in place was a system of influence that's been brought around, brought about by the centralised control of wealth. And I just want to give a bit of a prologue here in this country. I know as I grew up, my first uh, memory of politics was in 1983 when Bob Hawke was elected. And within months of him being elected, he went off to the High Court in order to overthrow a state government that wanted to build a dam. Now, put, a, put aside the environmental issues of the Franklin Dam, the fact of the matter is, is that the Labor Party used the Constitution to argue that foreign treaties ought to override states' powers. And that undermined democracy. It undermined our own constitution. Okay? We cannot, when you can't tell me when Deakin and Barton, the two great protectionists of this party, the, founding, the, found, the first two prime ministers of this country, when they helped formulate the constitution, that when they said that the federal government should have powers over foreign, tra uh, foreign powers, that that meant that foreign treaties could override domestic law. And that's exactly what the Franklin Dam decision did, and it was the start of unwinding our sovereignty in this country. 1985, Paul Keating let foreign banks into this country without any capital controls. And that mattered, because for the next 30 years, we saw the banks go out on a borrowing sp spree. We went from eight billion, they had eight billion in debt in 1985 to 800 billion debt in 2007. And all of that money went into housing. There were no controls over how much went into manufacturing or industry. And if it had my way, for every dollar that we borrow offshore for housing, another dollar has to go into industry. We have to cap down on these, these, uh, this foreign debt because it is another form of influence. Then we had the Button Plan, which ultimately destroyed manufacturing in this country. It destroyed the great state of Victoria, and that was followed up by the Dawkins Plan, which then brought in and empowered universities. So we've basically got rid of our manufacturing industry and we've replaced it uh, and empowered it with these Marxists in universities that go around and undermine the working population. And to cap it all off then, we had superannuation, which basically funded the sale of our infrastructure to unelected officials in superannuation along with foreign ownership. And that superannuation has centralised all the battlers' wealth in this country so that we've got now for example, the industry funds, they use one proxy manager, they own over 20 per cent of all the major top 50 companies in Australia, and they vote together with that one proxy vote. And what's happened in Australia has also happened overseas. We have uh, uh, wealth managers like BlackRock, uh, Vanguard, who have controlling interests in NBC, controlling interests in Pfizer. These people, the people that sit on the boards, they also sit on uh, the NIH. And there's massive conflicts of interest. And that is where we get the problem with these treaties. Because what, while, with, and with the World Health Organization, and as uh, Senator uh, Roberts rightly pointed out before, Bill Gates, I think, and I'll stand to be corrected on this, is a massive donor to the World Health Organization. I think he might be the second biggest donor. He has enormous influence. He's not accountable to anyone. Uh, he himself has backflipped on how effective the vaccines were. But yet again, there is no level of accountability. And that is the problem with organisations like the World Health Organisation. And, I, and look, you know, I, I think that they served a purpose after World War II. I think that the United Nations was created with the good intentions of trying to resolve, uh, you know, find a peaceful solution between countries going to war. But of course, as we know with the uh, famous Victorian Newell and Geoffrey Peart um, leaked conversation there back in 2014, 2014, Bunky Moon actually condoned the overthrow of a democratically elected government in Ukraine. So you've got to ask yourself why the United Nations isn't trying to strive for peace rather than interfere in domestic countries' policies. And that is the difference. I've got no problems with seeking cooperation between countries. That is very important. We do not want uh, conflicts going on. But at the same time, we have to respect a nation's sovereignty. 
And that means that, pe that the people uh, and the government must listen to its people. And this is particularly relevant because Section 477.1c of the Biosecurity Act actually empowers the Health Minister to declare an emergency on a recommendation uh, by the World Health Organisation. Now, that is actually already in legislation, and that is very, very scary, the fact that we have already legislated the fact that the Health Minister can make a unilateral decision based on the recommendation of the World Health Organisation. And that is why this inquiry is so important, because we need to shine a light on the actual uh, dealings of the bureaucrats. And let's face it, it's the, it's the bureaucrats who run, you know, I've often said this, it's the bureaucrats who are a shadow government um, you know, in this country. It's not, it's not us. We turn up here 19 weeks of the year and we just run across the chamber to, to the bells like you know, monkeys on a tin can or whatever. No, no, it's the bureaucrats who have permanent jobs here. They get to go on the junkets over to Switzerland. Occasionally, you know, the other side might get to go. Uh, and I think I picked up before that there's actually permanent bureaucrats that live in Switzerland doing the deals. So you can imagine how much influence, you know, how well easily influenced they're going to be by their colleagues in Switzerland when they're going out whining and dining and, you know, doing after snaps on the slopes after a day day down the um, down the slopes, you know. And I must admit, maybe uh, maybe I should try and drag a job uh, thinking about it like that. I mean, how, how, what a cushy job that would be. But the point is, is you can imagine just how. Um, you know, easily it would be influenced for these bureaucrats to be influenced by these people that the, the people in Australia would never even know. Uh, and you know, yet again, we see you know so much money was spent throughout COVID. We saw the World Health Organisation flip flop. They flip flopped on masks. They flip flopped on remdesivir. And you have to ask yourself, why did they flip flop? Was it political pressure? Was it the wheelings and dealings of, for example? Uh, these wealthy fund managers like BlackRock, Vanguard, the Gateses of the world who had conflicts of interest trying to push their drugs on the people when they weren't properly tested. So I, I can, uh, can uh, think that it's a fantastic idea that we do shine a light on the dealing, wheelings and dealings of these uh, treaties. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I ask everyone to support this motion. Senator Cox. Thank you. I rise to speak to this motion, and the Greens will be opposing this motion. And the attempt to undermine the World Health Organisation, the claim that they undermine Australia's sovereignty, and I think I'm pretty well positioned to talk about sovereignty in this place. Uh, the World Health Assembly has decided to create a treaty for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response, and this decision was actually made by consensus. The Greens support this decision, and the World Health Organisation represents governments from across the world, all of which have had vastly different experiences of COVID-19's uh, COVID pandemic. Even within Australia, we've had vastly different experiences of the pandemic. I know that my experience as a West Australian is very different from people in New South Wales or Victoria. And this treaty will gather their learnings, and the WHO will draft and negotiate the WHO Convention, Agreement and other international instruments on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. This is actually a good thing, because it's important that we learn from the responses of governments right across the world so we can do better next time. Australia needs a plan. We are now the only country in the OECD that does not have a national authority on communicable diseases and, and their control. The Australian Greens plan for pandemic preparedness in Australia includes establishing a national centre for disease control with $246 million of funding to lead a unified apolitical health approach across the entire country and to ensure that we can deal with the threat of new and emerging diseases investing $250 million over the next two years into COVID-19 vaccine research and ensuring that we can produce enough of our own vaccines onshore for everybody by building, operating, publicly owned mRNA vaccine production facilities, using a boosted foreign aid budget to invest in COVAX to support globally equitable vaccine access. All of these play a critical role in ensuring that Australia is as prepared as possible for the next pandemic. I want to turn to how 
First Nations communities were impacted by COVID-19. And to put it simply, without those lockdowns, which we all absolutely detested, especially in some of our remote communities, COVID-19 could have been absolutely devastating. These lockdowns actually saved lives. These lockdowns help keep COVID-19 out of already vulnerable communities. And I remember before becoming a senator, I was working alongside some of those remote communities in Western Australia who actually moved boulders onto access roads to stop people coming in and spreading COVID-19. Some of these communities don't have access to clean running water and may not have access to healthcare to treat them if they in fact did get sick from COVID-19. And indeed, we know that First Nations people have significantly worse health outcomes than non-First Nations people. The life expectancy in Australia is 83.2 years. We are number eight in the world in this regard. Um, for a comparison is Hong Kong, who is number one with a life expectancy of 85.3. So just to put that into context, for a First Nations person here in Australia, our average life expectancy is 71.6 years for men and 75.6 years for women. So in fact, I don't have that long to go, about 30 years. It's also been found that the burden of diseases may result in Ill illness but not death, such as mental illness, injuries, arthritis, hearing loss, asthma, which have all had a huge impact on other diseases because of your immune system was already compromised, especially for First Nations people and in their communities. We saw all through this pandemic, if someone had an underlying con condition, they were more likely to become sicker and perhaps have a, a harder time to recover from COVID-19. First Nations people are getting sicker earlier and for longer. And in fact, what those statistics tell us is that we are in fact dying earlier. This is still a shameful reality for our community and for Australia as a whole. And it is the result of ongoing oppression that's been, been going since colonisation in this country. We are already worse off, and if COVID-19 was allowed to run rampant in our communities, this would be catastrophic. We've seen some progress being made, but as we debated the most recent closing the gap in the first sitting uh, period in March, we know that this is not happening fast enough. Four out of the 18 uh, targets are on track, only four, and this in itself is disgusting and disgraceful. The other 14 are either not on track or there's no new data, so we don't even know how we're tracking, and it's, that in itself is a huge problem which needs to be addressed. First Nations people, it's more, good health is more than just the absence of disease or illness. It's a holistic concept, and that includes physical, social, emotional, cultural and spiritual well-being, both for an individual but also for their communities. That's why it's so important to have community-led healthcare, because First Nations people understand this. We understand the cultural difference between First Nations health and non-First Nations people's health, and that must be taken into consideration to provide adequate health and well-being care. This is integral into the success of the Closing a Gap initiatives. We need First Nations people deeply embedded in our approaches as we tackle these issues, from housing to healthcare to education to incarceration. This is not enough to be in consultation with First Nations people. The solutions need to be First Nations created, led and managed. So one element of the pandemic preparedness is to ensure remote communities have access both to clean water and community-led healthcare. And it is making progress on all of the aspects of closing the gap, because the healthier our communities are, the better off we will be able to face the next pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Antic. Thank you. Uh, Australia, as a sovereign nation, has the right to exercise its own judgments and its decisions when it comes to dealing with healthcare issues and emergencies. And power consolidated in the hands of a few, especially when those few are an international elite, establishes a precedent of subordinating ourselves to globalist institutions like the World Economic Forum, the United Nations and, in the case of this particular motion, the World Health Organisation. Now, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we witnessed Australia's 
CHOs, chief health officers, uh, premiers obediently defer to the advice of the World Health Organization, which pushed for the hardest possible restrictions, including lockdowns, border closures, mask mandates, vaccine mandates, and so on, and all without concern for the damage that might be done to the countries upon whose advice they were relying. And much of this advice was not only wrong, but it was also dangerous. And I'm speaking of the advice specifically there in relation to lockdowns and mandates. But this didn't prevent the WHO Director Tedros from telling the world in early 2020 that, and I quote, one of the greatest dangers we now face is complacency and that there must be a new normal. Well, when pe millions of people are locked in their homes, Tedros said, once again quoting, the same public health measure measures that we've been advocating since the beginning of the pandemic must remain the backbone of the response in all countries. Find every case, isolate every case, test every case, care for every case, trace and quarantine every contact. It's hard to believe in hindsight, but that's what was being said. Anyone who pointed out basic facts was deemed a conspiracy theorist by the WHO, and they encouraged the actions I just described, which trampled the most basic rights, liberties and dignity of Australian citizens and citizens throughout the world. Such rights included the rights to freedom of speech, movement and association. And I say freedom of speech because anyone who defied the WHO's supposedly expert advice, including eminent medical professionals, were censored and vilified by the media and big tech at the behest of government and these organisations, and only, the only narrative that was allowed oxygen were those parroting the WHO. Many Australian healthcare providers were suspended for contradicting what was ultimately the WHO's position on COVID-19 vaccines. Their predictions and observations have turned out to be correct, and we'll see how that narrative is slowly changing. And we saw it this weekend when, on Saturday, on the front page of The Weekend Australian, the tragic story of Amy Sedgwick uh, was, was told. Uh, and the article explains how a 24-year-old woman's health rapidly deteriorated following her COVID-19 injections, which is thought to have led to her death. Yet the WHO's website to date states, Quote, the vaccine is safe and effective for all individuals aged six months and above. All efforts should be taken to achieve high vaccine coverage rates in the highest and high priority use groups. Well, clearly we see that we have here a contradiction between what is reality and what is actually the official advice of the WHO. And it should be obvious to anyone, anyone with a functioning memory, that from the weekend Australian, or that the story of the weekend Australian this weekend would have been deemed and considered dangerous and probably even anti-vax. Uh, by the censorship industrial complex known as the mainstream media in this country, which only a year ago parroted the WHO's dangerous lines. The WHO is slowly drip-feeding these stories to normalise the idea that people who pushed against this agenda were wrong, and also that there's no way they could have known at the time. Well, we did know at the time. People did know at the time. Experts did know at the time. And there are thousands of stories out there, like the tragic one of Amy Sedgwick and her families, if only people People in this place had taken the time to listen to them, and nobody did bar a few. I say that because the rules that Amy Sedgwick followed were precisely the same rules that the WHO sought to have member governments of the WHO enforce. So why then would we even entertain further involving ourselves with this body? Why would we possibly entertain signing and ratifying a treaty to make further encumbrances on our own sovereign nation? In the early days of the pandemic, the WHO refused to investigate the Chinese Communist Party's potential involvement in the development and release of COVID-19, despite the fact that the virus came from China. It, it, it was never, ever, ever an issue. Just down the road, we had a major virology institute that had labs in which coronaviruses had been experimented on. And when they finally did start investigating the CCP, they quickly confirmed that there was no wrongdoing on their part. We've all forgotten that. But that's what happened. Coincidentally, the WHO refused to acknowledge the existence of a little country called Taiwan. Or, you know, uh, I mean, these, this is the body we're dealing with. This is the body we're talking about here, the one that's so vaunted by those opposite uh, the chamber. So one might well be excused for being just a tiny bit sceptical about the WHO's supposed independence when it comes to international matters. I believe that government power needs to be at its lowest possible feasible level, and wherever that power is given it shouldn't be abused by uh, a super, on a supernatural level. And of course, national or federal power is required. The federal government shouldn't be controlling the lives of communities. And this is even more so in the case of 
uh, international, at international level. And the idea that the WHO should have control over individuals' personal medical choices is an egregious abuse of power. This WHO pandemic treaty represents a further descent into the world of centralised powers that our leaders, our representatives in this place, are failing to prevent. And you'll all understand in due course, I assure you of that. Our government departments are walking lockstep with a globalist agenda of the WH WEF, the UN and the WHO, and we're ceding our national sovereignty bit by bit, death by a thousand cuts. There's a lot to discuss with this proposed treaty, but if you choose just one example, Article 17 deals with the strengthening pandemic and public health literacy, and it reads, quote, the WHO will conduct regular social listening and analysis to identify the prevalence and profiles of misinformation, which contribute to the design communications and messaging of strategies for the public to counter misinformation and what else? Disinformation. What's the difference? We'll never know. Uh, th this is what the document says. Presumably the WHO will define what is deemed to be misinformation and pres presumably disinformation at some time, and then we'll all knew, and even uses the term false news. I'm sure this would be very convenient for the financial contributors to the WHO uh, that are heavily invested in the development and manufacturing of vaccines. And as I stated earlier, much, if not all, of what the WHO considered misinformation ultimately was, guess what? True. Turned out to be true. How about that? Why then would the Australian government entertain a treaty which allows the WHO to define what constitutes misinformation? And under the guise of international law and presumably work with social media companies to further censor the people of Australia and those that take a stand. I mean, that's what design communications and messaging strategy really means, ultimately. Essentially, the Australian government's lining up to sign an agreement that the WHO is the central body determining how once sovereign nations prepare for and deal with pandemics. We don't need international solidarity. We, we need to be establishing ourselves as a sovereign nation with our own response and me mechanisms in place, and they should strike a balance between public health and safety as a fundamental respect for people's dignity and human rights, as well as being genuine, genuine science-based. Genuine science-based. Not genuine science-based. Simply put, the WHO will ensure that the process by which pandemic-related products, which obviously means vaccines, are approved by regulatory agencies, in this case the TGA, it will be even speedier. Apparently the COVID-19 vaccines were not developed and approved quickly enough despite the lack of long-term safety data of any form. And once again, I can't help but notice how convenient this is to the pharmaceutical investors and manufacturers. The, Sunday, the, the, the Saturday's weekend Australian presents an undeniable proof of why this hastening of development of these drugs is dangerous. Australia is being led by blind guides who are not listening to the voices of Australian people or even the dissenting voices of highly qualified experts, but to the voices of international elites whose top priority is not to do what, the best, what is best for the people of Australia. So I support this motion. I commend it. And my view is get out of the who. Senator Trubridge. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy. Um, I rise to speak against this motion, and I want to thank Senator Cox for her contribution and putting the perspective of First Nations communities onto the floor of the Senate when it comes to spreading disinformation about critical public health responses. Because these words, these conspiracy motions, these conspiracy theories, from the Cooker Conspiracy Club that occupies the far right fringes of the Senate chamber, the, the Cooker Conspiracy Club, actually causes harm in the real world. Actually causes harm in the real world. The, I don't know what the credentials to get into the Cooker Conspiracy Club are, but they, they would probably involve some secret handshake and a genuine disgust of science and evidence, I suppose. They're the kind of... You, you have to establish that before you get, in, before you get entry into the club. Um, a, a sort of dark and miserable 1970s shag pile on the floor of the Cooker Conspiracy Club. Um, a, a variety of sort of strange antiquarian suits or clothing that they wear. Who knows what, what, what it involves? But at the core of it is actually a dangerous disbelief in science... And worse still, worse still, a political willingness to play with people's lives and play with public health for a narrow sectional political interest. And it's actually dangerous what they're doing. 
It's, it's dangerous to public health. It's particularly dangerous to First Nations communities who are especially vulnerable um, um, to these public health risks. And it is a reckless abuse of the position, uh, uh, their positions as senators in this place. Um, what the pandemic has highlighted very clearly was a was a, a dangerous lack of preparation around the world for pandemics, um, and 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 when it comes to Australia, it showed how the Commonwealth was not adequately prepared to respond to a global pandemic. And as much as we would want to wish pandemics away, or hope that they could be dealt with by um, putting up, you know, uh, um, imp sovereign borders and sealing Australia off from the world, we're in a globally connected world. And if we're going to respond to the threat of a global pandemic, we need to do it in cooperation with the rest of the world. And we need some global strategies to deal with how to deal with a pandemic. And that means we need organisation and resourcing. Um, and and to, to ignore that, to ignore that or pretend otherwise actually exposes our community and the rest of the global population to harm. And, and they're quite happy to do that. The Cooker Club are quite happy to do that, to expose Australians, particularly vulnerable Australians, those with um, significant health um, concerns, older Australians. The Cooker Club is quite happy to expose those vulnerable parts of our community to, 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 ex, to, to, a, to highly elevated risks from pandemics. They're, they're quite happy to do that because they think they get some sort of narrow political benefit out of it. And we saw, I think, one of the Victorian senators step up and say how actually spreading conspiracy theories had been his pathway to getting elected to this Senate. Well, that's a kind of tragic statement, really, that, that, that the, um, the spreading of conspiracy theories was actually his way of getting elected. And, and, and he was quite shameless about it, quite shameless about it. And, and, and the, the, the far-right fringes of the National Party and the Liberal Party are also giving a safe berth to these same conspiracy theorists, giving the same place to conspiracy theorists because they think there's an electoral advantage in it, a narrow elective advantage in tearing down public health outcomes, tearing down public confidence in, in, in vaccines, which we know have been some of the most significant um, public health uh, victories for the planet in the last century. They may not like it. They obviously don't like science. They obviously don't care. But vaccines have been some of the most significant public health outcomes. And they're willing, for their narrow political advantage, to tear down public confidence in that. That, that is almost the definition, almost the definition of venal politics. That's the definition of venal politics, right there from that lot. And of course, conspiracy theories um, are now in vogue in the far right fringes of politics around the world. They, this is the kind of Trumpian politics they're trying to introduce into Australia. They've, they've, they've never seen an election result they don't agree with that they haven't wanted to tear down through a conspiracy theory. Um, uh, tear down through a conspiracy theory. They, they've, they, and they use conspiracy theories in the United States to produce appalling public policy outcomes, not least of which is targeted voter suppression. So they create a conspiracy about um, the integrity of the voting system without any factual basis for it, based on one or two anecdotes, and then they weaponise that politically to do targeted voter suppression in the United States. That's the game plan of the Cooker Conspiracy Club. That's what they do in the United States, and they want to bring that game plan here. They, they do it on anti-vax too, <clears throat> bringing um, deeply unscientific, non-credible anecdotes to try and tear down public confidence in vaccine efficiencies. And, and of course, one of the things they, they want us to do is to repeat their conspiracy theories. Because if we, in, in meeting these unscientific fringe conspiracy theories. If we, if we repeat their conspiracy theories, um, it, it produces what's called the backfire effect, that if we, we engage in any way in a place like this in the Senate 
with the details of their myths and their conspiracies, that that somehow makes them appear more plausible. They actually want, they want us to repeat the nonsense back at them because that gives their nonsense some kind of credibility. And I think we need to be mindful of not doing that, mindful, mind, mindful of not repeating the nonsense conspiracy theory and instead resort to the facts. And the facts are, when it comes to the, the moves afoot, the very sensible moves afoot, to, uh, moves afoot to get a, a, a pandemic treaty, the facts are this. The World Health Organization's Assembly's pandemic treaty is designed is, 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 to, is to establish an intergovernmental negotiating body, which intent is to draft and negotiate a World Health Convention agreement or some other international instrument on pandemic prevention, preparedness and response. The idea is that we cooperate with the rest of the world to come up with a a plan for the next pandemic to prevent it, to be prepared if it hits the if it hits the planet, if and when it hits the planet, and to have an integrated response to deal with a global pandemic. And they, they don't want that to happen because they don't care about vulnerable people. They don't care about the elderly. They don't care about people with um, who have immunodepressed um, health response. <coughs> they don't care. They're willing to play with the lives of vulnerable Australians for their own narrow political advantage. <coughs> and, um, and that is kind of an, a kind of obscene outcome. That is a kind of obscene outcome um, from, from the, the Cooker Conspiracy Club in the Senate. The, um, <coughs> and of course, the, the intent is to adopt the instrument under a long-standing article of the World Health Organization's constitution. Um, and then, of course, once we have a global treaty framework, it's up to Australia how to implement it, entirely up to Australia how to implement it. It's up to decisions of the Australian government and our state and territory governments <coughs> how we implement a World Health Organization treaty. And I know that's awkward for the conspiracy theorists to take on board. But once a treaty is implemented under Australian law, and perhaps they should perhaps read the Constitution they say they're so care, they care about, perhaps I'd suggest that Senator Renwick doesn't start his, his lesson in Australian constitutional law in, 19, in 1776, because he's probably on the wrong continent, but it's up to him. Um, but if they read Australian, the Australian Constitution, looked at High Court decisions, they would know that entering into a treaty under Australian law in no way incorporates that into Australian domestic law. It just doesn't. Now, that's a, an awkward constitutional reality for the club. You know, the conspiracy club finds the reality of how our constitution work, work, works politically inconvenient because it doesn't work with their scare campaign. But the Constitution is very clear. The High Court has said repeatedly that entering into a treaty, the act of the executive government entering into a treaty, whether it's a World Health Organization treaty or an arms reduction treaty or a treaty on bilateral trade, does not incorporate the treaty into domestic law. It just doesn't. And I suppose, you know, actually understanding the Constitution, some people would think would be a a kind of prerequisite for a senator before they get up and sprout their conspiracy theories, but they're not troubled by that. They're not troubled by evidence. They're not troubled by law. They just want to make people feel uncomfortable and uneasy because that's their, that's their political... They think there's a political advantage for it. But it does not incorporate a treaty into Australian law. For, a treaty to, for any element of a treaty to be incorporated into Australian law, this parliament, or a state or territory parliament, has to determine to do so by passing a law or granting a power to a minister. Uh, the idea that it's um, uh, entering into a treaty is some sort of surrender of sovereignty is just plain nonsense. And they know it's nonsense, I think, because I actually give them some credit. They know it's nonsense. They know it's false. They know it's a lie. But we still get ridiculous motions like this. They know they're peddling lies to the Australian public. They know they're creating, deliberately creating people to be 
to have an ease. Senator Shearidge, resume your seat. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, President, uh, interesting debate, but uh, I believe there's a, a crossing a line in terms of impugning motives against other senators. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was listening to you, Senator Shoebridge, and you might have um, you might have accused senators of, of uh, doing something um, that is that is that would have been perhaps unparliamentary. So I would just ask you to consider that um, and uh, move on with your comments, and I'll be listening carefully. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, Deputy President. They don't care. They don't care that the rhetoric they put here is totally contrary to the law, totally contrary to the Constitution. And as I said before, I give them the credit. They, they know it's wrong. They know what they're saying is wrong, but they don't care because a really good conspiracy for them doesn't have to be grounded in the truth. Now, I was counting the number of conspiracy theories that Senator Renwick had. It's one of the, one of the challenges in following one of, trying to follow um, the, the senator's uh, contributions. And I got up to six. I got up to six, and there was somehow superannuation was in it. Somehow the button plan was in it. Bill Gates, of course, featured at some point. Uh, the UN was in on it. Somehow or other, universities were in on it. Former Minister Dawes was in on it. And um, I was trying to work out how to weave all the conspiracies together into some coherent whole. And, 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 and that way, danger lies, I think, trying to pretend that they, they think that there's some sort of coherence in it. They just, they just throw out all these individual elements. They throw out all these individual conspiracies, and they hope that one of them will stick in someone's mind. You know, maybe it was the UN. Maybe it is superannuation. Maybe it all comes down to the button plan. Maybe it's the WHO. Maybe it's Bill Gates. You know, maybe it's banks in general. Maybe it's something that happened in Ottawa in 1917. I don't know. But, but it is never grounded in any kind of coherence or facts. It is, it, is, it is the worst abuse of the position of an elected representative to do that. To is this a point of order, Senator Scar? Um, Senator Scar? A personal reflection and imputation of motive against my uh, friend and colleague, Senator Rennick. Senator Shoebridge was directly speaking about Senator Rennick then, and he talked about abuse, a process, etc. He should withdraw. Uh, Senator Shoebridge, um, it, is, it is appropriate to use people's proper titles, and we will collectively, I think, clarify that it's Senator Rennick. Um, and I just ask you to, to reflect on the comments that you made yes. in relation to that senator. Yes. Well, I, I apologise for calling Senator Rennick anything other than his name. Um, the, um, Senator Shoebridge, resume your you. seat. Senator Scar on the point of order. Uh, Acting Deputy President, I specifically uh, raised in my point of order that Senator Shoebridge should withdraw. If you didn't have an opportunity to hear the comments, then perhaps you want to take on notice, review the Hansard and and make a decision unless Senator Shoebridge would be prepared to withdraw. Senator Shoebridge. As long I'll withdraw, I'll withdraw it. Senator Shoebridge, the, um, call. thank you. Um, so, of course, the Greens oppose this motion, and it would be useful to see the coalition actually forming a position on this and opposing this motion and, and, and speaking against those kind of dangerous fringe elements that they otherwise give a safe home to within their party because it comes at real cost. And Senator Cox made it clear that one of the communities that pays the cost of this conspira these conspiracy theories, one of the communities that pays the highest cost are actually First Nations communities. So reflect on the damage you're causing in these motions. And, and I'd ask the coalition to reflect on allowing this to continue to happen, week in, week out in this place, and reflect on the real cost that's causing on the ground to some of the most vulnerable people in this country, whose job it is, I would have thought, it's, job, it's our job to protect, not to expose to this conspiracy, the Cooker Conspiracy Club, that's pushing this motion forward. 
Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And, um, can I acknowledge the extraordinary important role uh, that the committees of this place play yeah. in making sure that we have got the most robust process that we can to investigate issues that are of importance to all Australians? Um, and I think that the role of the Senate is, uh, is undermined by the kind of contribution that we just heard from Senator Shoebridge. Um, to be coming in here and being lectured by somebody um, simply because they have a contrary view to somebody else in this chamber and somehow suggesting that they're a lesser person and using derogatory terms in which to describe them, I think actually reflects very badly on Senator Shoebridge more so than those people that have sought to put forward this particular motion. Um, can I also say um, to, to Senator Roberts, who obviously feels very strongly about this particular issue and others that have made a contribution about the importance they think of shining light on issues that have significant impact on Australia going forward, and particularly our place as we sit in, in the global environment. So um, I thank you, Senator Roberts, for bringing forward um, this important issue. Um, and I believe that as a Senate we shouldn't be standing in the way of shining scrutiny on uh, very important issues. Yeah. We are never all going to agree um, on any issue. That is the beauty of this place. Mm. But the minute we start shying away from having a genuine debate, getting the experts in, which is how the committee process works, um, then I think that we are letting the Australian public down and not delivering what this particular chamber, um, I think, has been designed in the first place to do. So, um, Senator Roberts, the coalition will be supporting your reference because that's exactly what it is. It is a reference. It allows us the ability to be able to go into more detail and investigate the very important concerns that have been raised by everybody in this chamber about the particular issue that is the matter of substance of this reference. So, um, I would also put on the record that the coalition government will never, has never, and will never into the future compromise the interests of Australia or its sovereignty in anything that it does. And we would make sure that we would be very, very strongly of that view right the way through. Um, because we support transparency. Um, this is something that's really quite interesting when you consider that the platform on which those opposite were elected to this place, they went out to the election and they trumpeted transparency from the hilltops. But I've got to tell you, it is really quite extraordinary that since we have been in this place, there has been nothing that has been less transparent than this Albanese Labor government. I, we stand for transparency on this side of the chamber and for that reason that we will be supporting the reference as we often and almost always support references. Thank you. Senator Rustin. Senator Canavan. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, 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 I support uh, this, uh, this referral because we shouldn't be signing an international treaty with the World Health Organisation. We should be getting out of the World Health yeah, yeah, Organisation yeah. because of their negligent handling of the coronavirus pandemic. It surprises me that very few people have actually raised in this debate the record of the World Health Organisation over the past few years. There's a lot of emotion now in light of lockdowns and vaccine mandates and what have you, but people have forgotten the initial stages of the pandemic and the mistakes, the gross errors of judgment that the World Health Organisation presided over, and it's absolutely ridiculous that they have, and no one has, been held to account in the WHO for those errors and mistakes, which probably cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, their lives. In fact, the head of the WHO is still the same person as at the start of the pandemic, even though at the start of the pandemic, we've all forget now, at the start of the pandemic, the WHO was saying there was nothing to see here. There was no problem. Uh, on January the 14th, 2020, the World Health Organisation tweeted, and I quote, keep in mind, so January 14th, 2020, we were starting to learn about this thing called coronavirus. And we were starting to learn about this thing called COVID-19. Governments, I know our government here in Australia at the time, the coalition government, were considering border restrictions against China, travel to and from China. And at that time, at that very moment, when this was quite topical and having to make serious decisions about protecting our own citizens, the WHO tweeted out January 14, 2020, preliminary investigations conducted by the Chinese authorities have found no clear evidence of human-to-human -human transmission of the novel coronavirus identified in Wuhan, China. That's what they said. That's what they said. There was nothing to see here. There was no airborne transmission. There was no human-to-human -human transmission. You don't need to close your borders. In fact, they doubled down on that 
as we were in the weeks to follow discussing a border closure to China. The Australian government is one of the first countries in the world to do that, and I think it's that decision and almost that decision alone uh, which prevented a wider COVID spread uh, at that time. We made that decision on January the 29th, 2020, just two weeks after that tweet. But as late as February the 3rd, 2020, the WHO—this is a headline for a news article on the, on the, on the February the 3rd, 2020. WHO chief urges countries not to close borders to foreigners from China. I mean, how has this organisation got any credibility? There's people coming in here saying, we've got to listen to the science, we've got to listen to the WHO. They know it all. Well, if we listened to the WHO in February, in January and February 2020, this country would have had a massive COVID uh, outbreak, a massive COVID outbreak, because we still would have had flights coming to and from Wuhan. We would have been in the same boat as every, almost every other country in the world. We were very lucky that, uh, for whatever reason, COVID wasn't circulating in a widespread manner here in January and February 2020, probably because we didn't go to those military games in October the year before. Uh, Australia and New Zealand were the few countries that didn't go, major countries didn't go to the military games in Wuhan uh, in late 2019. And so we got lucky there, but we would have been very, very unlucky if we had actually listened to the WHO. So for those advocating for saying somehow the WHO is sacrosanct and, and this, this, or this oracle of science that must never be disagreed with, can you please explain to me whether or not you would have followed the WHO advice in, in February 2020? Did you think, did you support or agree with the Australian government's very tough and critical decision to close our borders to China at the time? Because if you did agree with that decision at the time, you were going directly against the advice of the WHO. So you can't hold both positions. You can't say the WHO is, 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 is infallible, but at the same time agree and think that we made the right decisions there uh, in COVID. I mean, their advice, their advice goes on. Of course, uh, later on in March 2020, just the next month, WHO says, this is reported in CNN, WHO stands by recommendation to not wear masks if you are not sick or not caring for someone who is sick. Do we remember that? <laughs> Do we remember that? How do you want to remember this now? We're all sort of, it's all going in the memory hole. But the WHO for months in early 2020, right up really to late 2020, were saying, no, no, no need for masks. Don't wear masks. They don't do anything. Uh, now, as it turns out, they'll probably write the first time. <laughs> later on, later on, the WHO was saying, we all got to wear masks and you've got to you know, force people to do it. But this also shows that there's no such thing as the science. Uh, science evolves. Science changes all the time, including in response to something as severe as a pandemic. So it's ridiculous to say somehow an international treaty or an unelected group of health officials uh, should be uh, the gold standard and uh, should effectively run the response to any kind of pandemic. Of course, the WHO were uh, at first they, were, they weren't in favour of, of lockdowns or border closures, as, as per most of the advice, the health advice. We did have coronavirus plans, or we had uh, communicable disease plans in this country and many others, and those plans almost invariably said not to lock down a society in, in the face of a airborne uh, transmission to transmissible disease. Uh, but uh, we went and did it, and originally WHO said we shouldn't, and then we did, and then the WHO said we should, and we should lock down harder and longer and all the time. And so what happened again to the science here? What, this, was a, this, this last few years was a complete failure of the scientific community. They did not stick to their original plans. They got spooked by the panic of TikTok videos from China with people falling over in the street. We don't know where those videos came from or how they happened, because it never else happened in the in, during the coronavirus pandemic, but we got spooked. The scientists got spooked. We all got panicked. I got scared. Everybody got scared. Uh, we, were all, we were all spooked by it. And so the science went out the window, and we all just responded by panic and fear. That's what happened. And uh, this treaty, or allowing a treaty to entrench decision-making to a small group of people who, just like every other human being, are subject to potentially paranoia and fear, is a recipe for more errors during a pandemic. What we need during a response to any kind of crisis like a pandemic is the flexibility and the ability of different countries to do different things, and then we can see what works and what doesn't work. And clearly, over the last few years, good, uh, thank God for the, the, the good sense and bravery and courage of the Swedes, because they did chart a different path under huge pressure, under massive pressure. They were called murderers and, 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 and pandemic spreaders, variant creators. But they have come out trumps. The, the Swedish experiment uh, has clearly worked better than almost any other country in the world. They've got the, pretty much the lowest excess deaths over the last few years of any country in the world, lower than us, lower than us, even though we were lucky that we closed borders and didn't get COVID. We ended up, three years later, 
with a higher level of excess deaths than Sweden. So again, those who are saying they support the science, my, I, when I learned science at school, I thought the idea was we'd have a hypothesis, we'd experiment, we'd look at what happens in the real world, and then we'd choose the particular uh, experiment or particular uh, course of action which delivered the best outcomes. Well, clearly, over the last few years, the uh, approach of Sweden has delivered much superior outcomes to almost every country in the world. But again, if we entrench the decision-making and power in this group, a particular group of unelected officials who seem completely unaccountable, um, um, that will potentially remove that ability to have that level of experimentation, effectively kill science. There won't be science. There'll just be one particular hypothesis and you won't be able to compare it or contrast it against other approaches, which was a good thing. Likewise, in the United States, with different states doing different things. Again, clearly, those states who didn't lock down as severely uh, uh, have ended up with much, much better human, much better health and also better economic outcomes, of course, as well. But before I go, I do want to make sure we, we, there is some mention of perhaps the greatest failing, almost criminal failing, of the World Health Organization in the last few years uh, with their their gross mismanagement of the investigation into the origins of the coronavirus uh, or the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, there was, of course, a lot of controversy at the time that uh, where this had come from. Uh, there was a lab in this place called Wuhan that was experimenting on coronaviruses, and then a coronavirus pandemic happens in Wuhan. It seemed reasonable to suggest that perhaps, perhaps this laboratory that was experimenting on coronaviruses in bats uh, may have played some role, but of course anyone who suggested that the uh, lab leak theory had any kind of merit was immediately described, like Senator Shoebridge just did then, as a cooker or a conspiracy theorist, all this other rubbish. In fact, in fact, 27 uh, scientists wrote a letter in the Lancet uh, uh, journal, very respected, or, well until now should be respected journal. They all wrote a letter, these 27 scientists, in in March 2020, claiming that uh, anyone who did support or posit the lab leak theory was a conspiracy theorist. That's what the letter, the letter said. It was a lab leak theory. It was a conspiracy theory. And um, in that letter, in the Lancet Journal, there was a, as there is in all articles in a medical journal, there was a, uh, a declaration of interests. And the 27 authors said that, uh, and I quote, we declare no competing interests. That's what those scientists had said. And so that, that letter was incredibly influential in, in, uh, in effectively giving cover to the Chinese Communist Party and, uh, and, and suppressing any discussion, any sensible discussion of whether or not a mistake or otherwise from the Chinese Communist Party played a role. Well, it later came out, so that letter was published in March 2020, and they declared no competing interests. It later came out, and this is a headline from the Daily Mail, uh, in September 2021, later came out that 26 of the 27 Lancet scientists who trashed theory that COVID leaked from a Chinese lab have links to Wuhan researchers. Right, right. Convenient. So, so we have all these. Uh, have a senator here today coming in and so calling everybody a conspiracy theorist. We had scientists doing the same three years ago. It turns out those scientists were directly conflicted and lied about their conflicts of interest. Lied about it in a res otherwise respected medical journal. Where's the accountability here? Shame. Where is the accountability? Why doesn't that get mentioned at all? Why are you running a protection racket for clearly scientists who are, if they're not engaging in criminal activity, it should bloody well be a crime to do something like that. Because as I say, it costs lives. It absolutely costs lives doing stuff like that. What is worse than this though? What is, what's the scandal enough? How does the WHO fit in here? Well, one of those scientists, one of those uh, 26 scientists, or one of the 27 who signed it, was a guy called Peter Daszak. Peter Daszak, uh, uh, was the head of a, an organisation called the Eco Health Alliance, uh, registered in New York. Uh, uh, Eco Health Alliance uh, had funded coronavirus research in bats in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, the WHO selected Peter Daszak uh, to play an influential role to be one of the scientists on the inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. I mean, how, how the hell did that happen? This World Health Organisation that we're a member of, that we're apparently going to sign a treaty with, where's the accountability? Why aren't we asking questions about this? We fund these guys, spend millions of dollars to the WHO. We ask them, the Australian government specifically asked them to do an inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. We paid a big price for that in terms of China's, uh, China's unreasonable and illegal trade actions in response to that, uh, that reasonable request. 
And then, and then the WHO undermined the government of Australia's position by appointing somebody uh, who had funded work in the Wuhan Institute of Virology to look into the Wuhan Institute of Virology if they had started the coronavirus. That's happened. <laughs> that happened. And we're just sitting back and taking it. Like, well, what, what, don't we have any self-respect? Like, this is the way they're treating us. We're giving them millions of dollars. They, clear, they, get, they get hundreds of millions of dollars from the Chinese government. And, and they, they seem to completely whitewash uh, any kind of link to China or whether this came from there. And they're, and they're not held to account. The same people are in the same jobs. And that's why I said at the start of this, and it might seem dramatic, but surely we should leave this organisation. If this is their record, if this is uh, their actions and their complete unaccountability here, their complete, their, complete, their complete almost intransigence in seeking to fix any of the errors that they have made, gross errors of judgment, that they have made, and almost, and, and if not criminal negligent activity here in regards to the inquiry they operated, why would we still be involved with them? I, I think we should have a body that coordinates on pandemics and health responses. I certainly don't think we should need to sign massive treaties or anything with them, but yes, we should have a body where people can come together and discuss these issues. They obviously have cross-border implications uh, when a pandemic occurs. But the WHO is just completely discredited. It's totally stuffed up the coronavirus. And if there is not going to be a complete flush out of the people involved in these stuff ups, uh, then we should leave it and form some other body. Let's create a new one. We can take our money with other like minded countries and set up a different body with actual accountability. Because where is the accountability now? If there are other people who won't support this inquiry, which will at least give a degree of accountability on the WHO, maybe we get them into the inquiry and ask them where's our money being spent? What's happening to it? Uh, why did you get it so wrong? We could ask these questions. If they're not going to support this small inquiry in this Senate into uh, the WHO's gross uh, errors of misjudgment in the last few years, what are they planning to do to hold them to account? Like, what, what, where is the accountability? Because any organisation that gets taxpayer-funded money from people who work hard in this country every day to pay for them, they should be held to account. They should be held to account to parliaments, to elected officials and others. Even if they had done everything right, they should still be held to account. I'd still support this inquiry if they'd done everything right, because, sure, we should, we should have an inquiry. There's been a major, major thing that's gone on in the world, and the WHO have been central to it. But they clearly have not, not got everything right. They clearly made massive errors of judgment. They've clearly, if not been directly involved in, in a cover-up uh, to the Chinese government, they should have known. They should have known Peter Daszak was doing this stuff. It was clearly and publicly available. He'd spoken about his research... Uh, on bats in, in uh, coronaviruses in bats in public fora that WHO should have known, and yet they appointed a bloke that was that was irredeemably conflicted uh, to hold the inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. We should not be funding the WHO. We should be getting out of this corrupt organisation, and we certainly, at the very least, should be doing an investigation into them. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, that's 15 minutes of my life that I'm never going to get back. But I did actually learn one thing from uh, Senator Canavan, uh, and that is this. Cookers are going to cook. That's what we learned here this evening. Yeah, yeah. Now, <clears throat> now, this is um, uh, the pandemic that we've been living through for years and we continue to live through today is an extremely serious issue. And as we continue to grapple with the ongoing challenges of this global pandemic, and as large numbers of Australians continue to die of COVID-19, it's critical that we do reflect on the lessons we learned, the mistakes that we've made, the mistakes that we continue to make, and the work that still needs to be done. I want to start by acknowledging the incredible efforts of healthcare workers over the last few years. Um, people who work in the health system, uh, whether they be support workers, doctors, nurses, first responders, all of those other essential workers who, uh, who do such a terrific uh, and a critical job of uh, looking after all of us uh, when accidents befall us or sickness uh, takes us. We need to uh, acknowledge and thank them from the bottom of our hearts because they have put their own health and safety at significant risk to look after us, to try to keep us safe and to keep our country running. And we owe them a debt of gratitude that can never truly be repaid. We also need to understand and recognise that the pandemic has exposed deep inequalities in our 
society, particularly in the areas of health care, housing and employment. And what the pandemic has revealed ultimately is that we are uh, far more uh, units in an economy than we are human beings to those uh, who govern us. And we've seen that time after time when um, basic protections for people, uh, such as income support, such as health, um, uh, health frameworks, have been, removed, have been removed in order that the economy can uh, keep on trundling along. So we have to address those issues that have been exposed by the pandemic, ripping off some of uh, the band-aids that have covered up some of the gaping chasms in our society, some of the inequalities in our community and in our economy. And we have to commit to addressing those issues and ensuring that everyone has access to the things that they need to stay healthy and to have a good life. We also need to make sure we are prepared for future pandemics because, believe me, colleagues, they will be coming down the line. And that's going to mean investing in public health infrastructure, research of things like vaccines, uh, things, like, um, things like testing for particular viruses, things like, uh, things like uh, ensuring our supply chains are resilient and our emergency and pandemic response plans are up to date. So absolutely the Australian Greens do support um, research and review of the ongoing handling of COVID and the lessons can be, that can be learned for the future. And I want to be uh, really clear about something. It really beggars belief that a Labor government is in working hard uh, to, look, to do more to look after people and to create jobs in our society by engaging in a significant retrofitting of public buildings in this country with uh, clean air standards, ensuring adequate ventilation, adequate filtration of our air, uh, and ensuring that new builds in this country comply with rigorous standards. Because one of uh, the most significant things that a government could do uh, in this space at this time is ensure that, to the greatest degree possible, the air that we are all breathing and that we rely on to survive as human beings is clean and virus-free. The Greens also support global cooperation in addressing pandemics and public health emergencies, and we believe that the World Health Organisation plays a critical role in coordinating international responses to, uh, to these crises. And we do believe that a global pandemic treaty with a focus on prevention, preparedness and response represents an important step forward in our efforts to protect public health on a global scale. Now, what is always amusing I'm glad Senator Roberts and Senator Babbitt are in the chamber. It's always amusing when we just get a little peek behind the curtain of what the cookers and the right-wing conspiracy theorists are actually worried about. Now, uh, Senator Roberts wants to put on his white coat and use the Senate's valuable time and resources to annoy public servants about the Illuminati and Agenda 21, probably the lizard people, and, uh, and we're not going to have a bar of it. And I have to say, uh, uh, acting Deputy President, it must be absolutely terrifying. Senator Roberts. To please get back to telling the truth instead of the um, impugning um, against me, please. Thank, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McKim, if, if you could not uh, impugn the, the motives of your fellow senators, that would be much appreciated. Oh, thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. As I was saying, it must be pretty terrifying being uh, Senator Roberts because. Uh, he spends so much time worried about imaginary threats that he can barely come to grips with some of the massive real challenges facing our society. Now, last week, Senator Roberts was in the chamber here carrying on about lab-grown meat. And uh, I was recalling while I was listening to him that during last year's election campaign, he defiantly posted on Twitter that he would not, and I quote, shut up and eat the bugs. Well, um, despite making some jokes about it at the time, I do want to point out to Senator Roberts, uh, through you, Acting Deputy President, that no one is trying to make Senator Roberts eat the
the bugs. I mean, eat the bugs, don't eat the bugs. The Australian Greens don't care whether you eat the bugs or not, Senator Roberts. But while we're on the subject of irrelevant rants, I would like to thank Senator Babbitt for dropping into the Senate in between making real estate deals to warn us that we actually don't Senator own McKim. DVDs anymore. Senator McKim, I oh, think um, to, ass to assist the chamber, perhaps you could withdraw that, please, and just because it does reflect upon Senator Babbitt. And I'd ask you to, to withdraw it, please. Oh, I withdraw. Thank you, um, Senator. And, and I, but I do note that Senator Babbitt did actually say um, that, uh, that we don't own DVDs anymore. Well, I, I want to say Senator Babbitt can speak for himself. He may or may not own any DVDs. I don't know. I've got plenty at home, uh, Senator Babbitt. I, I just want to say the Lord of the Rings box set on Blu-ray just looks utterly magnificent, and I do commend it to you. Um, and to the chamber. Um, but interestingly, um, Acting Deputy President, as I was coming in here, I found a, a, a top secret, a stamp top secret One Nation um, on the top. And um, I was very surprised. It's quite dynamite, this document. And when I uh, read it, uh, it turns out that this document is actually uh, a list of proposed Senate inquiries that uh, One Nation is going to push for uh, into the future. And I thought I'd share uh, some of these potential uh, Senate inquiries um, that, that One Nation want to pursue. So firstly, on this top secret document, a Senate inquiry into why one sock seems to go missing when you do the laundry. That will be a, a critical matter for this chamber uh, to inquire into a Senate inquiry into whether Elvis is alive and perhaps living in a small, bit, a small village in regional Serbia. Um, a Senate inquiry. This is actually um, going to stop. This is a barbecue stopper, Acting Deputy President. A Senate inquiry into how they just made maxi bonds smaller but are still charging the same price for them. Senator Roberts, I look forward to that one. Uh, a Senate inquiry into how there are, are like. I'll just read this. How there are like. 14 different streaming services, but you still can't find some movies on any of them. That should be uh, an, absolute, uh, an absolute beauty, uh, Senator Roberts. Uh, but this one, I think, is possibly, possibly the most critical uh, of them all. And I, I do thank Senator Roberts for um, bringing this one forward, a Senate inquiry into why you need scissors to open a packet of scissors. That one, um, Acting Deputy President, is an absolute Senator ripper. McKim, and I look forward... Senator McKim, uh, my colleague, Senator O'Sullivan. Th thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Senator's uh, reading out a list. I'm wondering if he could uh, table that, please. Senator McKim, uh, you've been asked to... Would you... Would you like well, I don't think it's, uh, well, I, 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 thank, um, I thank the Senator for, for the invitation, but I, I don't think it would be fair of me to table a top secret list uh, of One Nation's proposed Senate inquiries. But, but I, I, the last one on the list, which I think, um, I think actually um, the, the Liberal National Senators could be very constructive um, members of the inquiry into why do you have to have a go to get a go? And I think that one uh, is a critical inquiry uh, in Australian politics. And um, I, I just thank One Nation for bringing these just absolutely amazing uh, proposals before uh, the Senate. Uh, and as I said at the start of my speech, uh, what we've really found out today is that cookers are actually going to cook, despite um, what uh, the sensible people in this Senate have got to say. Uh, what I want to say in closing, um, Acting Deputy President, is that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, uh, presented us with many challenges, but uh, one of the big opportunities that it has presented us all with is an opportunity to reflect on the state of our society, um, the state of our government and the state of our economy. And it has shown us where we need to improve, um, where we need to invest, the, regula the regulatory frameworks that are missing or those that need to be beefed up. Uh, and ultimately, it's given us an opportunity to learn a giant lesson about how we need to change as a society and how politics needs to change in this country to make sure that we do more, much more, um, to look after people and support people who are ill. I want to, um, I want to give a shout out to everyone who is suffering from long COVID in this country. I want to give a shout out and uh, extend um, my deepest sympathies and those of the Australian Greens to everyone who has lost 
uh, a loved one, a family member or a friend um, as a result of COVID-19 because it is cutting a swathe through our community. Uh, life expectancy in this country and globally is plummeting and, in fact, global life expectancy is plummeting now at the fastest rate since the Great Famine of China in the early 1950s. That is the rate at which global life expectancy is currently plummeting, and it is due to this virus. It is due to COVID-19 and the global pandemic that we are all, uh, we are all living through and we will live through tragically for some time yet. What we do know is that it has revealed, amongst many other things, the critical importance of public health infrastructure, the critical importance of a robust and responsive health care system, the absolutely crucial nature of a coordinated and compassionate approach to protecting everyone in our community, but particularly those who are most vulnerable, the older people, uh, the immunocompromised people. We've also seen the devastating consequences of systemic inequality and economic injustice in this country. We've seen the devastating consequences of a precarious and underpaid workforce and of a lack of investment in the education and training of healthcare professionals. And as we move forward, we have to make sure that we learn the lessons of this pandemic. Invest in our people invest in public health infrastructure, give more people permanent, secure work with paid sick leave, invest in healthcare workers and invest in the social safety net that protects the most vulnerable people in our community. I mean, <clears throat> Job Seeker was doubled for a brief and beautiful time during the pandemic by a Liberal National Government, I might add, and I my office was flooded with testimonials from people who said for the first time, in some cases in years, they could actually put food on the table and pay the power bill in the same fortnight. And for those who have never um, laboured under those kind of financial stresses, and I actually have laboured under them for a brief period when I was younger, they are terrible, um, they are terrible pressures to have to bear on a day-to-day -day basis, and we should be doing much, much more to ensure that JobSeeker allows people to live a dignified life. We've got to ensure that our economy is resilient and adaptable and that it provides good jobs and fair wages and it supports the small businesses and workers who are the lifeblood of our communities. And we've got to do it all with a clear-eyed focus on the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead. This pandemic has actually demonstrated very clearly that everything is interconnected. We are all interconnected. The jobs people do are interconnected. The pastimes people enjoy are interconnected. Our families, our communities, the economy, our society, the environment, the climate are all interconnected. Our fates are intertwined and our actions can have far-reaching consequences, not just on ourselves, but on everyone in our communities. And ultimately, what the pandemic has shown us is that collectivism will win the day. We have to work together. We have to listen to each other. We have to support each other. We have to love each other. And we have to approach our collective future with hope, with determination and with resilience. Question be put. So, just so colleagues are aware that because we are past 6.30, if a division is required, it will be deferred until tomorrow. So the minister has moved a procedural motion that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. So uh, that, is, that procedural motion has passed. I will now put the substantive motion, which is the motion moved by Senator Roberts in relation to a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. 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 Well, clearly a division is required uh, and that will be deferred until tomorrow. So now I move on 
to the next item, which is business of the Senate number three from Senator O'Sullivan. Oh, I'm going to call the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in the name of Senator O'Sullivan, proposing a reference to the Finance and Public Administration References Committee. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Acting. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave to amend business of the Senate notice of motion number three relating to a ref, uh, referral to the Finance Public Administration References Committee. Is leave granted? Mm -hmm. Leave is granted. Senator O'Sullivan. I amend the motion as set out on the amendment circulated in the chamber. Uh, I move the motion as amended. Okay, Senator O'Sullivan, you have the call. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the, the, the origin of this reference uh, came up during the debate that we were having on the mechanism bill last week uh, for the referendum. And uh, in the committee stage of that debate, uh, we were going backwards and forwards with the minister, Minister Farrell, uh, in relation to many questions about how uh, this upcoming referendum will be conducted, the, the role of the AEC uh, in that, uh, and, uh, and the minister was um, uh, was answering questions. Uh, there were a lot of questions, though, that he uh, was not really able to sufficiently answer, uh, which was surprising because he is he's not just the uh, minister that's representing someone from the other place. Uh, he is the special minister of state. Uh, so you know, it's often understandable for the minister to turn and uh, get advice from uh, from those that are sitting in the advisers box, uh, but we, we saw it a lot last week, um, not wanting to reflect on uh, Minister Farrell, but it was, uh, it was difficult to, to, get, uh, um, to, to get, get some uh, detailed answers on, on the conduct of the upcoming referendum. And, and so I put the question to Senator Farrell, uh, asked that he would make himself available, uh, oh, sorry, make uh, the uh, or, uh, put in motion a, a, a mechanism to be able to make the commissioner uh, for the Australian Electoral Commission available to be able to, uh, to, be, to, be able to uh, take questions, very detailed questions, about the upcoming referendum. And, uh, and he, uh, he agreed in the chamber uh, that he would do that. And so I very much appreciated that. I very much appreciated uh, him agreeing to, to do that. Uh, I then put together this uh, terms of reference that we have in front of us today, and I understand the Labor Party will be supporting uh, this reference, and, and I, I do thank them very much indeed for for that, because there are there are some serious questions that needed to be asked. Uh, in particular, this reference deals with. I appreciate there will be you know, further inquiry into the substantive legislation on the actual question, uh, but this goes to the, the mechanism and and the, uh, in particular, the role uh, that potentially foreign interference could play in the outcome of the, uh, of the, the referendum. And uh, uh, Senator Patterson was asking some very pertinent questions about uh, what role the AEC will be able to play in the absence of a yes and a no campaign, uh, because there's no sort of font of wisdom, if you like, on, uh, on the, on, you know, to reference on either the, the yes or the no points. And so social media uh, platforms won't have those reference points and so it's going to be difficult for them to be able to make a call on whether or not uh, a, 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 a position being put out on social media is in fact truth or not truth on the point of either yes or no. And so uh, the, these are very serious points and uh, um, Senator Farrell, uh, said with confidence that, uh, that the AEC will just be able to do that, that the AEC uh, are in a position to be able to, uh, to, be able to make those calls and, and can be relied on that the social media platforms will be able to, I guess, rely maybe on them uh, to be able to uh, uh, make an adjudicated call on, on what's in or out in, in this debate. And, uh, so we want to test that. Uh, we, we want to test with the with the commissioner, uh, their capacity to be able to to be able to do that, uh, and it's very important that we get this right. It's very important that this is uh, that this is is right because 
you know, the, the government's uh, decision to, to, to push ahead um, on this referendum is, um, you know, it, obviously the substantive question is, is very, very important, but we've got to make sure that the referendum is conducted in a way that is transparent and fair. And so it's absolutely critical that the processes that we have surrounding this upcoming referendum is, uh, is, is very sound indeed. So I do thank the government for agreeing to, uh, well, we'll see, uh, but I'm sure they're going to follow through with the, the negotiations we've had, uh, but that they will um, they'll, they'll support this reference. Uh, a short and sharp, uh, quick inquiry into this, uh, into this point is, is, is all that's really required and, and uh, very much appreciate that. Um, you know, the, the, risks, the risks associated with, with poorly regulating donation disclosures, in particular uh, with foreign interference, were, were the key reasons that the coalition had strongly advocated for the designation of the official yes and no campaign. Uh, having an official yes and no campaign will make things simpler for the regulatory environment and for the proper conduct of a referendum. Uh, now, there's no special law relating to foreign donations. The, the AEC has given evidence to parliamentary committees that the donation and disclosure regime remains the most complex part of the, the Electoral Act. And, and again, without that yes, official yes and no camp, campaign organisation, uh, there are some very serious and detailed questions that we want to put to the Commission as to how they will go about ensuring the integrity of this referendum, uh, in relate, particularly in relation to donations uh, so that, and expenditure, uh, so that we can be absolutely confident as a nation that there isn't, in fact, any foreign interference in Australia's decision here. This is Australia's document, the, the Constitution, and it, and it should be Australians that are... Uh, only Australians should be the ones that are influencing the debate in this country on this referendum, and so it's, it's absolutely critical that we get it right. Uh, so we'll be uh, applying, um, we want to see that the, the regime in this referendum and, and, uh, and to participants who are not regularly involved in elections, uh, that, that there is a proper regime put in place. An official campaign structure is going to be the best way for regulators to ensure appropriate education and enforcement of the electoral laws for the referendum. So, again, having a single point of coordination to provide education and to commence any audit process for donations or foreign interference is the best way to ensure the integrity of, of the referendum. So this inquiry will go to that. It will look at the, uh, the detail as to how that could be uh, assured, and, uh, and it's very, very important. And we know th th this isn't just... You know, the, the risk of foreign interference is not just something um, that's just thought up in a in a in a in a flurry uh, in a, in the course of a debate in on on legislation. The, the Director General of ASIO only three weeks ago told Australians that we're seeing a, the, a, an increase, the greatest level of foreign interference in Australia's history right now. Right now, this is this is happening in our country right now. So surely we should look at simple practical measures that put structure around this process and help our regulators and our agencies manage this referendum. We, we know that there's been foreign interference in, in other countries around the world in their elections in, in different forum. And uh, in Canada, their intelligence agencies have uncovered plots to interfere in their 2021 election in order to create a minority government. And uh, it, it might be that you know foreign uh, actors, uh, they may not particularly care about the outcome of the referendum in terms of whether Australians vote yes or no, but they might actually be quite interested in sowing discord, discord in the within the uh, within the debate to just create a little bit of mayhem, and uh, and it, and that in itself is uh, is enough to, for us to be concerned. Um, but there are there are some serious issues that. Uh, you know, some other colleagues will, will go into as well. But I think uh, you know, uh, uh, dealing with this is, is absolutely critical. A, a good friend of mine who happened to be following the debate last week and, uh, and heard Senator Farrell uh, 
uh, make the, the commitment that, that they would allow this inquiry, um, contacted me, um, uh, Jack, Jacqueline Martin, who, who I've come to trust as someone that uh, is, uh, is someone that should be relied on with passing on good information, and, and she uh, pointed out to me that this is absolutely critical. And so uh, I uh, urge the Senate to unanimously get behind this, uh, this inquiry. Let's get it done uh, in a civil way, as we do in these sort of inquiries, and, and let's work it through and, and get it through as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will think I have to go to, to, to the minister first. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Referendum Machinery Provisions Amendment Bill 2022 was recently considered by this chamber. That bill, which has now passed both houses, replicates the same restrictions on foreign donations and campaigning that apply to federal elections. That means, thanks to work by a Labor government, the referendum legislation will prohibit referendum entities from, seeking, from receiving gifts of $100 or more from foreign donors. It will prohibit foreign persons and entities from authorising referendum material and prohibit foreign persons and entities from fundraising or directly incurring referendum expenditure of $1,000 or more in a financial year. As this most recent legislation confirms, it is the Labor Party who leads electoral reform in this country, and this includes protecting our democracy from foreign influence and interference. The Albanese government takes the integrity of electoral events, including referendums, very seriously. It's important that Australians can have confidence in the conduct and outcomes of our electoral processes. Our government has an appetite for more electoral reform this term. However, we recognise that electoral reform is best when it is broadly supported across the parliament, as we saw with the recent referendum machinery legislation. And broad, considered and genuine consultation works best for electoral reform. This term, Labor will be focused on lowering the disclosure threshold for donations to a fixed $1,000, reining it in from the current disclosure threshold of $15,200. The Special Minister of State is also committed to delivering a mechanism for pursuing truth in political advertising within Australia's electoral arrangements. Both these issues need careful consideration and are currently before the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters. When that committee reports back on its review of the 2022 federal election, the Special Minister of State will be keenly considering how we can implement these electoral reforms most effectively. Coming back to the motion at hand, Senators will be pleased to know about structures already in place. Currently, the Australian Electoral Commission works with other federal government agencies to ensure that Australian electoral systems are secure and resilient to threats of physical or cyber disruption and foreign interference. In 2018, the AEC established the Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force to safeguard the integrity of our elections from threats, including foreign interference. This task force is comprised of relevant agencies across federal government working together to provide information and advice to the Electoral Commissioner on matters relating to the integrity of the process of federal elections and referendums. Um, there are a range of federal portfolios that are members of that task force across a range of different departments, including the AEC, Department of Finance, Australian Signals Directorate, Office of National Intelligence and a number of others. The task force is also supported by members of the national intelligence community as required. Members of that task force consult with online media platforms, including prior electoral events, including referenda and have also established escalation processes uh, for the referral of content in breach of Commonwealth legislation or the social media platform's terms of service. Agencies that participate in the task force are already working to provide appropriate support to protect the integrity of the proposed referendum, including from foreign actors. Senators will be pleased to know that on 26 July last year, the Australian Electoral Commissioner released a public media statement confirming that task force agencies did not identify any foreign interference or any other interference that compromised the delivery of the 2022 federal election and would undermine the confidence of the Australian people in the results of the election. The government will continue to work through the members of the task force on risks to the integrity of the referendum, including the threat of foreign interference, to ensure the public can continue to have confidence in the conduct and outcome of this and other electoral events. 
Senators will also be familiar with the work that was done by the Australian Electoral Commission during the last federal election to counter mis- and disinformation. Ahead of the last election, in response to an estimates question, the AEC advised uh, the AEC federal election advertising campaign budgeted $615,000, excluding GST, for media placement to deliver disinformation awareness messages to voters via digital media channels across the election period. Further, uh, that the AEC would also undertake a range of proactive media, resources and public relations activities to further promote and distribute disinformation awareness messages as part of the Stop and Consider campaign. We anticipate the AEC will build on its capabilities in this area as we head into the upcoming referendum. Uh, so, With that small contribution, I am happy to indicate that the government will be supporting this motion. Senator Waters, and then I'm going to go to Senator Scar. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. The Australian Greens have long supported efforts to minimise foreign influence on our democracy, whether through regulating donations from foreign entities, addressing online disinformation or calling out investor state dispute settlement clauses in free trade agreements that stop the Australian government acting in the interests of Australians. We will not oppose the referral proposed by this motion, but we are not convinced that there is any justification for a stand-alone inquiry into foreign interference in the context of the referendum. It is an issue that is much more appropriately dealt with through a broad review of foreign influence over the political process. As I will set out shortly, many of these issues are already being investigated, and a standalone inquiry risks ad hoc solutions rather than comprehensive ones. The Australian Greens did not oppose the Electoral Legislation Amendment Electoral Funding and Disclosure Reform Act, also known as the EFDR Act, made five years ago, once the chilling effect of the original bill on public interest advocacy was defeated. But we did point out at that time that the bill would fail to achieve its ostensible purpose of preventing foreign interference unless it included stronger measures to reduce the corrupting influence of all political donations. Our concerns were confirmed by the four-year review of those changes conducted by JSCAM last year. Expert, witness, expert witnesses to the review said that the EFDR Act was not effectively curtailing foreign influence, given ongoing opportunities for foreign companies and individuals to channel donations through Australian resident or local companies. The then government pointed to anti-avoidance provisions, but Professor Anne Toomey said, and I quote, it's not an anti-avoidance issue. If it's, and it's not a question of the AEC having the ability to do anything, it's simply the way the Act operates. I'm sure all of us would think it would be preferable if it didn't operate that way, but as I pointed out, the reason it does is constitutional constraints that are a result of earlier High Court decisions. And given that we can't get around them without an amendment to the Constitution and we have to live with them, the only way I can see of reducing foreign influence is by reducing everybody's influence." End quote. The Australian Greens agree. The clearest way to minimise the influence of foreign donations is to limit the influence of all political donations. Experts have said it and experts will keep saying it. But Despite these concerns, the then Liberal Chaired Committee held quote, that the relevant parts of the Act are working effectively. The Australian political system continues to be a successful exemplar democracy that is looked on with admiration by many others around the world, end quote, and no changes were made. The Greens have consistently called for all political donations over $1,000 to be disclosed in real time so that the voters can see who is funding campaigns. And that is, in fact, last time I checked, Labor's own policy. Yet neither Labor nor the Liberals supported the Greens' amendments just last week to reduce the donations threshold or to require real time disclosure of donations during the referendum. It's almost like the coalition wants to exploit the public's appetite for more transparency and fears around the foreign interference to point to foreign donations as the bad guy rather than good old-fashioned domestic donations from corporate mates, lobbyists and the cosy relationship between the big parties and industry. So, What are the issues that this motion wants us to investigate? Well, the motion proposes to ask the Finance and Public Administration Committee to look at measures to protect against foreign actors seeking to influence the outcome or public debate. And remember, this is in relation to the referendum. And the potential application of foreign donations laws to the referendum and its participants. 
Well, the referendum machinery provisions amendment bill that we passed in this place last week included provisions that brought the referendum into line with existing electoral laws, prohibiting the authorisation of materials by foreign campaigners, preventing the giving or receiving of gifts over $100 from foreign entities and restricting referendum spending by foreign entities. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters or JSCAM examined the bill and the issues referred to in the motion including the application of the Foreign Interference Transparency Scheme. The bill was subject to rigorous, some might say ad nauseum, debate in the Senate last week that went to those concerns. The AEC has mechanisms in place to ensure compliance with restrictions on foreign interference, and there is nothing to suggest that those compliance measures will apply any differently to disclosures during the referendum. The motion nonetheless also invites the FPA committee to examine detection, mitigation and obstruction of potential dissemination of disinformation, including via social media. There is already an FPA committee inquiring into foreign influence through social media. That inquiry is ongoing and it's due to report in August of this year. It is unclear why any questions that the Liberals seek to have answered about those issues will not already be considered through that inquiry and why a referendum-specific inquiry is required. The JSCAM inquiry into the 2022 election is already examining the broader issue of disinformation in political communications and the need for truth in political advertising. The Greens want to see those measures in place and we wanted to see those measures in place prior to the referendum, which is why we moved amendments to that effect last week and sadly got no support from the large parties. But without such laws applying to all political communications, there's no reason to single out communications about the referendum for a separate inquiry. It's standard practice for the minister to invite JSCEM to review the conduct of an election to identify any issues that have arisen. The same should happen with this referendum. As I said at the outset, the Greens support measures to address any undue influence with our democracy, whether that's from foreign actors or big local donors. But I'll repeat the words of Professor Anne Toomey. The only way I can see of reducing foreign influence is by reducing everybody's influence. Now, we will not stand in the way of this inquiry, but what is abundantly clear is that we need action on donations reform, not yet another inquiry. We'd rather not waste more time and resources getting the same experts to say the same things. Instead, let's listen to them and make some changes. Unfortunately, the referendum bill debate last week was an exercise in ignoring what the experts have said and delaying action. The Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters took evidence bless you, about the importance of increasing enrolment and engagement in the referendum, particularly for First Nations and other disenfranchised communities. We heard from the Australian Electoral Commission, from land councils, from academics and advocates. Everyone talked about the need for action to maximise the number of people who could vote. Everyone recommended measures to boost enrolment and voter turnout, including on the day enrolment and continuing, to secure, uh, continuing the secure phone, phone voting. Also amendments that the Greens moved that did not receive the support of either of the big parties last week. We've heard over and over from stakeholders that on the day enrolment and provisional voting will have a significant impact on the number of people able to cast a vote on referendum day. And we heard that the provisional voting measures manage any risk of fraud by ensuring that voters are only added to the formal count after the usual checks are made by the AEC. And finally, we had a JSCAM report that accepted that evidence and recommended measures to increase enrolment. JSCAM supported that change. The AEC supported that change. The evidence from states and territories who already have on the day enrolment supported the change. There was absolutely no rational argument against making the change, redressing decades of disenfranchisement and giving the most number of people the chance to vote in the referendum. And yet both the Labor Party and the Coalition refused to make that change. They said it needed more consideration, that JSCAM would consider it again at a later date, another inquiry rather than action. Repeated inquiries into constitutional reform and referenda have recommended scrapping or modernising the provisions for preparing the yes and no pamphlets. 
experts consistently called across three separate inquiries for an independent panel to review the text or other measures to ensure that the content was clear and accurate. And yet, both the Labor Party and the Coalition voted against amendments put forward by my crossbench colleagues to achieve exactly that. What is the point of yet more inquiries when we already know the answers and you just don't like them? This referendum is an, is an historic opportunity to give voice to First Nations communities on decisions that affect them and to put Australia on a path to, tr to treaty and to truth-telling. It's an opportunity to right past wrongs and, and the ongoing impacts of colonisation, to actually close the gap and embed self-determination. That's what the focus should be. Now, as I said, the Greens will not oppose this inquiry, but we do question the need for it. The answer to tackling undue influence is strong donations reform across the board. Let's just get on and do it. Thank you. I, no, I, I was calling Senator Scar. Well, I'd given an indication to the chamber. Um, I will go to the minister. If, if you insist, if you, it's, you were foreshadowed, Senator Brown. I'm sorry, Senator uh, Scar. I wasn't in the chamber when that, uh, when you indicated that. But I move that the motion be put. We do try to be a collegiate place, Senator Brown. Um, the minister has moved a procedural motion that the motion be put. Um, uh, so it's past 6:30. So there won't be a division. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. Uh, the noes have it, but because there is a um, no divisions, this will be deferred until uh, tomorrow. So I'm in the hands of the chamber, so I believe that I'm calling the clerk. Government business orders of the day number one: National Reconstruction Fund Corporation Bill 2023, a resumption of second reading debate, and the amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson. I think Senator Hanson Young. In, sorry, Senator Hanson Young, you're in continuation. Thank you. I'm not quite sure how many minutes I have left, so I'll wait for the clock to be. I don't know myself, but I'm yeah. sure no, the. Okay. Well, we're obviously debating uh, this particular uh, bill uh, this evening. This is we've had a lot of contributions. Um, this is an important uh, infrastructure uh, fund, but thank goodness that the Greens were able to get the amendments uh, we have uh, and a commitment from the government that we have to ensure that this money won't be uh, flowing to any fossil fuel companies or those that want to destroy our native forests. Because if we are honest about the type of manufacturing and infrastructure and smart jobs of the future we need in this country, it's not with the old, uh, century-old uh, economies such as uh, the fossil fuel industry or uh, knocking down our native forests and uh, n in no way uh, adding to the high value of our manufacturing footprint. It is essential that we get smarter about how we support manufacturing in this country, what type of manufacturing uh, we need and where we invest. And it's got to be those highly skilled jobs that value add to uh, the, the products and the services uh, that we need. We need to be looking at how we ensure that we have our own supply chains that we can rely on uh, at times when, you know, heaven forbid, we're facing again another uh, COVID uh, or, or global pandemic. Um, if there was anything that the global pandemic taught us, it was that we'd gotten lazy that the last decade of uh, lack of funding, uh, disregard, lack of support for the manufacturing industry uh, over, uh, that, that, let's be honest, they were, they, they were disenfranchised and undermined because the government of the day was too busy looking after their fossil fuel mates. That's what was going on. And so rather than investing in smart manufacturing in this country, the real jobs for Australians, we saw the government simply putting their hand in the pocket of taxpayers and handing it over 
uh, to big coal, gas and even, uh, let's, let's be honest, even native forest logging. So we need to put an end to that. The Greens amendment does that. That's fantastic. Uh, but what we need to get on with now is how we genuinely support that smart manufacturing uh, in our, uh, around the country. And here is the pitch that we need for South Australia, and that is manufacturing the electric car revolution in this country. I want to see electric cars being built in Adelaide. I want to see a, um, a manufacturing uh, community, industry in my state, that helps to drive the decarbonised economy that we know we desperately need for the future. We are on the brink of climate crisis. It is already here, and we need to get smarter Point about the things we make. Uh, sorry. So you're drawing attention to the state of the chamber. So quorum has been called. And then I'll come to you, Senator Tyrrell. Quorum is present. Senator Tyrrell has the call. Senator Tyrrell, thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Appreciate it. I rise to speak on the National Reconstruction Fund Bill. I believe in supporting Australian businesses so they can make things here in Australia. Australian made means Australian jobs. It's even better if things are made in my home state of Tasmania instead of on the mainland. I also believe in giving Australian businesses the best opportunity to innovate. This, is, this not only creates jobs here at home, but it also prevents our best and brightest from going overseas to find a more favourable environment to do their important and exciting work. This bill is pretty good, but there are some pretty obvious problems that I think are really important to clean up before this bill is passed. The bill establishes a National Reconstruction Fund corporation. The functions of the corporation are investing and liaising with stakeholders about this investment. Pretty light on the detail here, don't you think? The Minister for Industry and Science has been banging on about how this $15 billion fund will make Australia a global leader in high-value manufacturing. Fun fact, this bill doesn't mention the word manufacturing once. What happens when the government changes its mind or there's a new government? This $15 billion slush fund could be used for anything, maybe even some car parks or a shooting range in the minister's electorate. I think the government should make the purpose of this fund clearer in the legislation. The bill establishes a board. The board will decide the strategies and policies to be followed by the corporation and will ensure the performance of the corporation's functions. The board has four to six members, and these members must have experience or expertise in certain fields. Under its current drafting, you could end up with four lawyers deciding how to spend $15 billion or four bankers. No offence to the lawyers and bankers out there, though, but I don't think that's a great idea. 
I prefer if it was necessary for there to be board representation across a range of fields. And I'd go one step further and add an area of expertise that is currently missing. We need the board to have representatives who work in the commercialisation of research. Isn't that what this fund is really about? The bill also gives the ministers a power to make an investment mandate. And this legislative instrument would allow the ministers to give directions to the board about investment functions or investment powers. Again, this is pretty broad. At the moment, the bill doesn't identify areas for funding. I think that's good. It gives the ministers some flexibility and allows for innovation. But we do need to ensure, to the extent that we can, that there's continuity in these investments, even if there is a change of government. The last thing we want is for a board to set itself on some particular path involving some particular priority area, only for there to be a cabinet reshuffle in 12 months' time. And there's a new minister. And the new minister says to the board, forget all that other stuff, here's what you need to invest in now. It shouldn't be that easy to tear up every contract of a $15 billion fund. The areas the fund is supposed to invest in should be set slowly, deliberately and strategically. You want there to be a forward plan for investments. You want there to be some sense of a timeline. If the board sees opportunities coming down the pipeline that aren't there yet, aren't there right now, it should be able to flag those early. So firms know that the fund is taking an active interest in helping them. If this fund is going to be successful, it's not going to be by taking advantage of opportunities that are already there in businesses that are already flourishing. It's going to be by using its might to say to the market, we've got a gap here. And if you're prepared to take a risk to plug that gap, we're going to back you. But companies can't have confidence that the message from the fund's board will still be the same 12 months from now. If they don't know what the fund's priorities will be 12 months from now, to have confidence, to encourage investment, you need stability. You need consistency. And you don't get that by giving every minister from here until the end of time the opportunity to completely turn on a dime a $15 billion fund because they had a bright idea idea in the shower that morning. You can have stability and still be agile. You can still act quick, but act consistently. That's the goal. You get that by having the flexibility to change your pace, but the rigidity to keep on the track. That's why we want the board to set its own strategic direction. The board are the experts in the room, not the government. There's another issue that I've been talking about, and that's the, the deal the government did with the Greens in the other place to apparently get them over the line on this bill. The Greens amended the bill so that the fund would not directly finance the logging of native forests. This deal is a broken promise from the Prime Minister to Tasmania. And no, I'm not just being dramatic. During the election last year, the then opposition leader, Anthony Albanese, wrote an open letter to the Tasmanian forest industry. He said that the Liberals are engaging in a scare campaign by saying that Labor will listen to the Greens on forestry. He confirmed he would support native forest harvesting. They're great words when you're trying to win an election. But at the first opportunity, Labor have folded to the Greens on this one. I won't apologise for pointing that out. For looking after industry in my patch. The Jackie Lambie Network proudly supports the Tasmanian forestry industry, and we aren't going to tolerate anything that puts it at risk, directly or indirectly. It's in that spirit that I'm foreshadowing an amendment on sheet 1844. The government told me that this amendment won't affect investment in native forest-related projects. It's not that I don't trust the government, but I'd like the bill to make this very clear. I want the bill to clearly state that companies who engage in other activities, as well as native logging, can still receive funding from the fund, like Hojra would in Tasmania. It's logging native trees. They're under the water service of Lake Pyman on our west coast. Those trees are drowned. They are being salvaged in one of the world's first underwater forestry operations. It's technology we're innovating to salvage product that would otherwise rot in darkness, and we're turning it into manufactured products that sell to the world. That is the sort of thing that this fund should be able to support with investment, but instead a Tasmanian manufacturer is locked out of the National Reconstruction Fund. Is this really what the Greens intended when they were drafting their amendment to stop companies like Hydrowood? because that's what their amendment does. It stops a company that is salvaging native trees from underneath the lake surface, surface, trees that would otherwise rot and release carbon into the atmosphere, from being converted into products that sequester carbon for decades. No living trees are logged. No carbon emissions are released. No fossil fuels are extracted, yet no investment is possible. 
My amendment clarifies that, for the purpose of companies like Hydrowood, investment is possible. The Greens say this amendment would water down the effect of their amendment. The government says this amendment wouldn't. One of them is wrong. If it's the Greens, then there is no downside to supporting this amendment. If it's the government, then this amendment is a guardrail against companies being prohibited from investment by accident. If the Greens amendment has the potential to extend way beyond what is intended, then that should be fixed, so this bill doesn't end up locking out companies doing good work. Finally, the bill appears to be doubling up with some other funds. There's the Medical Research Future Fund. There's the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. There's the Medical Research Endowment Account. I asked about this in question time last sitting period, and the response I received wasn't very convincing. At the moment, it looks like these funds and the NRF could be bidding against each other. This blind bidding of one government fund against another could drive up costs. What a waste to the taxpayer this would be. I've expressed my concerns to the government, and I think it's up to them to clean this up. As outlined, I've put forward some reasonable suggestions on how to make this bill better. My proposed suggestions will help strengthen the integrity of the fund and prevent wastage of taxpayer money. I hope the government agrees. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. Senator McKim. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, as uh, all senators know, the National Reconstruction Fund will set aside $15 billion to help us rebuild an industrial base in our country. And uh, it is beyond doubt that uh, our manufacturing sector has declined significantly over recent decades. And uh, it would be fantastic to see Australia become uh, a bit more of a country where things are actually made rather than just uh, a hole in the ground or a whole bunch of forests uh, that we export the raw materials from and they're evaluated uh, somewhere else in the world. And I can say from my home state of uh, Tasmania, and you know, we've just heard from Senator Tyrrell, and I thank Senator Tyrrell for her, for her contribution and for putting up an amendment um, for the consideration of the Senate, but uh, I've sat and watched our native forests just absolutely destroyed for many, many decades, the overwhelming majority of them to be exported for wood chips and as whole logs. And if uh, you know, I can see Senator Hughes shaking her head over there uh, on the Liberal benches, but I say to Senator Hughes and anyone else, go and have a look at the wood chip pile on the Burnie Wharf. Go and have a look at the whole, the stacks of whole logs on the Hobart Wharf. They are massive. Like there are literally um, tens, and probably in the case of uh, burning hundreds of thousands of tonnes of our beautiful native forest. I have seen that Burnie wood chip pile glowing, uh, glowing pink from the myrtle wood chips that have been piled on that pile. I see the best logs out of our native forest exported as whole logs to the, to the peeler mills in other countries, exporting jobs, exporting uh, our forests, uh, massive carbon bombs, uh, a massive destruction of our landscape um, for the enrichment of a few and the impoverishment of uh, most of the rest of our beautiful state of Tasmania. So uh, make no mistake, um, Acting Deputy Speaker, native forest logging does not have a social licence. It is a carbon bomb and it is a mendicant industry, a mendicant industry, that can only survive due to ongoing taxpayer subsidies. Let me tell you one thing, colleagues. If you pulled all the public subsidies out of Australia's native forest logging industry, it would finish the next morning. The next morning it would be over, because it is the taxpayer who is subsidising the profits of the corporations that are driving the destruction of our native forests and the massive emission of, carbons, uh, of carbon and carbon equivalent gases that that involves. So uh, we're very proud in the Australian Greens of the, of the amendments that we have negotiated, which make it clear that none of the money— Thank you, Senator McKim. You will be in continuation. I propose the Senate started. now adjourn, and I call Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy President.
Today I rise to acknowledge a historic moment in this nation's history, the establishment of the inaugural First Nations Voice to Parliament in my home state of South Australia. Yesterday, during a special sitting of both houses of the South Australian Parliament on a Sunday, the Malinowskis Labor government made history and became the first jurisdiction in this country to pass a bill to enshrine a voice for First Nations people into a parliament, the State Parliament of South Australia. The body has been set up to advise the parliament on issues directly affecting them so those First Nations people can speak directly to decision makers about the issues that are going to impact them. It was a very, very emotional day, and after the bill had passed both houses, it was carried out onto the steps of the parliament where it was signed into law. There were a number of people there who were very overcome with the emotion of the event and I particularly was overcome by the unity of the event. So many people coming together to celebrate a deeply historical moment. There were tears, there was laughter, there were hugs, there was singing. There were all ages there, from tiny babies to very old elders of our community. And I was so proud to stand there to see all of the work of various elements of the community in South Australia coming together to celebrate something they've spent so long looking for, so long fighting for. It has been the result of hard, hard work over many years by the First Nations community in South Australia and those of us non-Indigenous people who choose to walk alongside them. I would like to pay my respects to the South Australian First Nations communities for all that they have done. And I'm particularly proud of my good friend, Kaim Ma, who is the South Australian Attorney General and the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, who has thrown his life and energy into this for so many years now. The adoption of a First Nations voice to Parliament in South Australia represents a major step forward in acknowledging and recognising the significant and unique position of First Nations people in our society. In the words of the South Australian Premier, South Australia had a proud history of welcoming people from other cultures. But the people who provided the great care and custodianship of the land for the past 65,000 years have been left behind. And as Kaya Ma went on to say in his address, in decades and centuries gone by, the laws of our state and the colony that preceded it have done much to deliberately disadvantage, disempower and disenfranchise Aboriginal people. And today, I'm quoting, today we use those, those laws to do the exact opposite. South Australia has led the nation by legislating for a First Nations voice. And there really wasn't much of a dry eye in the House um, after the speeches and the, the symbolism. There was, it was just such a moving situation to stand there, to be part of that celebration and to see what I think is an issue that will, or a, a resolution that will make a fundamental difference. We have seen government after government setting policies that don't gel, that don't achieve the outcomes that they are set up to achieve. And this way we get First Nations people for whom the policies are going to affect, providing their feedback, their input, their concerns directly to those people who are developing those policies, who are drafting various legislation. And I think this is going to make a fundamental difference. So, obviously later this year we'll get a chance to um, engage in a referendum on whether we wish to have a voice to parliament, First Nations voice to parliament, federally. And I would urge everyone to get behind it. 
This is such an important moment thank you, for Senator our Brogan. nation. The time, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, President. The announcement earlier this month by the Federal Treasurer that the Commonwealth Grants Commission is currently undertaking a review of the distribution, GST distribution, has put a shudder through the entire state of Western Australia. Contributing to this concern are the recent comments from the newly elected Premier from New South Wales, Chris Minns, who flagged a showdown with all governments on the current GST deal. Just over a week ago, Mr Minns claimed New South Wales were entitled to more, and this is an implicit criticism of the current arrangement. It's all up for negotiation in the next few years, and I'm not going to take a backward step, he said, from the perspective of taxpayers in this state. Now, Western Australia has not easily forgotten the dark old, aids, old days of when our state was holding on to just 30 cents in the dollar, when important infrastructure projects could not be properly funded because WA was missing out on its, GS, on its distribution of the GST carve-up. Some said it wouldn't change, that it was just about impossible to do anything about WA missing out on what was rightfully ours. A better GST deal. Well, I remember the member for Burt saying that when uh, that the then coalition government would not implement any change to the GST formula. In fact, in 2018, in February, he said, whatever the Productivity Commission does, they, the government, will not implement those changes. Trying to get any changes through is almost politically impossible, he said. In the land of the pigs might fly. Well, Member for Burt, the pigs did fly. All Western Australians remember that it was the coalition government that delivered for the people of Western Australia a fair and equitable GST deal. It was a coalition government which ensured that Western Australians receive a minimum 70 cents in the dollar of GST revenue, increasing to 75 cents in 24-25. Now, without the sensible and pragmatic intervention of the previous, of the previous government, coalition government, WA's GST revenue would have fallen to 16 cents in the dollar in 2022-23 and 10 cents in 2023-24. 10 cents! Now, Liberal senators from Western Australia they are not going to take a backward step in defending our GST share. We will fight lock, stock and barrel to prevent Western Australians from being worse off. Those hard-fought changes must be preserved. Now, President Kennedy once remarked that victory has a thousand fathers and defeat is an orphan. Now, many people claimed uh, to have fixed WA's GST problem. Uh, even the member for Burt claims that. But history will record that it was the WA federal Liberal team who fought to raise the importance of the issue before the member for Cook. And it was the member for Cook as treasurer who changed it and delivered real improvements for Western Australians. Now, I wasn't a senator back then, so I can't claim the credit. But I, so I stand here on the shoulders of my colleagues and friends who fought gallantly for the GST fix. And in particular, Senators Cormann, Cash, Smith, and I believe it was Senator Back back then, and of course Senator Reynolds, who's still here. Western Australians will take a very dim view of any federal government who seeks to alter the existing arrangements and dilute Western Australia's fair share of the national GST distribution. You only have to ask the question, why is it that the Treasurer, why is it that the Treasurer has commissioned a review into this, commissioned a review into looking at the GST arrangements? You don't commission a review like this if you aren't intent on changing it. Our Senator Cox. President, tonight I want to speak on the recent IPCC report specifically about the impacts of climate change on First Nations people. First Nations people are not, o not only in Australia but across the world, have cared for country for thousands of years. We've lived in harmony with the land, water, plants, animals and seasons. We use what was available to us to create thriving and vibrant communities which have endured in Australia for over 65,000 years. This is our way of life and it's our culture. It is something that we hold on to closely 
as a way not only to connect us with our culture but to connect us with the land and sea and also with our ancestors. This is in our blood and it is our sovereign birthright. Changing weather patterns, increased extreme weather events, rising sea levels put our culture at risk. We have already seen my brothers and sisters in the Torres Strait Islands having to, re having to build makeshift seawalls with coconut husks and driftwood whilst walking along the beach with a bucket to pick up the remains of their loved ones that have been exposed during, due to the rising sea levels. This year, First Nations communities have been displaced, forced to flee their country and being separated from their communities in Western Australia and in the Northern Territory, following catastrophic flood events. The IPCC report found that increasing extreme climate events will impact food and water security and global ecosystems, which will have a greater impact on First Nations people. Further, responses that focus on sectors or risks in isolation, <clears throat> such as building seawalls, can worsen existing equities, especially for Indigenous people and marginalised groups, and decrease ecosystems and biodiversity resilience. And that this can be avoided by flexible, multi-sectorial, inclusive, long-term planning and implementation of adaptation actions with code benefits to many sectors and systems. We know that climate change is not an isolated issue that only impacts on certain areas, sectors or communities. It is wide-reaching and will impact on all of us, but there are people who will be impacted more and impacted quicker than others. Time and time again we've been told that it will be the ones who have contributed the least to climate change that will be in fact impacted the most. This includes First Nations people across the world, small island nations and poorer nations. The report states that cooperation and inclusive decision making with Indigenous people and local communities, as well as recognition of their inherent rights of Indigenous people, is integral to successful adaptation and mitigation across forests and other ecosystems. Further that, drawing on diverse knowledges and cultural values, meaningful participation and inclusive engagement pro uh, processes, including Indigenous knowledge, local knowledge and scientific knowledge facilitates climate resilience development. It in fact builds capacity and allows locally appropriate and socially acceptable solutions. Australia and other richer nations play a vital role in limiting global warming to below 1.5 degrees. The report was really clear. We, really need, we, we need to reduce our emissions and move away from fossil fuels like our life depends on it. We simply cannot keep opening up new fossil fuel projects and continuing to give public money to these giant polluters. It is untenable that in the face of this report that the Labor government is still happy to look at the 116 coal and gas projects that are in the pipeline. The climate wars are not over. We still have a long fight ahead of us and until we have a government that is not in the pocket of fossil fuel companies and will take urgent action that is needed and ensure First Nations people are integral to that solution, um, not left behind to pick up the remains of their loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Dunningham. Uh, President, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I want to acknowledge at the outset the multiple and varied and plural views that we hold in this society, from whatever quarter we come from, from whatever uh, ethnic or cultural background we hold, I think it is important that we embrace those different views, that we uh, celebrate what makes us different, separate, but what brings us together. And I think as part of a democracy in this country, as part of uh, one inclusive and tolerant society, we do celebrate those differences and agree to disagree on the things we can't see fit to uh, meet on, uh, but importantly acknowledge that people have differences of opinion. That is the beauty of this democracy and this nation of which we are a part. In my home state of Tasmania, there's an issue uh, that's been bubbling away for a period of time now. Uh, it's a report from the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute around an issue that is of importance to many in our community, people, uh, both uh, the faith community, also secular households relating to uh, a report um, by this entity, the TLRI, 
uh, on the issue of uh, sexual identity and um, sexual orientation and gender identity conversion practices. It's something that's caused a great deal of concern in our community, and uh, unnecessarily so, I say, because this institute has gone well beyond its remit, in my view, to uh, make recommendations around law reform, changes to law which I think would be harmful to our tolerant <laughs> and pluralistic society. Uh, not necessarily for households that adhere to certain faiths, but parents generally. I think it would undermine everything that is good about our country, because it isn't just about recognising there are differences, that there are people in our community who have a different view, a different belief, a different way of living. It is about, in fact, vilifying people who disagree with you on those sorts of things. And so as the Tasmanian government considers the report from the TLRI, an important one, an important issue that is of great import to many in my community. I think it's important to consider the impact of the recommendations. And there were many present that were uh, put forward by the TLRI, 16 in total, a number relating to health and psychiatric practices, which I wholeheartedly agree with. The barbaric practices, both health and psychiatric, that have been implemented in the past. Uh, relating to what's known as gay conversion therapy should be condemned, should be absolutely outlawed by every jurisdiction in this country. But the further recommendations around Anti-Discrimination Act laws uh, and reforms to those laws, I think, are something that we should pause to think about, because it isn't about simply banning particular practices and making sure people feel included, this has a far further reaching impact and something that the people of Tasmania and indeed the government of Tasmania should stop and think about before they act on. Because acting on those second tranche of recommendations, and as I said before, the first tranche, very much about ensuring uh, that uh, those barbaric practices, those outdated practices, which have no place in a world we live in today, never occur again, should be agreed to. And any laws required should be uh, adopted by the Tasmanian parliament. But the second tranche, which go far further relating to uh, practices in the household, you know, Christian and faith-based communities, uh, households that might pray at dinner time, uh, that might pray for the future of their children, may well find themselves in breach of the law. Uh, parents or teachers that uh, of a secular background might well seek to unpack the issues that a youth is facing, uh, might again find themselves in breach of the law. That is not good. That is bad. That is the law and the state overreaching, in my view. And I urge the Tasmanian government, and I look to colleagues like Lara Alexander in the Tasmanian parliament, who I think has said many good things on these issues, to pause and consider what impact might flow from changes to Tasmanian legislation around these issues. Uh, this is an inclusive and tolerant society, and long should it be. But we should not, in place of past discriminations, find ourselves imposing new discrimination. Thank you, Senator Dunham. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon. Good evening, Senators. You were so polite, I felt like I had to...